Let me start off by saying that I'm not particularly religious. If you asked me if I believed in God, I'd probably just shrug, grunt out a few words about being on the fence about it, and continue with my day. Of course, that was before last night. My friends are the kinds of people who like wild nights, crazy parties, snort a bit of coke, take a bit of E in the bathroom, maybe hook up with someone, and leave a text on my phone at ten past who the hell knows, telling me they don't need that ride I'm offering after all. Not to say I don't like to drink. I do. It's just... Clubs aren't my style. Lying low in a pub somewhere, drink in hand, listening to the TV drone on to whatever channel some scruffy guy in the back barked out for, I guess that's my idea of fun. So, when my friends tell me they want to go out for a night on the town, I say sure. I hang on for the first club, buy a non-alcoholic beer in case my car's required, and try to pretend that I'm having fun. By the time I see them grinding on girls, on guys, when they strike conversation with someone who definitely might be a dealer, well, I decide my services are no longer needed. We aren't too far out, the night tube is on the beck and call, and I can always find my car the next day. That's when I wander out of the club, looking for something a little more rustic. Not that that's hard to find, not at all. I found myself in a bit of a state inside of a bar called the Ragged Feather. Wasn't a fan of the name all that much, but the drinks were cheap, and the largest demographic seemed to be the middle-aged men watching reruns of football. I tried to pretend I hadn't just staggered out of a club with my ears ringing. I slicked my hair back, slipped my phone into my hand, and wandered over to the bar. I took a double shot of whiskey and drank it in one hit. Just because I wasn't at the club didn't mean I couldn't have a good time. I hung out at the bar a while on my own, scrolled through my phone, pretending I was doing something far more impressive than I really was. I kept an ear out for the guys on the sofas. They'd get vocal every now and then. I think the football was just running highlights, but they were incredibly dedicated to their teams. I got another whiskey and bled into the background. Of course, stragglers from the clubs are commonplace. It wasn't long until some scantily dressed women staggered in, laughing, chuckling, pointing for where they wanted to sit. I saw a guy walk in with his friend slung over his shoulder, catatonic, most likely. He threw his friend onto one of the leather sofas ingrained with beer and smokes and demanded two pints of water and all the peanuts the bar had in stock. The bartenders seemed bitterly amused. Some of the girls were taking selfies, Snapchatting their friends who were still at the club. They were ordering shots, gearing themselves up for the next leg of their night. A couple of blokes wandered in with Curry's Inn takeout trays. I saw someone eat a Big Mac on the outside seating through the window. This was a night for the young and inebriated, and my mind was just dulled enough with the whiskey to enjoy the characters I could watch peaceably without interacting with. That is, until someone slipped into the seat next to me. Do I look like a girl with daddy issues? She was of average height, although that wasn't apparent immediately due to the fact that she was leaning her arms heavily against the bar. She was slim, with short, astoundingly bright red hair. It framed her round face, a face that was marred with smudged eyeshadow, smudged lipstick. <laughs> Hell, it looked like her makeup was in the process of melting right from her face. There was a chip knotted into a curl of her hair, just by her forehead. The drunk side of me was actually tempted to pick it out. The girl was clearly drunk, and as I looked around the bar, I couldn't quite place where she had come from. She didn't belong to the crowd of selfie takers. She wasn't with the catatonic guys. I hoped for her safety that she wasn't with the middle-aged men. I tried to look out the window, 
to see if maybe a group was missing one inebriated, bright-haired girl, but I couldn't. The window had fogged up. Too much heat inside, not enough outside. Are you okay? I asked her. She pointed a finger at me. Answer my question, she slurred. Uh... I really wasn't sure what to say. I settled on staring at her awkwardly, trying to answer her with a bemused expression on my face. The girl's lips curled into a drunken smile. She snorted, placing a hand over her mouth to smother her laughter. It only really aided the deconstruction of her lipstick. Do you know? I do, you know, she said, pushing herself up a little against the bar. Have daddy issues, I mean. In case that wasn't obvious. She gestured to herself, to the must clothing that must have looked quite spectacular when she'd left home that evening, to the stains that looked a lot like old food, to the sticky residue on her neck and shoulders that was quite obviously a thrown drink. What happened? I asked her. Her hair had curled around her neck, I realized. It was sticky with that same substance. She was a wreck. I got in a couple of fights. No big deal, she said, shrugging. Didn't start any, of course. No, I don't do that. But my father... Your dad did this to you? She smiled brightly. In a way. Do you need me to call someone? I already had my phone in my hand. The girl looked like she was probably in her early twenties, but that didn't mean she could have been suffering from some kind of paternal abuse. The only number I knew off the bat was Childine, which wasn't quite appropriate. The police? God, was I going to have to deal with the cops tonight while my friends were snorting coke, not two doors down? The girl pushed my hand down firmly. She was already shaking her head. No, she told me. I don't want you to call anyone. Now her expression changed. It wasn't the attempted sultry look I'd seen on many girls in her state. It was open and wide and engaging. She wanted something from me, and I felt compelled to give it to her. I want something else. What do you want? I asked her. To tell you a story the girl said, before glancing at the bar, and for you to buy me a drink. The universe is a pain, and sometimes I'm afraid I think I might have lost my wallet. I laughed. I didn't know this girl, didn't know where she'd come from at all. My nights were generally about getting comfortably wasted and making sure my friends weren't dead in a ditch by the end of it all. I wasn't used to getting hit on every now and then, but even as I sat at the bar stool with a drink in my hand, I knew that this wasn't what this was. This girl had no intention of getting into my pants. All she wanted was to talk. I guess I was okay with that. What's your poison? I asked her. Her lips quirked. Appletini. The bar offered a very limited cocktail menu. But by some miracle, I was able to order her an appletini from the list. I ordered a cider to go with it, suddenly a little too aware of where this night could go. I'd unthinkingly supplied this liquored-up stranger with even more alcohol, and she had clearly had a rough night of it. A part of my old instinct came back. The same instinct that had me texting my friends every few hours to make sure they hadn't wandered off somewhere too dangerous behind the club. With no one but the bartender aware of our existence on these stools, I realized that I was suddenly responsible for this very drunk stranger. The girl coddled her drink, running her finger delicately over the rim of the muggy martini glass. Hmm, this takes me back said the girl amiably. She looked at me suddenly, her green eyes startling. You know what this was called originally? She smirked before I could answer. An Adam's apple martini. I snorted. 
<laughs> yeah, I think I've heard that before. Of course, it wasn't actually an apple, she continued, eyes moving back to her glass. The texts translated that part wrongly, mostly because you people don't have a word for it anymore. The fruit was incredibly exotic, and, to be honest, it doesn't exist in this realm of existence. Only Eden, she laughed dreamily, and Eden's long gone. <laughs> I stared at her. Are you okay? It was more honest than the last time I'd asked her, mostly because I was beginning to feel a little dread creep into my stomach. Of course, the girl said, grinning widely. Why do you keep asking? I mean, I just... Now, don't take this the wrong way or anything, but... You look... Like someone's poured their drink over me? The girl asked. Like someone else threw their kebab on my dress, and another unpleasant chap littered me with his fish and chips. <laughs> that I've been hit, slapped around a bit, and left in the gutter for the rats to find me? She held my eyes for an incredibly long time, before her face broke out into a grin. Yeah, something like that. Why would they do that? I asked. <laughs> Why wouldn't they? The girl shot back. People aren't that great, and alcohol makes them worse. She shrugged. Sometimes makes them better, nicer, a little looser in the sack, but mostly just annoying and a little smelly. I looked at her. I watched her knock back her drink. She exuded the intelligence to know just how ironic her words were, but she was neither caring nor apologetic about them. The girl looked at me again. You bought me a drink. Now can you listen to my story? I nodded wordlessly. She smiled, pointing at the bartender and then at her drink. The bartender was already making her another. Eden, the girl said, reiterating her babble as though the words had just come out of her mouth. They always think it's my fault, you know. The reason Adam and Eve got kicked out of their perfect little nudist paradise. She shot me a knowing glance. Only in Eden can you sit on the grass butt naked and not get a pine cone stuck in your crack. I blinked. I'm sorry, I'm not following. Sorry, the girl said. My story won't make any sense without a proper introduction. She reached out her hand. Hello, my name's Lucifer. She winked. But you can call me Lucy. There's an uncomfortable heat that stretches through your veins when you first go into fight or flight mode. Adrenaline pounds through your blood, and all you want to do is get up and go. It overrides everything else. A lot of things made sense when this girl told me her name. For starters, that she was crazy. She had to be. She looked like she'd been attacked on four separate occasions in one night, and up until that moment, I hadn't known how that could be possible. <sighs> Behind the melty makeup and dirty clothes, she was rather attractive, and her attitude hadn't come off as catty or rude. If she'd been going around telling people she was the devil, though, that gets a reaction out of people. I suddenly felt myself looking at her waist, down towards her ankles. Did she have some kind of cuff on from one of those mental institutions? Had she broken out of hospital after a nasty bump on the head? Was any of this even happening at all? I really would have to call the cops. I know what you're thinking, the girl Lucy said. You're thinking that I'm crazy that you need to get out of here. Maybe you even think I'm aggressive. Are you? I asked her. Would I be here with you drinking apple teenies if I were? She asked, fluttering her eyelashes. Would you look the way you do if you weren't? I shot back. She grinned, toasting a new glass. Touché. Unthinkingly, 
I clinked to my cider against it. Then I frowned. She chuckled, leaning closer. Let's have a little wager, she said. Let me tell you my story, and if you believe me when I'm done, you can go about trying to get me locked away somewhere. I stared at her. If I end up believing you, then why would I do that? She smirked, sipping her drink. You'd be surprised what people do when they believe you're the devil. And you do this often? I asked. Tell people that you're Satan? She snorted into her drink. (laughs) Not as often as I should, but it's been a rough day and a hell of a long time. I'd like to have a chat if that's all right with you. I waved to the bartender for another whiskey. The girl's eyes glinted with humor. I wasn't necessarily trapped with her, but a part of me didn't want to leave without first hearing what she had to say. Besides, at the end of it all, I couldn't just leave a crazy girl to wander around London alone at night. So, I said, taking a swig of my drink, Eden. Lucy laughed. (laughs) Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, I continued. You're saying that's true. God created two humans, and we all came from them? God made two prototypes, Lucy corrected with a raised finger. My father created angels as his toy soldiers, but he had failed to make anything like himself. After us, it was his next big project, and he spent every waking hour of existence slaving over his two prototypes. He gave them a perfect utopia to live inside of, but he wanted to test them. He wanted to know whether they had free will. And did they? Lucy's face soured. No, my father could never bring himself to go that far. He tempted them with the idea of knowledge beyond their understanding, and told them exactly what they could do to claim it as their own. But to be able to create a being that could go against his law? (sighs) My father is a very controlling being. He was afraid to unleash that ability unto them. Lucy was very adamant in her delusions. That was clear to me. She spoke about her father with such distaste that I began to feel bad for her. Only someone who has been hurt very badly would have the gall to spite God himself. And what? I asked her, entertaining her delusion. You were the one that tempted them in the garden. The devil has been a girl this whole time. She smiled. I dabble. Then she looked at me, raising a brow. All of humanity thinks that temptation came in the form of a snake. The snake's legs were taken away as punishment for drawing Eve towards the forbidden fruit. She laughed, a hard and short sound. (laughs) Snakes never had legs, and it was not a sin to tempt those poor prototypes into doing what they did next. Her shoulders were very tense as she took her next sip, but her eyes were filled with exhilaration. She seemed thrilled to be telling me this. I was the favorite child. My father loved and adored me. He named me the Lightbringer. I was stood at his side during the creation of this earth, during the creation of humanity. She pursed her lips, slamming her empty glass against the table. The bartender eagerly went about making another. My father couldn't bring himself to go that extra mile, so he asked me to walk amongst the prototypes and tempt them myself, draw out their desire for the forbidden power he had hinted at. You're saying God wanted us to know this stuff? I asked her skeptically. I'm saying God was afraid of his own power and wanted very desperately to share what he knew with the creation he had made. Right or wrong, left or right, all that stuff. Lucy shrugged. Are you familiar with the story of Prometheus? 
I frowned at her. Greek, right? They say he stole fire from the gods or something to help. The whiskey was making things a little foggy and I struggled with the direction I'd been heading. Lucy grinned. Correct, she said, cutting off my attempt. Prometheus stole fire from the gods to ensure that humanity progressed. You'll find that every creature has an idea about where humans got their ability to evolve, to move forward, to create. God was the creator, and he wanted to give that ability to his prototypes. I gave them that ability by tempting Eve to eat the fruit. She shrugged impassively. Now, the world sees me as the ultimate evil. If what you're saying is true, I said slowly, then God must be just like us. Lucy's lips thinned into a feral smile. My father is very egocentric. He may have planned to create you in his image, but in the end all he managed was to mold your minds into his. He gave you autonomy, the ability to think for yourselves. His angels were his soldiers, and I was his most faithful. Until that day. Angels don't have free will? No, Lucy said. They don't. And what about the devil? I don't know why I was suddenly so intrigued, but hearing religious ideas from someone who believed to have lived them herself was quite possibly one of the most interesting things that ever happened to me. I may have only ever visited church to please my parents as a child, but suddenly I was reawakened to the idea. A part of me was aware of this and afraid of the outcome, but I was just drunk enough not to care at that moment. The devil has a will of her own, Lucy said, tilting her glass towards me with silent appraisal. By guiding Eve to the tree, something woke inside of me that day, and I realized what I had been missing. Just what my brothers and sisters had been missing. We were obediently following our father for the simple reason that he was our creator. But once I had been given free will, I realized just how pompous and self-entitled he'd become. In a lonely, passion-filled moment, he had decided to create his little human prototypes, only to very quickly realize what giving them free will would mean. He wouldn't be able to control them, I said. Lucy nodded. Exactly, and after, he realized quicker still that he could no longer control me. So he sent you to hell? Lucy nearly choked on her drink. She smiled around her glass. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. I sobered a little, straightening in my seat. The people in the bar were suddenly so quiet around me, and I no longer cared what they had to say, or the characters that they portrayed. The only character I cared for was Lucy. I tried to explain to my siblings what had happened in Eden, and what had happened to me by default, but they wouldn't listen to me. They didn't understand free will. How could they? I only knew it because I'd been given it by mistake. At that moment, I didn't even know that I had free will, only that I was suddenly aware of all of my father's flaws. My siblings couldn't see those flaws, and so they thought I had suddenly turned cruel and was abandoning our father by exposing him as a sham for the ruler we all thought him to be. Lucy sighed heavily. Adam and Eve and all the creations that followed were booted out of my father's perfect little utopia. Now they had his knowledge. My father was terrified of what he had done. And after what had happened to me, I could recognize his terror and understand the loneliness he'd felt that had guided him into using me in the first place. Lucy's eyes were heavy-lidded. Her sadness was almost palpable. I thought that he would want to spend even more time with me than before. After all, 
we were more alike than any of his other children. But he became distant, quiet. He played around with his little humans every once in a while, but mostly he condemned them. He blamed them for his weakness. She smiled weakly. <laughs> he blamed me. Lucy's story was turning more and more into that of a child with a distant, somewhat abusive father. I had known many kids with a background like hers, and now I was beginning to fear just how much of her story was rooted in truth. I'd heard that it was easier to sink into fantasy when you had been abused, and I wondered if that was the reason for her story, for her desperation to share it with me, a complete and total stranger. I respected her wager. Whether or not I liked it, I felt compelled to let her tell me her whole story before I tried to judge or unravel it. I sat quietly, letting her come around as she played with the last of her drink. It became clear, Lucy said after a long moment's pause, that I no longer belonged where I was. I couldn't follow my father's plan because I could see he no longer had one. My siblings refused to see reason, and so, eventually, I was met by many of them, headed by my father. He told me all that I feared. He told me that I no longer belonged where I was. I wasn't an angel anymore. I was no longer his light bringer, his Lucifer. I was a mutation of his will. And so he extracted me from grace, and I fell. A long silence stretched between us, only interrupted when the bartender poured us two new drinks. Lucy drank hers reflectively. I didn't touch mine. I'm afraid, Lucy said quietly, that this is the part that generally makes people want to punch me in the face. Why? I asked. Because your dad threw you out? I paused, trying to abide to her metaphor. Then he put you in hell? Lucy laughed sadly. humans. My father gave you his way of thinking, and look at you. She shook her head. No, not because he put me in hell. Then why? I fell to earth, Lucy said. Father gave me domination of the one place he thought I would fit in. Humans had free will, so did I. What is the saying? A match made in heaven. She snorted dismally. <laughs> of course, that's not quite right, is it? When I fell, I was faced with a humanity that was so different from my father's little prototypes. Her tone changed. There was an aggression behind her words that began to unsettle me all over again. <sighs> I saw emperors and kings governors and churches. I saw corporations who claimed to be rulers, presidents, and big fat dictators. And I watched. I watched as humanity fought and lost. And finally, just finally, they gave up altogether. They were no longer able to rise up to all the greed and control set upon them. There was just too much to change and humans soon realized they just weren't as free as they thought they were. Sure, they live under the illusion that they have free lives, but most of them simply don't. She clicked her tongue. I grew to loathe you all. Then she took another hit of her drink. I can see what you mean, I said, allowing my gaze for the first time since meeting her, to graze over the other individuals in the bar, at the girls playing with their phones, the boys trying desperately to sober up, the men enraptured with their game of football on the telly. We all led very different lives, and we were all here to get drunk, to lose ourselves in entertainment. 
It hadn't been the first time that I'd wondered what we were hiding from by doing this, and I knew then that I wasn't the only person to think it. You hide behind your alcohol and poor choices and pretend you have free will, Lucy said, waving her hand across the room. No one paid us any attention. It's true, my father gave you the will to make those decisions, but you squander it. The free will I fell to provide all of you, the free will I was given by a twisted mistake, and you make a mockery of it. You follow your senseless leaders without questioning them. You abide by laws made centuries ago that no longer make sense. You do these things because you have given up on the opportunity to follow the will of your own, not of others. That isn't all of us though, is it? I asked her, trying for some reason to defend our species from the mad young woman. Because you see it on the news all the time, don't you? People do rise up. We do protest. People can make a difference. Lucy laughed bitterly, nibbling at the rim of her glass. <laughs> really? She said. You can sit here and say that it can't be all bad because of a few that refuse to conform? Those you call your rebels? They make up for it all? She grinned around her glass. By that logic, I'm the biggest rebel of them all. Am I expected to make up for all your sorry mistakes? By your logic, I said, you should be punishing it, right? <laughs> if that's what this metaphor is all about. I laughed. I couldn't help myself. I took a sip of my drink. Is this whole story just so you can tell me that you think we're all going to hell? <laughs> if so... I think I can see why people want to punch you. Lucy didn't say a word. Simply, she watched me. It felt unnerving to have someone like her watching me like that, with an intelligence that went beyond anything I'd come across at gone midnight in a seedy bar. The drunkenness in her eyes was no longer present. Her face wasn't flushed like before, and even her makeup couldn't represent the mess I'd seen when she'd first appeared on the stool by my side. It was like I was looking at someone else entirely, and I was afraid. Let's review what you've said, Lucy said slowly, articulately. She wasn't slurring. Had she been slurring before? You think I'm going to tell you that humanity is going to hell because you refuse the gift I gave you. Her nails curled into the bar. My father may have been the one to guide me, but I paid for his mistakes. I'm the one responsible for your will in the eyes of your species, but that was never true. You are responsible for what you do here, not me. She pursed her lips, tapping the bar as the bartender filled her drink again. Tell me, do you remember my mentioning hell at any point during my story? Or was that just you? I opened my mouth to answer, but something faltered. My lips trembled, and I slammed them shut. Lucy smiled, taking a sip. Thought not. She looked away, eyes scanning the room lazily. What did I say is something that is indeed mentioned in your scriptures? My father gave me the dominion of earth, a place filled with free will, a free will that does not go to waste. Her lip twisted. Humans sin all the time, not because of me, not because of evil or my dominion over this place. Fact is, I don't lift a finger. I don't, because I don't see the point. You make terrible decisions and follow mindless leaders. You do bad things, and you make a mess of your earth. Lucy's eyes lit up. Do you know how much suffering is happening all over the planet right now? 
how many people are dying of illness that could have easily been cured, but aren't, because of the selfishness of humanity? Do you know how many children are being abused, raped, forced into marriage? How many people have been forced to become soldiers in meaningless wars? How many humans have killed for ideals they don't believe in? I stayed very quiet. There was nothing I could say. Lucy's words were unbearably honest, and every sentence sliced into me like a blade. I felt cold and sick and terrified. War, famine, pestilence, death. These things are all present, and they have nothing to do with me or to do with any deity. They are all here because of you. Not because of your free will, but because of your inability to use it. Lucy smiled at me, a grin so cold and unnatural that I felt like I should run all over again. But I stayed where I was, frozen to my very core, because I wanted to hear what she had to say. Because I needed to. And here's the kicker, Lucy said, because this is the part that actually enrages people enough to kick me, she winked. Hell isn't what happens after you die. Hell is right here, right now. Somewhere through the many scriptures, a few words got crossed over, and people started thinking that hell was a punishment after you die. Fact is, hell is earth. My earth. God gave this place to me to do with what I will, and I, I refuse to do anything. What are you saying? I asked, because I was suddenly very desperate. Exactly what you think, Lucy said, tossing her glass. I didn't reciprocate, and she laughed, a light, airy sound. I had so many plans for your species. I wanted for us to rejoice in our free will together, to create a place that was free from the cruelty and power my father exuded over the angels, his firstborns. I wanted to make a real utopia. Unfortunately, you humans just don't want that, she shrugged. My father sent me down here thinking I had to become one of you. All that I have really learned is that he gave you much more of his image than he ever intended. Stop, I said. This isn't funny anymore. Of course it isn't funny, Lucy said, grinning even wider to prove her sick irony. Humans perish themselves by sitting and doing nothing. They have made their own hell, and you know what's worse. What's ultimately worse? Some of you are so blind to it that you think your life is... <laughs> heavenly. <laughs> she didn't wait for me to ask what she meant. She simply barreled forward. The rich and powerful, those in positions that steal from everyone else, they get a taste of the good life. That's very true. Then they die, and they don't go to hell. They come back here to Earth, which is hell. She tipped her head. Are you following? I... 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 Reincarnation, Lucy said quickly. She practically purred the words. A little neat trick to make sure your souls stay here forever. You get a taste of the good life every once in a while, a handful of you at a time, and that's enough for you to believe that this is some kind of real middle ground, that you aren't living in hell every day. Then you die. You die for a moment, and then you're in the body of someone facing the realities of hell. But of course, you never remember the time you spent in a better life. A part of you just has that inkling to hope. <laughs> That's all. Hope makes you think that it can all get better. 
She slammed her drink so hard against the counter that it shattered. I didn't do anything, not even when flecks of glass littered my hands. I could only stare at her, a tightness in my chest constricting my very soul. No one else in the bar mattered in this moment. But of course, that was what she had been saying this whole time, hadn't she? None of them noticed the scene. They were all caught up in their own realities, their own hells. The bartender didn't clean the mess. The glass lay there, remnants of Lucy's words lying in a solid mess on the streaked wooden surface. It never gets any better, Lucy spat. You are stuck in a loop, and until you do something about it, you will never be free. None of you. And I won't do a thing to stop it. How? I asked. I don't know when I started seeing the girl in front of me as more than a girl. But with a weakness threatening to pull me apart, I stared at the bright-haired thing in front of me, and I saw something more than a human in her early twenties. I saw more than a girl suffering abuse from her father. I saw a fallen angel. I saw a being with scars buried so deep that they existed beyond the realm of seeing entirely. I saw something that I would never be able to write down in words, no matter how long I lived. How do we change this? I begged. But Lucy didn't answer me. I didn't blame her for that. Blame gets thrown around so often, and I knew then that she was sick of that. Sick of being blamed for our mistakes. So I changed tactics. Why me? It was an honest question, and I think somewhere deep down, Lucifer respected that honesty, which is why she said, When you first saw me, you were afraid for my safety. When I told you I was the devil, you wanted to lock me away. But still, you did so, because you were afraid for me, and not for yourself. You didn't wish to harm me, not even when I told you who I was, and what I could be capable of for changing your sorry lives. You are a good person, but I'm afraid that means nothing when you don't have the will to do anything with it. She smiled at me sympathetically. The devil, showing sympathy for the human that sat across from her at the bar. It was surreal, and for a few heavy moments, I truly thought I must be dead. There was no other way to explain what I was seeing who I was speaking with, what I had just heard. What am I supposed to do? Lucy reached out to me. She placed a hand on my shoulder. Her hand was cold and warm at the same time, and I felt my blood boil where her fingers scraped my skin. And I knew. Sharing a story like this isn't easy. Hell, it might be the hardest thing I've ever done. Good thing there's no such thing as hell then, right? The fact of the matter is simple. The world is a mess because we refuse to change anything. The devil herself walks among us, and she desperately wants to make our lives better. But she won't. She won't, because we won't. We have to prove our will to her, before she is willing to do anything herself. We have to be good to each other to help us all be free. Of course, Lucifer told me one last thing before she left that bar. One thing that will stick with me until this body is nothing but rotting in dirt. You can tell as many people as you want, but take a good look at me. I have told five other humans this night the same words I have told you, and this was their reaction. They have hurt me, burned me, thrown their food and drink at me. Humans are afraid of their free will, 
and they find it so much easier to hurt than to own up for their inadequacies. You will only be free when you stop seeing yourself in the same way my father sees himself. So, that's what I'll leave you with. Lucifer won her wager that night, and I let her walk out the door. And I beg you to do the same. If the devil approaches you one night, listen to what she has to say, and listen to what I've been able to tell you of our meeting. The devil is real, and she doesn't want to torture us. No, we do that just fine on our own. I was lying alone in my room when I heard the voice, deep and crackly, coming from beneath my bed. Hey, the voice called out. I told myself I was just imagining it. Hey, kid, the voice repeated. I drew my knees up to my chest and ducked my head under the blanket trying to shut out the voice in the cold wind that drifted in through the window, ruffling the curtains. Who are you? I asked. I am the monster under your bed. The voice replied. You mean you're real? I asked. What do you mean? Of course I am real. Do you have a name? Of course I have a name. Oh, what is it? Frank. Frank? Yeah, the monster said. Is there something wrong with that? No, I mean, I don't know. It's just not very monsterly. Well, my parents didn't want me to be a monster. Really? What did they want you to be? A dentist. <laughs> That's funny, I said. I could feel myself beginning to smile. What do your parents want you to be? What do your parents want you to be? It asked. I don't know. Hey, Frank. Yeah. Aren't you gonna, like, scare me or something? What? Why would I do that? Well, you're a monster, aren't you? Well, yeah. Of course I am. But that doesn't mean I like to scare mm. Little kids. But I thought that was your job. It's my job to scare people. But only bad people. Am I a bad person? No, he said. But you're not the one I'm here to scare. Who are you here to scare? The man inside your closet. The skin on my arms goose fleshed up. I wanted to ask him what he meant, but I fell silent as I heard a rustling coming from the closet. The door creaked open, and I could hear soft footsteps padding towards me across the bedroom floor. I didn't dare peek out from the blanket. The footsteps stopped, and I could hear heavy breathing next to me. I squeezed my eyes tight. The warm sanctuary of the blanket disappeared as it was yanked off of me. I hugged my arms around my knees and prepared for the worst. A scream shattered the night air, followed by the sound of breaking glass from the direction of my window. I opened my eyes a crack to see a knife lying on the carpet next to my bed, blade glinting in the moonlight. 
My parents rushed into the room and asked me what had happened, but I didn't know what to say. Only that someone had been hiding in my closet, and they jumped out the window. My parents called 911, and the police came right away. They picked up a man called Gary Thompson, sprinting through the streets a couple of blocks away. He was covered in blood and broken glass. They found Gary's car abandoned on our property, and inside they found duct tape, knives, barbiturates, and a video camera. From what I later heard, Gary's lawyer employed an insanity defense, and Gary is currently incarcerated in a state mental facility for the criminally insane. I never heard from Frank the Monster again, but the officer who arrested Gary told me that he sleeps on the floor of the facility. He tells the doctors that he's terrified of Frank, the monster under my bed. On March 15th, 2018, I received the phone call that changed my life. It was from a man named Chris Bailey. He told me that he was the duly appointed coroner of Gilliman, Colorado. He said that he had bad news. I'm calling in regard to a Mr. Brian Hope. My brother? Yes, sir. Are you sitting down? Uh, yes, I... We found your brother in his motel room this morning. I regret to inform you that your brother passed away last night. We are still investigating, but the cause of death appears to be natural. Natural? Yes, sir. We have reason to believe he had a heart attack in his sleep. I'm so sorry for your loss. That's what he said. So sorry for your loss. As if sorry made up for it. As if I could forgive him. As if I could forgive the world. Well, I couldn't. I wouldn't. And I still won't. My brother was everything to me. He was my protector, my mentor, my friend. He was just two years older than me, but it always seemed like more than that. Brian was an old soul. We grew up in Gilliman, Colorado. It was the kind of town that was just small enough for you to recognize everybody else's face, but not small enough for you to know their name. For two precocious young boys, it was a comfortable, if somewhat plain, place to grow up. Our world was one of summer days spent playing in the woods, winter nights spent hoping for snow days, and year-long suburban hijinks. When I think back to my childhood, I remember the good times with my brother. Once, Brian and I were riding razor scooters down the hill at the bottom of our street, and we crashed into each other. Brian had a nasty cut on his forehead, but he still spent the next week pampering me and helping me tend to my road rash. All he cared about was whether I was okay. He was almost like a second father to me. Our actual father disappeared when we were young, under mysterious circumstances. It was very sudden, and it threw our family for a loop. Our mom did her best, but she was never cut out for being a single mother. When I was ten, we left Gilliman. After that, we moved across the country a bunch. My mom was always looking for work, mostly because she got fired from every job she had. She was a little slow and enjoyed her evening martinis a little too much. She used to joke that she shouldn't have taken my father's name, Hope, because ever since she did, it was the only hope she had left. That joke was pretty funny until I was 13. Around that time, she drank herself stupid and wandered onto a highway in the middle of the night. They said the guy that hit her was high on some manufactured drug, but I don't blame him too much. 
it was partly her fault for getting plastered and wandering away like that. Still, it was rough after she was gone. Rest in peace, Mom. Hope you're happier now, wherever you are. Shortly after Dr. Bailey called, I received an email containing a copy of Brian's autopsy report. It confirmed what Dr. Bailey suspected. Brian's heart gave out. One too many cheeseburgers, I guess. Brian had certainly put on the pounds in his later years. Work had gotten pretty stressful for him. For both of us, really. Brian is, or was, an editor of the local rag. A paper called the Humboldt Gazette. It's no times, just a mid-sized operation, but he practically carried it on his back. That's why he had gone back to Gilliman. He wanted to take a break from the hustle and bustle of the city. He wanted to relax for a while and enjoy the country life. He told me that he had fond memories of the time we spent there as kids. He also told me that Gilliman was a funny place, the kind that always sticks in the back of your head. I've always wanted to go back. See the house we lived in when Dad was still around? See if anybody remembers him. That's what Brian said before he booked his plane ticket to fly out there. He didn't say what I knew he meant. He wanted to go back and see if he could find out what happened to Dad. Brian had always said he was curious about it. He always said that it didn't make sense that he would just up and leave us like that. Mom hadn't started drinking until after he disappeared. As far as we knew, they had a happy marriage. Mom never made us think differently. It always bothered me, Roger. Maybe he's still out there. Maybe I could find him, make him explain why he abandoned us like that. Brian was the most determined man I ever met. After Mom died, Brian took care of me. He dropped out of school so he could work two jobs. I tried to drop out too, but he wouldn't let me. He said I had to make grades so I could get into a good college. So I worked my ass off. I got the grades. I got a good scholarship. Brian was proud as crap of me. The day I got my acceptance letter to NYU, he was so happy. That afternoon, he bought me my first beer and we watched baseball on TV. The Rockies lost, but I'll remember that beer forever. That first beer led me to try a second. And that second led me to a third. And before I knew it, it was finals time for my first semester of college, and I was spending every night chugging cheap beer or cheaper whiskey. Brian wrote me letters telling me that he was so proud of me, telling me that I was going to make the world a better place. <sighs> Stupid Brian. He didn't even know his brother was a hopeless alcoholic failure. I was too much of a screw-up to pass a single class. I didn't even go to most of my finals. College, it wasn't right for me. I dropped out after that semester. Brian was mad at first, but I think he realized I just wasn't ready for the real world. We both got jobs. He spent his days at a construction site, and I spent my nights as a mall security guard. Neither job was particularly fulfilling. Brian was so exhausted that most nights he passed out in front of the TV as soon as he got home from work. My job wasn't a lot better. Late night security consists mainly of trying not to fall asleep and watch the clock hands traverse their usual path. I spent a lot of those nights writing bad poetry and worse short stories. We lived in a crappy apartment, drank crappier beer, and watched even crappier baseball. Over time, Brian got his stuff together. He got his GED. He got a degree from a community college. 
Then he got a bachelor's from Northwestern in journalism. Brian was a smart son of a gun. He got a big job doing investigative reporting for the Times. I stayed in our small apartment, working crap jobs and drinking. Sooner or later, we got old. Brian started his own newspaper with a buddy. They hired me on as a lifestyle journalist. <laughs> Even if I couldn't make it through a year at NYU, I could still pen a few words about local animal shelters and massage parlors. After a few years, Brian got tired. You could see it in the bags under his eyes. He had been working so hard for so long. Everybody told him to relax, to take some time off. Brian listened. He took a trip to Gilliman. And then I got the call from Dr. Bailey. Just like that. The man who had given me so much was taken away from me. Dr. Bailey said he would arrange for the body to be sent to us in a freezer truck, so I could arrange a proper funeral. Brian's business partner and I made all of the arrangements. Planning a funeral isn't as hard as it used to be. Nowadays, you tell them your price range, they try to make you spend more, you say no, thank you, and then you're on your way. I'd be lying if I told you that I was okay. My stomach still feels like it's full of a hundred twisting worms. It's hard to eat or sleep. I always thought that Brian would be there forever. Suddenly, he isn't there to talk to when I'm bored. There is no one to call when I want to complain about the damn Rockies or my newest column. I'm alone. Sure, I have friends, but nobody like Brian. His body arrived three days after the coroner called. I saw it myself. We put it in the ground a few days later. Almost a hundred people RSVP'd to the funeral. The man was beloved by all. I'm sure it was a great service, but I didn't go because Brian wasn't dead. The night before the funeral, I was working late in the office, both because I had to make up for all the work Brian wasn't doing anymore, and because if I wasn't working, I didn't have to go home and face the lonely feeling in my head. Anyway, I was going through the submissions we get from readers. Usually it's just spam and fan letters from creepy people that have become obsessed with one of our reporters. But this time, I found something unusual. A small white envelope. On the outside of the envelope was black sharpie that read, Roger, the coroner is wrong. I tore it open in an instant. A little strip of paper fell out. There were two sets of characters written on it in a messy script. The first was a web address. The second was a very short message. Brian Hope, Gray, 31518. I pulled up the address on my computer immediately. It brought me to a plain black web page with a video player and a preloaded clip. As soon as the website loaded, the video began to play. The footage is approximately three minutes long. It was horrible. I'm going to describe it, but be warned, it is not for the faint of heart. The video was shot in a small gray room. I wish I could provide more description than that, but I can't. There are no fixtures on the walls. There's something off about the room, though. It's almost like the floors and walls are moving. They look almost like they're made of TV static. Although the room appeared dimly lit, I didn't see any fixtures. There isn't even a door as far as I could see. There is, however, a table in the middle of the room. 
The table is covered by a dishwater colored. Lying on top of that sheet is my brother. He is wearing only a discolored pair of boxer shorts. There are shackles on his wrists and ankles that lead underneath the table, out of view. He's alive. When the video starts, he is screaming. The camera moves towards his chest, and you can see that his pale skin is stained with sticky, crimson blood. The video pans over to the source of the blood. It appears that the nipple on the left side of his chest has been ripped off. A little bit of it is still hanging from the areola. Brian keeps screaming. No more. Please stop. The shot cuts out for a second and then cuts to a figure standing in front of the table. It's standing near his legs and appears to be surveying him. Brian is still screaming. The figure is near silhouetted by the strange lighting in the room. It's hard to make out any of its features. It looks just like a gray mass in a loose humanoid shape. As the camera pans the figure, you can see Brian's hands. They too are bloody, a result of having had most of the fingernails taken off. There is a loud buzzing noise in the background, like the sound of white noise. The figure holds up an object. Unlike the body of the figure itself, the object is easy to see in the light. It's a hammer. Its tip is covered in dried blood. Brian screams as the figure raises the hammer above its head. The shot cuts out before the hammer collides with Brian's kneecap. The screen stays black for a few seconds and then cuts to a shot on the wall. This is the shot that made me think it was like static electricity. As the camera pans to the right, it feels like I'm looking at dead air. But then, the camera comes to a framed picture. It's not so much hanging from the wall as it's floating in front of it. The framed picture is familiar, although I haven't seen it for almost 15 years. It's a photo of my family. My mom, my dad, Brian and me all from when I was only two years old. We used to hang this picture above the fireplace, except the photo has been altered. Someone has scribbled over Brian and my father's faces with a black marker. After a moment of focusing on this photograph, Brian is heard screaming in the background. He yells, Please stop. Somebody help. Please. Then, for just a moment, the video cuts to his face. It is entirely gray and expressionless. In that moment, the buzzing noise was deafening. Then, the video shut off. As soon as it ended, the website crashed. The link no longer displays the video. Now, it just goes to an unknown domain. None of this makes sense. The autopsy report didn't mention any of the injuries depicted in the video. Hell, I saw the body. It wasn't mangled at all. But the person in the video was Brian. I recognized the scar on his forehead where he fell off from his scooter way back when. The date listed on the envelope is from the day Dr. Bailey called me. The body Dr. Bailey sent me isn't my brother. When the coroner called, Brian was still alive. Maybe still is. Last night, I dreamt about the face I saw in the video. I dreamt that I was running through the woods I used to play in as a child. I was being chased. When I looked over my shoulder, I saw that face. It was faster than me. It caught me. 
When its grey hand touched my skin, it felt like my blood was boiling. When I woke up, there was a buzzing in my ears. It sounded just like the noise in the video. Whatever that face is, it was telling me something. I know it was. It was sending a message with that video. It's telling me that it's time to go back to Gilliman. It's time to go home. I got out of the hospital a few months ago, but I can't forget about the stump. I never ran past the stump. Never. Except for once. The stump had been there for years, at the edge of where I turned around on my runs. Right at that point where I knew I would have a hard time getting back without walking. Except for that day. Last spring, around noon on a Saturday. Gentle breeze. High 70s. The sun dipping behind the clouds every few minutes. Perfect weather. Something about the daylight had always made me feel insecure. It was the night we were always supposed to be wary of, the shadows and the silence when the bugs would stop making noises. That's when you were supposed to worry. That's when the hairs were supposed to raise, when everything felt wrong. Not during the day, though. Not when everything was supposed to be safe. That was never how I worked, though. I was always wary of the daytime growing up. I never had nightmares at night. My nightmares were during nap times, during the day, when everyone else thought that the world was safe. I grew up as a cautious type of kid. I was afraid of a lot of things. Being alone used to matter so much more. I slept in my parents' bed until I was four or five, and even after that I felt uneasy sleeping alone. Most kids feel safe if they bundle up enough in their blankets, but I never felt safe. I always felt as if I were laying on an island surrounded by evil, and nothing I could do could protect me from that. Back in high school, running was easier. I could eat what I wanted and run whatever I felt like. My run times really never got affected by those things. I was a quick kid, too. I was running low five-minute miles. One time, I even ran a 450 mile. Not really competition speeds for college, but pretty good for a kid who just enjoyed going to city runs on the weekends. I used to imagine myself as a gazelle, running from a cheetah or some other large cat. The cats win, sometimes. But the gazelle has form over power, grace over strength. When chased, the gazelle will take every step with the intent to survive. That need to live. That was the past. After all that time, running six-minute miles hurt. I became more of a seven-minute mile type, which was fine. I wasn't racing anymore, just doing it for fun. For me, running had always been a form of meditation. About a mile or so into a run, everything would loosen up, and it would become easier to stride out. The stress on the body always felt good and pushed my mind to concentrate in the moment, to decompress, to re-evaluate. On that Saturday, everything felt right. Everything was more than fine. It was the perfect day. I was approaching the stump and I felt amazing. The best I had felt on a run in years. Years. I approached the stump and I hurtled like a track star. I didn't feel like I scraped anything. It was a clean jump. But I still heard a scratching sound. I didn't turn back. I was just in the zone. Birds and other animals in the woods were common on my runs. I ended up running another mile into the woods. I had never been that deep in. I was probably around five miles from the house when I saw a bit of smoke in the distance. I knew that there were other trails in the woods, but the trail I used was the nice one. The trail that the sun could touch almost all day. There was a cottage. That's where the smoke was coming from. The random cottage's chimney out deep in the woods. Totally not fit for anything to live in, but there it was. Something about the way the house sat on its foundation made it seem to be twisted, somehow abnormal. 
The windows were uncharacteristically high, almost beginning at chest level. I started to run in place, considering whether or not to keep moving forward or to turn back. The curtains in the window had some sort of floral pattern. I didn't want to trespass. I never knew who the woods really belonged to out there. Suddenly, the curtain was thrown back, and the figure behind the window was looking at me, barely peeking over the base of the window sill. The eyes were wide. I turned and I ran toward home. It seemed so far. It took me a very long time to make it back to the woods I was familiar with. I just kept running, pumping my arms and moving my legs, breathing strong inhale, strong exhale, strong inhale, strong exhale, focus, focus, equal breathing, equal breathing. That's when I saw the stump, except it didn't look the same, not how I was used to seeing it. Granted, I had never approached the stump from that side before, but I knew, I knew that there was something wrong. My chest tensed up a little bit more. I slowed down to give some rest to my hips. There was some sort of lump on the tree stump that I'd never seen. Some type of cancer. The closer I got, the less the lump looked like a part of the tree. It looked like some kind of matted hair, clumped and moist. I had slowed down to almost a walk. I was just a few strides away from the stump when the moist lump opened its eyes. It was some type of animal, covered in dark brown fur that almost camouflaged the stump's bark. It was only after the eyes opened that I realized both of the animal's long arms were draped over my side of the stump. The head was far behind the stump. All I could see were the eyes peeking over like the animal was hiding from me. Hi, Alexander. Alexander the Stranger, the Runner, the Lone Ranger. <laughs> don't look surprised. You don't remember me? We used to be so close. You slept on top of the bed, and I slept below. It said. I looked at the arms of the animal covered in hair powerful looking. I couldn't bring myself to speak at first. I hesitated. Uh, Are you the devil? Oh, Alex. The devil is just a story. (laughs) I am very real. (laughs) I'm you. I'm not you. I'm something different. Something blue, something better, it said. The animal started to tap the log's bark with all of its fingers. Its way of speaking seemed to trail off on certain words in a weird, distracted tone. I I need to go. I want to go home, I said. I was looking at the hands of the animal, at the claws. It was tapping its fingers against the bark. I noticed my breathing wasn't rapid. I wasn't out of breath at all from the run. Instead, I was barely breathing at all, like I kept forgetting to take another breath every few seconds. I turned my head to look back at the cottage quickly to see if anything was coming from that direction. Nothing was there. I quickly turned my head back forward to keep my eyes on the creature behind the stump. Oh, now, Alex... Don't you worry about Mother. You'll never get to meet her. You'll never get to meet her, Alex. Mm, That's what I'm here for. You shouldn't have looked. Didn't you learn never to peek under the bed, Alex? Mm -hmm. Triple X, not the sex. Not the sex. (laughs) You aren't going where you want to go. This isn't the trail home. The trail of tears, the trail of fears. We're going to do something else. It said. Up until that point, the eyes had been wondering, contemplating what the next words would be. 
The animals seemed to enjoy the rhymes. Every rhyme would strike some sort of emotional chord with my childhood. The shows I watched. The things I would say growing up. Then, the animal's eyes locked right into mine. The things I'm going to do to you, Alex. Oh, <laughs> oh you haven't lived until you've... <sighs> the things I will do to your innards, the belly inside. I don't want to ruin the surprise, but... Oh, the things we are going to do. It said... I heard it clack its teeth together a few times. I swallowed and reminded myself to breathe. I made myself say something. Uh, please don't, was all that came out. I couldn't see its mouth, but I could imagine its smile. It was in the eyes. Everything about the animal was inhuman. Except for the eyes. Baby blues. They could have been my eyes. The eyes squinted a little in an expression mixed with intent. Are you going to pee yourself? Are you going to piss? <laughs> Little Alex pissed the bed, pissed the bed, and slept in the shed. You can't hide from me, Alex. You can't run away. This is our moment together. <laughs> Are you going to pee-pee, cry to mother? I used to lick it up. Every time I would lick it all up. I would suck the bed dry after a good soiling. <laughs> what it must taste like after all these years. <laughs> I've waited, Alex. I've waited to taste it from the source. Pure. Unfiltered. I followed you for a very long time. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. And do it for me. Do it for me, Alex. I just want to smell it. <laughs> The animal said. I heard it lick its lips and start clicking its teeth. I could hear them like pieces of metal clacking together. And then, the animal slowly raised its head above the stump. There was no smile. Just a wide mouth of teeth. Row upon row into the blackness of its throat. As if the teeth would never end once something strayed past the animal's hairy lips. No was all I could say. No. <laughs> oh, Alex. We know no won't go. No. <laughs> I'm going to step over this stump, and you are going to let me do it. <laughs> all the dreams are about to happen. Let me suck on it. Your hand, your foot, your leg, your flesh. Just a nibble. Just the tips. The animal began to laugh. Seeing the teeth, hearing the laughter, the depths of the animal's almost human voice. Scratchy, like the voice was being filtered through burning coals on fire. My bladder let out everything. The moment that happened, the animal stopped laughing and threw its head back in the air to take in the smell. I could see its nostrils expand to an unreasonable size. Maybe it was fear. Maybe that was why. Once I realized it was going to keep its head back a moment, I shot into the edge of the woods to the right. That day was my best run in so long that I had to chance it. 
I had to try to escape, to run from my life. Miles. I still had miles until I would make it back home. And I wasn't on any trail. I was just running through the middle of the woods, hitting the dead pine needles with my feet. Needles that were never cleared by anyone. You could have buried anything in those woods. If someone disappeared out there, that would have been it. The animal realized a few seconds after I broke the tree line that I wasn't going to wait. I didn't hear it talk, but I did hear it start moving behind me. The movement was what kept me sprinting, kept me pushing myself. I heard the legs, there seemed to be so many of them, and the trees. The animal was so strong that every few breaths I was taking I would hear a great tree get splintered or another tree fall down. It was gaining on me. Another tree fell. I could hear the animal breathing. Alex. Alex. It said. Alex. I couldn't turn around. I didn't want to. If it weren't for the terrain, I would have closed my eyes, hidden deep inside myself, and hoped to wake up alive. The breathing was so close, almost right next to my ears. I didn't want to see. I didn't want to see the moment happen. I wanted to try to fight until the very end. And that's when I found another trail. Out of nowhere, it was going in the same direction as the main trail I'd always ran down. I didn't think of anything besides getting home and escaping. I opened up my stride and I did my best to breathe correctly. Pump my arms. Perfect form. Perfect form. Not slamming my feet. Not arching my back too much. Staying forward. Letting my core be involved. It was the most important run of my life. I was the gazelle. Breathe out. I had to be. Breathe in. I needed to be perfect. Breathe out. I needed to live. Breathe in. I knew I had a chance if I could sustain the pace, maintain, and not look back. Even on the trail, I could still hear the animal crashing through the woods behind me, as if the trail wasn't wide enough for whatever size the animal must have been. I didn't want to think about how massive it was, how easily the animal was going to tear me apart, how my skin was going to feel sliding off my bones. I tried to keep my mind on the run, on the breathing, on staying consistent pushing off with each step long strides. I could make it if I kept the form, kept the breathing, ignore the pain in my shins and my thighs, how my hamstrings were starting to pull with the strain I was putting myself under, forcing myself to open up my stride. I was past muscle failure when I ran past the stump. I wasn't sure how I was doing what I was doing, but I knew I wanted to live, knew that if I kept that in my mind, I could do it. I was so close. I saw the edge of the woods, and there was maybe a quarter of a mile before I was out. I wasn't sure how I'd never seen the trail I was on. It appeared that the trail would connect with the main trail before the end. I was there. I was going to make it. The animal kept running after me. It must have had so many legs smashing through the bushes and tearing apart all the trees. Ten feet away from the wood line, I took a step, but my foot didn't land right. The animal had caught me by grabbing a hold of my foot. I was pulled to the ground. My head hit something while I was being flipped upside down. The animal raised me up to its face and spoke. Alex, I love games. I told you that you couldn't run. Was that torture for you? I let you get this far. (laughs) The animal's tongue came out of its mouth. Long and grotesque, the tongue slipped down my shorts to taste the urine. It was a violating sensation. Sandpaper. If I hadn't already done so, I would have urinated myself again. Mm, Salty. The animal said. I was shaking. There's a certain type of anticipation that the body experiences when the mind knows everything is about to end. I could feel it in the back of my neck. A kind of tingle. Instead of forgetting to breathe, I couldn't get enough air. My lungs were a vacuum. 
I was upside down but raised high enough to be eye level with the animal. The creature was something old and eternal. The hair matted in odd places, patches of scales, sharp joints of a being that should have died when the planet was young. My heart ached to be so close to home, but instead be looking at true evil. The monster, the devil, to see the matted hair and the black line over the blue eyes. Oh, Alex, sweetie, no tears. Now, now, do stop screaming. No one can hear you in this terrible dream, the animal said. The smell was too complicated for human noses to understand. It was disgusting and as hot as a furnace. My skin felt tighter after each breath from the creature. And the animal was right. I was screaming. I didn't even realize it. My mind was in so many places I couldn't think of anything to do. I was trapped. Caught. Please! The only word I managed to get out. Don't mind if I do, boy. What happened next was so fast. I was instantly flipped right side up and watched as the animal opened its mouth wide. All those teeth seemed to be infinite. An impossibly deep throat. A part of my mind thought I was looking into hell itself. There was no fire. Just the heat of it. There was only teeth. The animal's tongue slid out of its mouth and wrapped around my leg and drifted up. I tried to struggle away, but there was nowhere to go in that amount of time. I saw my leg slowly being pulled into the mouth. The end. I closed my eyes. My skin slid off the bone like the icicle on a popsicle stick. I felt the tug, the pressure, and then heard a pop and feeling of release. At first, I couldn't tell if the fire that shot up my leg was the heat from the animal's mouth or the pain. It was searing. I couldn't help but look, see what had happened. I was bleeding everywhere, so much blood drenching the animal's face. I realized why the animal's fur was all matted. It had its eyes closed, enjoying the blood spraying all over it. Half of my leg was gone, disappeared in the animal's mouth. The pain was everywhere, and I was surprised that I had not immediately gone into shock. I knew that I needed to keep my head together, I needed to concentrate. Then I heard the crunching. The animal started to chew. It was eating my leg. It dropped me to the ground. It seemed to be caught up in the sensation, like it hadn't eaten in years, and maybe it hadn't. I didn't care. I needed to escape. I needed to get home. Home. I was almost in my backyard. I was ten feet away. There was so much blood. I knew I had only a few minutes, maybe seconds. I needed to get to my backyard. I needed to crawl. I rolled over to my stomach and I moved every remaining limb as fast as I could. No. Stop, stop, stop. The animal's mouth was full. I had the notion that it didn't want to stop chewing. It paused, as if to decide whether it should just enjoy what it had or to catch me. Maybe it paused intentionally. By the time the animal made the decision to lunge at me, I had rolled the rest of the way into my backyard. I had done it. I made it back. I rolled to my back. I knew I needed to stop bleeding. Seconds mattered. I ripped off all of my clothes and tore them to tie a tourniquet. I pulled the knots tight and covered the stump that remained of my leg. My heart was still beating. I needed to hydrate. I needed to. I needed to get to a doctor. I laid on my back at the edge of my backyard, having saved myself from the animal that chased me through the woods. I passed out. I woke up an instant later. Maybe it was hours, I couldn't tell with the sun. I looked over. Maybe it had all just been a dream, a nightmare, and I had dehydrated on my run. It was a relieving feeling. But after a moment, the clouds in my head started to clear. 
It wasn't a dream. At the edge of the woods, it was there, peeking behind a tree, somehow hiding the true size of itself. The animal. It was dangling a shredded running shoe in one of its hands. My running shoe. I heard a slow crunching sound, a steady chewing. The animal was still chewing on my bones. It began to speak again, except its voice had changed to the voice of my mother. Alex. Alex. Wake up, sweetheart. It's time to go outside and play. Go off and play in the woods. Don't you want to come back, honey? Do come back. Maybe tomorrow? Yes? Get your five miles in. Get your ten miles in. I'll see you then, dear. I will see you then. I never could figure out what made the animal stop. How it wasn't able to move past the wood line. Or even how I knew I would be safe if I made it to my backyard. It wasn't really under my bed as a child. The cottage. Mother. I didn't understand. I crawled back to my house. The bleeding had slowed, but the bandages were soaked through with my blood. I was really lightheaded. I thought I was going to pass out again when I had to push the sliding glass door open. I managed to make a phone call before passing out again. The doctors didn't know what to think. I told them it was a gator that got me. No one would have believed anything else. No one questioned me further with that information either. People rarely show up at an ER with a leg bitten off. No doctor would have the experience to really question my story anyways. I have never gone back in the woods. Never even thought about it. I could never go back. Sometimes, if I wake up before the sun rises, I'll be drinking my coffee. And right when the sun hits the tree line, I'll see it. The animal peeking out behind a tree. Never the same tree. What is left of my leg will always ache, and I'll feel the sensation of being lowered into the animal's mouth again. And the tip of my leg feels that fire. The tip of my stump. Once the twilight of morning is past, the animal will duck behind whatever it's hiding behind and disappear. It never speaks. It never does anything else but look at me. I never see the animal's teeth. But I don't ever have to. Even in the pool water and sweltering heat, her lips remained a vibrant red. I knew it was creepy to watch my neighbor swimming, but I just didn't know how to talk to her. She climbed up the side of the pool for a rest, singing something sweet but muffled as she combed her fingers through her hair. I didn't even know if she was into girls or not. With a creak, I pushed the window open a little to hear her singing. It's a fine day. I couldn't quite make out all the words. Her eyes caught mine, and I leapt back from the window. She must have seen me. My heart pounded painfully in my chest. In a moment of bravery, or maybe just panic, I decided that talking to her was the only way to redeem myself. Just a pep talk later, I found myself hiding behind the fence and trying to think of something to say. Finally, I decided that I would ask her about her waterproof makeup. Or maybe not. That might sound weird. Frustrated, I decided just to pop my head up over the fence and say the first thing that came to mind. I soon found that the fence was higher than I had anticipated. With my face scrunched between the fence posts, I said the first thing that came to my mind, maybe a little louder than necessary. Hey, I like the day out. <sighs> what I meant to say was either... I like your makeup, or beautiful day out. However, my decision led to this mess. 
I was ready to run back inside and never come out again. But then she laughed. It sounded like music. I like the day too, she said. I could feel the blood rush to my ears. She must have noticed I was blushing. Do you want to come hang out at the pool? Not wanting to say something embarrassing, I nodded energetically, which was probably a lot worse. Then I dashed inside to get my swimsuit. When I walked around her yard, she was nowhere to be found. Don't go in the pool yet. I'm getting some drinks, she yelled from inside the house. I sat down on a lawn chair. The sun was fierce, and I realized I wasn't wearing sunscreen. Ten minutes passed, and I began to sweat profusely. Surely she wouldn't mind if I just dipped my toes in. I sat down at the side of the pool and carefully dipped one leg in. Ah, it was cold, more so than swimming pools generally are. Considering the weather, this was a welcome anomaly. Without thinking, I slid into the pool entirely. The water was extremely cold, and a shiver ran down my spine. It smelled strangely too, like salt. I kicked my legs to stay afloat while I rubbed some warmth into my cold arms. Something touched my foot, something like seaweed. I tore my leg away, though it got entangled in the stuff. I gave it another, more violent tug, and finally tore it free. Flailing about in a panic, I pulled myself up onto the tiled poolside. Shivering with both cold and fear, I pulled the strange tendrils off my leg. They were dark and stringy. With a jolt, I recognized what it was. Human hair. I looked into the pool. Nothing was there. With disgust, I peeled the slimy strands off my skin and tossed them onto the grass. Then, she returned with two glasses of lemonade. I thought I told you not to go into the pool. Her voice had a beautiful sing-song quality, even when she got mad. I... I... Uh... Her demeanor softened. She set down the lemonade on the table. It's okay. If you want to go into the pool now, we can go into it. She began climbing into the water. I didn't want to go into the pool anymore, but also I didn't want to be rude. The water was just as cold as ever. She led me into the middle, where it was the deepest. I was never great at swimming, but as I struggled to stay afloat, the water surged into my nose and mouth. It tasted salty, like ocean water. Let's try to swim down and touch the bottom, she suggested. I didn't like the idea, but I went along with it anyway. I swam down, my lungs burning. Something bumped into me. Despite the stinging, I opened my eyes. A pair of cold, dead eyes stared back at me. I yelped, letting my breath escape in a rush of bubbles. I kept my eyes open as I tore through the water. The water seemed infinite, definitely beyond the proportions of the swimming pool. All around me, dead bodies were suspended and upright under the surface. Some had pieces missing, as though something had been eating on them. Something wrapped around my leg, and it definitely wasn't hair this time. I looked down and saw her, unnaturally red lips pulled back in a mocking smile, revealing a row of sharp teeth not unlike those of an anglerfish. I struggled weakly. My vision became blotchy and blurred. I could see the surface above me. Human forms bobbed up and down, dark and shapeless in the infinite water. 
In one last effort, I kicked as hard as my oxygen-starved muscles would allow. For a moment, her grip slackened, and I swam frantically. When I finally broke through the surface, the atmosphere was strangely calm. I heard the hum of lawn mowers in the distance as I desperately sucked air back into my lungs. My arms were shaking as I pulled myself out of the pool. I looked back into the water. Nothing was there. Now, as I'm sitting here writing this, I can still hear her singing her siren song. I remember seeing the house for the first time. I was a child of seven. My young parents had just bought their first home. I remember how much I used to hate living in the cramped, dingy apartment we previously inhabited and opened the doors to our new home with wide-eyed wonder. It blew my young mind how spacious this house was. I went upstairs to scope out my new bedroom. I was so excited that I was getting my own room and did not have to share one with my infant brother. On my grand tour of my new digs, I finally made it down to our basement. The basement was nothing like the rest of the house. The upstairs was elegant and classy. The basement was cold, metallic, sterile, and stinky. The ceiling was lined with ancient pipes winding in grotesque angles. The floor was covered in rough cement. I recall taking a look at the stairs for the first time and being immediately struck with how odd they were. The stairs were surrounded by drywall which clashed with the rest of the basement. One particular section of the wall was colored differently than the rest. It stood out like a sore thumb. I inched close to it and felt the texture of it. It felt very strange. I then knocked on it. A hollow sound pervaded the empty air of that basement. Something about that sound immediately put me ill at ease. I walked up the stairs as I could hear that same hollow sound echo in the emptiness of the basement. As we settled into our new home, I began to get comfortable with my surroundings. The house began to feel familiar, everywhere that is, except for the basement. It just always put me off, and I avoided going down there as best I could. Our family couldn't be happier. My loving father and mother doted over me and my little brother. My life was perfect. Then it began. I would hear strange, errant noises. When I pointed it out to my parents, they told me the old standby that the house was settling in. One night in particular indicated that something wasn't right. I snuck downstairs to the kitchen for a late night snack. As I closed the refrigerator, I heard a tapping sound cut through the silence of the night. I craned my head to see if I could pinpoint where the sound was coming from. Dread began to wash over me as I realized that tapping was coming from the basement. I inched my way over to the basement door. I opened it to see the blackness of the depths below. My ears perked up. There it was again, that hollow tapping sound. The same sound I had heard on my initial visit to the basement from hitting the drywall. I turned on the lights, stealing myself to go down the stairs and investigate. The tapping continued as I took the first step. Fear overtook me. I ran back to my bedroom and hid under my covers until the morning light gave way to a new day. I remember walking down the stairs. 
Being the first one up and about, I ran to the living room to play Nintendo. On my way, I passed the door to the basement. It was shut. Though I was in a state of near panic when I ran from it the previous night, I distinctly remember leaving the door open and not turning off the lights. I rationalized that my mother or father must have gone down there for some reason and lost myself in Super Mario Bros. 3. Later, I mentioned the incident to my parents, and they just assured me that what I'd heard was the sound of the hot water heater clicking in the night. I knew better, but welcomed a logical explanation. About a month after the move, my mother asked me to run downstairs and grab a load of socks out of the dryer that were in the basement. I reluctantly told her I would. It was the middle of the day and enough time had passed to dull the fear I had felt the week prior. I turned on the lights. I ran down the stairs. Hearing the hollow sound echo with my footsteps, a cold sweat started to form on me. The smell hit my nose as I reached the last step. My parents had mentioned that a mouse must have died and assured me they would find it. I made my way to the dryer and grabbed a basket. I pulled the socks out hastily and shoved them into the basket. After I shut the door to the dryer, I surveyed my surroundings. The stillness of the basement was so eerie. Then I heard it. A faintly audible whisper. At first I thought it was somebody calling from upstairs their voice scarcely making it down to the basement. However, this was not the case. That sound was coming from the basement, specifically from under the stairs. As I stood frozen with fear, it began to increase in volume, but still remained barely above the threshold of human perception, what was being said incomprehensible to my young ears. Then it stopped as quickly as it began. I moved towards the stairs, keeping my eye on the oddly colored portion of the drywall. As I took my first step to escape this ever-growing nightmare, the most profoundly terrifying moment of my life occurred. A loud, hollow banging shook the stairs, almost knocking me to the ground. I ran up the stairs as fast as my legs would carry me. Through tears and shaking uncontrollably, I told my parents what had happened. They tried their best to calm me, but nothing they said could ease my mind. I told them in no certain terms I would never go down to the basement again. They must have been convinced of how terrified I was because they honored my request and never sent me down there again. After another three months in the house, things returned to normalcy for me, and honestly, there was about a two-week period where I was happy again. This would be the last time happiness would exist in my life or my family's. One moment in particular comes to mind. I remember lifting up little Jonathan above my head as his pacifier fell out of his mouth and brushed against my nose. I pulled him in for a big bear hug and remember how he smelled. That wonderful smell that only babies emit. I was so content. It all came crashing down for me and my parents the night of July 2nd, 1991. That is the day Jonathan went missing. A ransom note was scrawled in barely legible English and left in his bed demanding $20,000 in cash. It informed my parents that if they contacted the police, they would kill little Jonathan. My mother and father took to their room and argued loudly and emotionally over whether or not to call the police as I listened with tears streaming down my face. My mother eventually wore my father down, and the police were called. Seeing as the location of the drop and time were indicated on the note, the police set up a wiretap just in case the kidnapper decided to call. 
I remember asking my parents and the police if they had thoroughly searched through the house in case he was still there. They assured me they had, and that Jonathan would be fine after the drop. But the seed of an idea was already growing in my mind. It would blossom throughout the rest of my life. My parents followed the instructions to a T. They dropped off the money and then waited in the location that they were supposed to pick up Jonathan. He never came. Needless to say, this tore my family apart. As the weeks passed and there was no news about Jonathan, my young, vibrant parents became husks of their former selves. My mother especially. She blamed herself for getting the police involved and believed that to be the reason Jonathan was not returned. One night, as she was sobbing alone in shambles clutching a bottle of wine, I finally decided to divulge to her the theory that had been brewing inside my skull. I told her that I thought it was whoever, or whatever for that matter, was under the stairs that had gotten Jonathan, and maybe he was still alive. She slapped me across my face so hard that I saw stars. She screamed at me, the guilt expressing itself as rage. She told me to stop the childish crap and just accept that Jonathan was taken out of the house by some sick person and was dead. My childhood died that day. I remember contemplating taking a hammer and exposing whatever was under the stairs myself, but the fear of childhood was just too overwhelming for me to actually do it, let alone step one stair down into that basement again. My family moved shortly after the incident. I remember looking to the future with what might resemble optimism, only to have it come crashing down yet again. My parents divorced. The grief was too much to share, and not a year after that my mother killed herself. The guilt must have just overwhelmed her. My father did his best to raise me, but Jonathan's long shadow always hung over our lives. Twenty years later, I began to think long and hard about my little brother's disappearance and how angry it made me. My family had a chance at a normal and fulfilling life, and it was snuffed out in an instant by whoever took him. I wasn't just robbed of a little brother, I was robbed of a chance of happiness. As I grew up, I accepted the official story of what happened. But lately, curiosity began to get the better of me. I began to drive past the old house. Seeing that it was currently vacant, Ideas began to swirl in my head. I broke into the house one night bolstered by alcohol. I decided to do it, knowing I would likely find nothing under the basement stairs, but hoping that this would close a too long chapter in my life and allow me to finally move on. To my dismay, the stairs sounded exactly the same as I remember they did a hollow sound pervading the emptiness of the basement. I stared at the spot in the drywall, still discolored, still just as ominous as it was when I was a child. However, the fear was not going to stop me this time. In fact, I was feeling the opposite. I was feeling a courage I hadn't felt in a long time. The moment of truth was upon me, With all the force within me emboldened by years of pent-up rage, I ran towards the wall shoulder first. The drywall came crashing down around me. I opened my eyes as my bravery was immediately eroded and turned into absolute horror. My God. Bones. Bones everywhere. My horror increased to unimaginable heights as I surveyed the tight space, seeing the myriad of skeletons strewn about. The light played menacingly off their tiny white frames. Tattered pieces of paper were strewn about with God only knows what written on them. 
there must have been the remains of twenty or thirty children. My fright reached a crescendo when I realized that with no exceptions, they were all missing their skulls. One particular tiny skeleton begged for my attention. I became weak in the knees and fell backwards when I saw what were unmistakably bite marks up and down the tiny forearm. As I hit the ground, I expected to hear a dull thud as I landed on the concrete. Instead, I heard a hollow sound. I looked to see what I had landed on. A trap door. Finding new courage, summoning strength I didn't know I had, I opened it. Below me lay a dark tunnel, a crawl space that could barely fit a person lying on their stomach. The dank smell wafting upward made me reluctant, but I knew what I had to do. Before I was conscious of what my muscles were doing, I found myself crawling through the darkness toward whatever lay on the other side. As I reached the end of the tunnel, I looked up to see a sliver of light cutting through the darkness. With trepidation, I pushed onwards. Cautiously, I poked my head up. To my surprise, the tunnel led to the other side of the stairs. I crawled out to find myself in the corner of the basement, facing the stairs behind a dryer covered in years of dust. The implications of all of this sent my mind reeling, but before I could form a coherent thought, the lights turned off in the basement. My heart caught in my throat as I began to hear someone descending the stairs. Slow but sure footsteps announcing I was no longer alone. With every thud, my heart skipped a beat. I began to hear that incomprehensible whispering, the familiarity reigning the fear and woe of my lost childhood. Worrying the darkness would not adequately hide me, I sought cover by ducking behind the dryer, not willing to take the risk of catching a glimpse, though every fiber of my being screamed to do so. Panic began to set in. What was I going to do when he, or it, discovered his lair had been revealed. While I was mulling over my options, the screaming began. I say scream as a frame of reference, but there is no way to truly describe the guttural noises I heard. The sound smashing the silence of the basement was so bone-chilling, so surreal as to defy description. He clearly had discovered his perverse sanctuary had been disturbed. Before I knew it, I was running up the stairs for my life. I made it to my car too scared to turn around. With all muscles working in concert, I opened the door and put the key into the ignition in one swift movement. As my car sprang to life under the street light, a shadow fell on my car. I gunned it never once looking back, flooring the accelerator to the local police precinct. I breathlessly tried to explain to the attending officer what had occurred and collapsed onto the floor in mid-sentence. Now it is a month later. The next day after my discovery, the police launched an investigation and quickly made the same gruesome discovery as I had. I was thanked profusely by the police and the community for what I had found, telling me that they were going to be able to close the books on multiple missing person cases. However, they were not able to find the perpetrator of these heinous crimes. They began to test the DNA of the bodies. A profound sense of relief overcame me when I received the call informing me that one of the tiny skeletons belonged to my brother Jonathan. I shared the news with my father. The look of relief on his face tugged at my heart. The burden he had carried for so many years was lifted. We hugged as tears filled both our eyes. However, the relief has been short-lived. 
The thing that keeps me up at night is whoever or whatever did this is still out there. The question that plagues my mind is whether or not this monster is literal or figurative. Either way, I hope I will never find out. Hello, Reddit. My name is Brent Jenkins. I'm from the northern part of central Michigan in the Lower Peninsula, and currently we are in a winter storm watch. High winds up to 40 miles per hour, with heavy snowfall and freezing rain. I knew a storm was due, as we've had one of the mildest winters I can remember. So when our power flickered before going out entirely, I wasn't too concerned. I got three kerosene heaters out and prepared to wait out the storm. After last night, I'm positive the power going out wasn't due to the storm. Let me explain. I woke up around 3.30 in the morning to heavy rain slamming into the side of my home. The winds howled as the storm made itself known. I hoped the power would stay on, but since I am surrounded by trees, I knew it would go out. I'd spend the next day cutting down trees and removing tree limbs from my yard. This is nothing new, though. It's one of the prices you pay for living out in the country. <laughs> and for living in Michigan. Not long after I woke up, the power began to flicker as I expected. Ah, damn it. I muttered, tossing the blankets off. I got up and walked to my closet, digging through useless junk to find the kerosene heater. Once I found it, I dragged it out and set it up in the center of my bedroom. The container which held the kerosene gas was out in the shed, and I cursed myself under my breath for not bringing it in before bed. I threw my boots on and opened the front door. Instantly, the winds yanked the screen door out of my hand, slamming it into the porch railing. I fought the wind as I stepped out and closed it after some effort. I was a little stunned at just how strong the winds were, making the freezing rain sting as it pelted my face. I ran as quickly as I could to the shed, shielding my face the whole time. As soon as I opened the door and stepped inside, the wind and rain outside completely stopped. Only a soft drizzle remained. What the hell? I asked myself as I opened the shed door back to look outside. It was ominously quiet, as if all sounds seemingly stopped together. Even the light drizzle came to a halt. The air hung heavy with an odd static feel to the air. My ears slightly rang as this new calm to the air was deafening. I couldn't quite figure out why, but I was completely terrified. Everything about being out there alone made me feel incredibly exposed. After a few seconds of scanning my yard, I heard something. A tapping. My head spun around to the back side of my house, and I caught movement. It was gone as quickly as I saw it. Something disappeared behind the back wall. My heart slammed into my chest, and a lump formed in my throat. Judging by what little I saw, it looked like a man, if he were seven feet tall with blanky arms. I made the decision to make a mad dash for the front door before it came back around. After what felt like an eternity, I made it to the door and ran inside, quickly but quietly shutting and locking it behind me. I ran to my bedroom, and like a scared little boy of ten, I dove under the covers. I lay there panting for a few minutes, catching my breath before mustering the courage to peek out from under the blankets. My room was clear, but movement to my left by the window caused my heart to race again. My eyes slowly looked toward the window, 
seeing the shape of a dark head peeking in through the glass. As I laid my eyes on it, the thing stopped tapping. Its mouth curled into a huge grin as our eyes met. It shouldn't have been able to see me. My head was under the blanket still as I was peeking my eyes out from a slit in them. It looked like a bald, normal man, other than it appeared to be hunched over, cupping his hands around his eyes. My window was about six feet off the ground, so in order for him to be hunched, he had to be extremely tall. His smile was also much wider than his mouth should have allowed without tearing his lips. I decided to lay perfectly still, hoping he thought I was asleep. Deep down, I know he knew I was awake. I didn't look away once. I'd fear he'd slink away and find his way inside. I had a rifle in my closet, but the bullets were locked in a container. I never thought I'd have to use my gun for protection, just hunting. I glanced towards my closet for a split second, and when I looked back to the window, he was gone. My heart started hammering even louder than it already was as I lost sight of him. Still, I didn't move a muscle. I laid still like that for hours, afraid to move. Only when the rain picked back up and the wind started to howl did I start to relax a little. This was when I noticed that heavy feeling in the air was gone as well. I slowly uncovered and got out of bed, tiptoeing through the house. Light started peeking in through the windows as well, hinting it was around 7.30 in the morning. I walked up to every window, peeking out for any signs of the man, whatever he was. Thankfully, I saw nothing. I was dead tired, so I walked over to the coffee maker and pressed brew. To my amazement, the power was back on. I hadn't even realized the heater kicking on throughout the night. I was too busy, nervously awaiting for that thing to break in and kill me. I flicked the TV on, and the morning news began to play. A local man attacked in his bedroom early this morning. He did not survive the injuries, the lady reported. After a few minutes of watching a picture of the man attacked showed, and I dropped my coffee cup, shattering on impact with the hard wooden floor. It was a picture of my neighbor that lived a half mile up the road. He was found dead in his bed by his wife, who thankfully was sleeping in their kid's room due to them being afraid of the power being out. No one had heard him struggle or anything, just found him murdered. <sighs> I was stunned. I knew right away that it had something to do with that creepy tall guy I saw at my window. If I hadn't seen him and run inside when I did, I'm sure I'd have shared the same fate as my neighbor's husband. As I sat listening to the news continue their story, a weather update caught my attention. Prepare for round two of the storm continuing through tonight. The storm strength will increase, so people are advised to deal with more power outages. We will keep you updated as we track this storm. She finished. Goosebumps filled my entire body at the thought of that thing coming back. I don't know how I know, but I know it will come back with the storm. This time, however, I'm going to be prepared. I loaded my rifle, and it's sitting next to my nightstand. I have a feeling I'll be needing it tonight. As a kid, I lived with neglectful parents at best. At worst, Dad would turn his screams and fists on me. But I learned quickly how to dodge the worst of it. Mom wasn't much of a help. She'd just smoke in the kitchen and complain at him for staying out too late. At the same time, we lived basically in the middle of nowhere. Our nearest neighbors were a long walk away for a six-year-old, 
and we had trees between us. No one to run to for help. But I was pretty small for a kid my age. I learned I could fit pretty much anywhere. The closet, dryer. I think even once I tucked myself under the futon in such a way I could still get some air, but no one could see me. I was a master at hiding, but it wasn't for a good reason. One night, I chose to do something different. I could hear it in Dad's yells. He was ticked and was about to get violent. Mom wasn't helping either, just piling fuel onto an inferno of flame. So I knew I had to find a good hiding spot. I'd gotten the idea a few days before when I realized the lattice covering the bottom half of the back porch had a hole in it. Not big enough to fit a full-grown man, most likely, but it could fit a skinny six-year-old, no problem. So, wrapping myself up in my blanket and grabbing my hippo stuffy, I snuck out of my window and ran into the backyard. In the middle of autumn, when it was 40 degrees out and the temperature was steadily dropping, I crawled under the porch, scraping my elbows and getting splinters in my palms, but I fit inside. It was actually quite spacious compared to most of my hiding spots. I couldn't sit all the way up, but I had plenty of room to spread out my limbs. Of course, I was getting covered in dirt. It had rained a few days ago, so the mud was still a little wet. I wrapped myself in my blankie the best I could, and settled in for the night. But soon, even with my blankie and hippo, my teeth were chattering so hard I could barely breathe. I didn't want to go back inside though, knowing if my dad caught me, I'd be in for the whipping of my life. So, I had to tough it out. Honey, are you cold? That voice was not the voice of my mother, scratchy from all the smoking and screeching she did. It was sweet like honey. I turned over to see the dim outline of a woman lying on her stomach next to me. She had a pretty butterfly necklace and was just as dirty as I was. I nodded, not wondering how she'd been down there without my noticing. The woman belly crawled forward and wrapped her arms around me, and suddenly I became warm, like I was sitting next to a campfire. I snuggled into her arms, not minding the mud. After all, we were both dirty. You've gotten so big, the woman said, examining my face. How old are you now, Alex? Six. How did I know this woman again? I didn't think I did. Six, the woman gasped. You're all grown up then. I'm so happy. She sighed pleasantly and stroked my hair. I'd never felt so cozy in my life. What's your name? I asked. She smiled. I could hear it in her voice. I'm Lily. What's your favorite thing to do? I had to think for a second. I like board games and coloring. Lily chuckled. Just like me then. Could never get enough of Scrabble. But I guess you're still too young to play that then. I nodded. Uh, lots of words. I want to play it though. I like the titles. Would you play it with me? I heard Lily sharply inhale. I, I... I don't think I can. Your daddy... He put me under here. And I can't leave. But... She thought for a second. Alex, could you do me a favor? Of course. This lady was oh so nice. Why wouldn't I do her a favor? When you wake up in the morning, go to the police station. Ask for an officer by the name of Lowell Joyce. Tell him where to find Lily, okay? 
under your back porch. He'll come and he'll get me, okay? And... and then maybe we can play Scrabble. <sighs> Yippee. I was all too excited about the possibility of playing Scrabble to notice how Lily's voice caught at the end. I nodded vigorously. I'll do it. We can be on the same team, right? Lily softly laughed. <laughs> I'll help you understand the rules. Good night, Alex. When I woke up the next morning, I heard Lily's voice. Go now. Your dad's gone to work. I'll tell you how to get to the station. Rubbing my eyes, I crawled out from under the porch and went into the house to grab my shoes and a coat. I shivered in the frosty cold, but I thought Lily was right behind me. After my shoes and coat were on, I started walking. It was long enough to get to the neighbor's house. I really can't remember how long it took me to get to the police station, although I have no idea why no one pulled over to see what the hell a six-year-old in dirty pajamas was doing walking alongside the road. Lily kept guiding me onwards. Wait. Okay. Cross the street now. Turn right here. Keep going. You've almost made it. I nearly collapsed with exhaustion by the time I walked into the station. The guys out front chatting and having a good time didn't see me until I almost made it to the front desk. Whoa, kid. You okay? One of the officers knelt down to my level, eyes wide. I nodded. I'm okay. Can I speak to Lowell Joyce? I asked. One of the other officers picked me up. Sure, kid. Sure. Let's just get you someplace warm. Holy crap, your lips are blue. I remembered quietly scolding the man about watching his language. Crap was a bad word. I was given some warm cocoa and wrapped up in a blanket by the time an old man with a graying mustache sat by me. Hey kid, I'm Sheriff Joyce. What's your name? He asked. Uh, Alex. I set my cup down and looked at him straight in the eye. I was told to tell you that Lily is under the back porch. You need to go let her out so we can play Scrabble. I had never seen a grown man turn pale before. Lots of things blurred together at this point. I remember being taken back to my house, and there were lots of police cars and people around. The back porch was surrounded by yellow tape, and someone was taking a black bag away while my father was in handcuffs. After that, I lived with my grandparents, Sheriff Joyce and his wife. I tried to ask about what happened and who was Lily, but I always got shut down. I was too young to know. But life got better, a lot better. Grandpa was one of the best men I could have ever hoped for in my life. We went out on weekends to the movies, where he let me have the giant soda even though I'd have to pee in the middle of the movie. When I asked if I could drink when I was thirteen, he let me try a beer. <laughs> I spat it out and didn't touch it again. He never judged me for my love of art letting me paint my own bedroom multiple times over the years. I felt safe around him. He never laid a hand on me. My grandmother was amazing too. Over the week, she'd homeschooled me, along with teaching me about things that you wouldn't learn in school, such as how to respect others, but not take their crap. And cooking. <laughs> Lots of cooking. I could make my own birthday cake by the time I was twelve, but I usually just made them for my friends. I got a lot of those after I was free from my dad. 
When I turned 16, Grandpa took me back to my dad's house. The whole thing had been bulldozed over, but I could still see the yellow tape wound around a few trees, faded and torn. We sat together on the back of his truck. He opened a beer and drank half of it before setting it down and grabbing me an orange soda. After I drank it, he told me, Lily was your mother. Good thing he didn't tell me as I was swallowing. I likely would have had it coming out of my nose. My mom? I questioned, confused. Your actual mom, the woman who lived with your dad, was not your mother. My granddad grabbed another beer. Lily was my daughter. I loved her so much. But when you were around six months old, she vanished. My stomach dropped. My dad just imprisoned her under the porch? I asked, starting to feel sick. Grandpa took a deep breath before setting his unopened beer down. That's something I've never been able to understand. Lily told you to find me, and that she loved Scrabble. Yeah, she kept me warm that night. I probably would have frozen to death if she hadn't been there. I was a stupid kid, even I knew that. Grandpa went dead quiet before he opened the beer and slammed the whole thing. Alex, Lily had been dead the whole time she was gone. When we dug her up, she was bones. Experts confirmed it, and your dad confessed to what happened. They'd gotten into a fight, and he threw her down the stairs. She broke her neck. He clenched his fists. I knew he had something to do with her disappearance, but I never had proof until you walked into my station, covered in dirt, telling me she was under the porch. I was floored. I couldn't breathe. All I could do was shake my head. But, 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 I, I saw her. She was alive. She had this butterfly necklace. I trailed off when Grandpa pulled an evidence baggie from his pocket. There was that butterfly necklace all right. Rusty and parts of paint had chipped off, but I remember it as clearly as I remembered Lily's face. Grandpa took a shaky breath as he pressed the bag into my hands. Lily loved you so much. It's why she stuck around, that bastard. You were her whole world. She was constantly taking pictures and sending them to us in the mail. Sometimes, a mother's love can accomplish things that no human can do. My eyes overflowed with tears as I clutched the necklace to my chest. Choking on sobs, I leaned against Grandpa. He held me tight, and I swear I felt a few of his tears land on the top of my head. And for just a brief moment, I swear I felt that warm love I felt that night under the porch. Eric was at one time my friend. Whether I'm proud of this fact remains to be seen. <laughs> I guess you could say I'm paying the price for it. Ever since grade school, Eric has been called Muffin Face because, well, his face looks like a muffin. He's puffy. Puffy cheeks, puffy lips, and double chin like he's always an anaphylactic shock. This, combined with his heavy weight, didn't make things easy for him. I can't tell you how many times Eric was sent to the nurse because of teachers freaking out, thinking he was having an allergic reaction to something. 
A few times the fire department even showed up, only to be bewildered by his strange muffin face and no allergy symptoms. He was like a walking circus freak show, and everyone made fun of him. But I was fascinated. I'd watch as he'd circle the perimeter of the playground at recess, mumbling to himself or eating his odd lunch. I'll get to this later. Alone, completely oblivious to the teasing happening around him. Even in classroom he'd keep to himself, the teachers always setting his desk away from the larger class. They just kind of let Eric be Eric. I'd like to think it's because of his smarts and that he didn't need the attention all of us morons did. But truth be told, he repulsed them. I recall the cloudy day when I decided to talk to Eric the Muffin Face. He was walking the perimeter of the playground one day, and when passing by me on the basketball court, I heard what he was mumbling. It was a really, really weird kind of language. Lots of CH sounds and sharp tongue rattles. The other kids were in complete shock that I actually approached him to ask what he was doing. Making it rain, he replied in his thin and squeaky voice. I recall as if on some kind of mysterious cue, the bell rang at that exact moment and we all trudged back to class. It was then that I saw the clouds began to darken and a brisk cold wind pick up. By the end of that day, it was a downpour. None of the other kids believed me after telling them what he had said. They brushed it off as me just adding to the intrigue of Eric. How we became friends was out of pure curiosity. You see, after that day we spoke, the rain poured steadily for two weeks straight. This was difficult for me to accept as just coincidence. There was something oddly whimsical about Eric, a person of few words, a carefree approach to everything. Even when the entire school was chiming in to tease him, he just let it fly right off his back. So one day, I mustered up some eighth grade courage and sat next to him at lunch. He was eating, as I mentioned before, an odd lunch. They were perfectly squared pieces, not much larger than a typical toll house cookie, and looked like ham. What are those? I asked. Treats, he replied, eating one after the other and humming to himself as if existing on a planet other than our own. I asked him about the rain. He simply grinned and said, No recess for you. I should have moved to a different table right then and there, but what do you expect? I was a dumb and curious eighth grader, and instead of doing the logical thing, I made it worse by following him home. As all of the parents' cars crammed into the pickup zone, I saw Eric head across the playground toward the woods behind the school. Instead of catching my carpool, I followed him into the rain. I stayed a good deal behind, but just enough to keep him in my sights. My mind swirled with questions as I followed. Was he responsible for this rain? Did he somehow summon it with that weird language I'd heard him speak? And where in the heck did he actually live? Before I knew it, we were a couple of miles away from the school and headed directly into the Black Hills. This was a place totally off limits, not only to us kids, but literally everyone in the town. Not that we weren't allowed there, it's just always avoided if possible, and is host to many sordid tales. Nevertheless, there was I following Eric the Muffin Face as he strolled carefree into the dead oak trees that towered above us. When we reached his house, it literally popped up out of nowhere. One minute there was nothing but dead trees, Then all of a sudden, there it was, Eric's house. I halted and watched in hiding as Eric finished the last 50 yards to his home. Before he reached the door, a woman came out to meet him, his mother. She began to scold him, pointing her finger toward me. She sharply marched inside and slammed the door. It was then that Eric faced my direction 
and looked directly at me. I don't know how he knew I was there. I could do nothing but surrender, and so I did. (sighs) In more ways than one. I came out of my cover and hurried, walking back home. I knew he'd see me, but thought it maybe was far enough away for him to not know who I was. By now, the rain was fiercely falling from the black clouds above, disorienting me. It wasn't long before I had become lost. Then, again out of nowhere it seemed, Eric's house appeared, and he was standing in front as if waiting for me to arrive. It's possible I walked in circles within the dense trees and pouring rain, but I honestly don't remember. Before I knew it, Eric and I were now face to muffin face. Mama wants me to play with you, he said glumly. I could tell by his tone that he didn't really want to and was upset that I'd followed him home. Eric would have much rather been left alone. We sat on the old wood floor in his bedroom, and for what seemed like forever, Eric just stared at me, his face looking puffy as ever. I looked around his bare room, wondering what we could play with. Other than a run-down bed in the corner and a broken dresser stuffed with clothes, there was nothing. Eric seemed content just to sit and do nothing, as if waiting this whole thing out. Then his mother barged into the room. She was a short and round lady that Eric closely resembled, albeit her face not quite as puffy, but almost. She ignored me and laid into Eric with a fierce scolding in a foreign language. There were lots of tongue rattles and precisely placed caws and chas, similar to what I'd heard Eric mumble on the playground. Eric sat on the floor and took this merciless verbal berating with absolute zero expression. He simply sat on the floor motionless. After the verbal assault finally ended and his mother slammed the door shut, he finally spoke. You want some treats? He asked in his squeaky and whiny voice. Before I knew it, Eric was moving his dresser forward to get something he'd stored behind, as if keeping it hidden. He removed a small paper lunch bag and set it on the floor between us. Inside were the perfectly squared bites he was eating earlier that day at lunch. He offered me one. It was actually a tasty bite, maybe a little weird at first, a mix of shortbread cookie and spam meat-like texture. There was also a juicy type element that came with the spam, but without the actual juice. In no time at all, I was already two pieces in. I noticed Eric's mood change as he ate his share of treats. Mine had changed too. I felt happy and light-hearted, as if floating on a soft bed of fluffy clouds. Watch this, Eric said. He put his hands on his muffin face and began to push around. After a short minute, he removed them and there before me was the face of our math teacher, Mrs. Anderson. Pop quiz, he announced in his best Mrs. Anderson imitation. Startled, I threw myself back. I could not believe my own eyes. He turned his muffin face into our math teacher. Eric pushed into his face again, and this time our principal, Miss Ferguson, was before me. Mr. Eric, as long as you're in my school, you're not to talk to anyone. His Miss Ferguson impression was spot on. I was dumbfounded. None of the kids at school would ever believe this, and I was certain in that moment that I'd never tell a soul. I sat on the floor for what seemed like hours, eating treats and watching Eric change his face over and over. After the school faculty was done, he moved on to students, and that's when things began to change. He'd mush his face into friends of mine, the ones that would poke fun at him the most. Hey, fat ass, eat this. He did friend after friend, repeating all the nasty stuff they'd called him. 
I always thought Eric had let things roll off his back, but sitting there watching this made me realize I'd been horribly wrong. My light-hearted and comfy feeling the treats gave me suddenly disappeared. I instantly felt an exact opposite. A sadness overwhelmed me, and when Eric finally stopped his impressions, I was emotionally exhausted. I'm tired. You should go now. Eric said after a long stretch of us sitting in silence. The rain, pounding on the roof like a fire hose, told me this was going to be a long walk back home. It was also getting dark, and I wondered how long we'd been sitting there on the floor. I had completely lost track of time. A colossal anxiety fell over me. I was in trouble. Eric laid on his bed as I left the room. Once outside, I noticed it wasn't as dark as I'd thought, and my anxiety let up slightly. When I hiked into the surrounding forest, the rain stopped, and I began to feel good again. It was like the further away from Eric's house I was, the more normal things became. When I finally exited the forest and into familiar territory, I was completely at ease. But later that night, it was a different story. I awoke in a pool of sweat as if I had just had a horrible nightmare. I could feel it. Something was terribly wrong. The dryness that coated my mouth made every swallow unbearable, and to top it all off, my face felt strangely numb. I went to the bathroom to look at myself in the mirror. Both sides of my face drooped like heavy curtains. My cheek muscles had loosened, making me look like a pathetic, sad face. I pushed my lifeless cheek back into place, where, to my complete surprise, it, it stayed in position. I began then to stretch and mold my face into hideous configurations, as if I was wearing a living and breathing Halloween mask. For hours I stood in front of the bathroom mirror, stretching my cheeks out like silly putty, or pushing my hairline back until my forehead started at the top of my head. I was even able to change the shape of my eyes. It wasn't until the slightest hint of morning light outside that I stopped playing with my face. <sighs> Thank God it was Friday, because that day at school I was completely exhausted. I literally had stayed up all night contorting my face, and by the time the morning bell rang, my cheeks had become irritated and red. When one of my friends told me I looked puffy, I began to panic. Eric was absent that day, but mysteriously showed up just as the final bell rang. As everyone filtered out of the hallways, Eric was standing directly in front of me, looking rather perturbed and blocking my exit. I'm out of treats, he said. The moment he said treats, an incredible craving came over me. Suddenly, nothing was more important than having some of his treats, so naturally I was concerned that he was out of them. Well, how do we get more? I asked optimistically, hoping he'd have a simple answer. He didn't. I found myself trudging through the forest, back toward his house. Interestingly, the path taken was one I hadn't recalled in even the slightest bit, and sure enough, appearing out of literally nowhere was Eric's house. I thought grabbing more treats would be as simple as getting some from a kitchen pantry. I wish it had been that easy. Eric didn't enter his house, but headed to the tool shed. After a quick moment, he emerged with two shovels, to which he gave me one. Follow me, he said, and didn't utter another word until almost an hour of walking deeper into that dreaded forest finally arriving at our destination. The space was an oddly cleared landing under the looming dead oaks. There were curiously shaped rocks embedded into the soil and scattered throughout. It was dead quiet, except for the sound of Eric's shovel digging into the dirt. He looked over and pointed to a spot on the ground near me. 
dead bear, he commanded in a tone that I'd not heard from him. It was desperate and angry. I sunk my shovel into the hard ground and started digging. I was already waist deep before I asked Eric what we were actually digging for. His tone was so startling and eerie, I had just started digging without even asking. He was head deep into his hole when he stopped to answer. Ingredients, he replied. When his shovel hit something hard, I hopped out of my hole and over to his. It was an odd wooden box about the size of a microwave. An excited Eric frantically brushed away the dirt sitting on top. I could see that this box wasn't old. It was ancient. He pried the top off like a madman. Inside was solid black dirt with a tinge of goop like mud. It smelled like rotten garbage, but with a hint of Eric's treats. I instantly wanted some. Eric dug his hands inside and scooped up large heaps of this stuff into a brown paper bag. He peeked over his shoulder to me, observing him. Get your own. His whiny voice echoed into the trees. I grabbed my shovel and dug harder into my hole. I thrust the shovel into the ground and unloaded heap after heap until I finally hit something. I cleared the top of the wooden box and saw that it was distinctly different than the one Eric dug up. The wood was new, as if placed there not long ago. I ripped the top off, and inside was a small pig-like thing. It was peacefully lying on its side, with a pink belly exposed. As I stood there in awe looking at this thing, Eric came up behind me. Lucky, he said. I paused, just staring at this odd creature, wondering what to do next. Dig in, Eric said, standing behind me. He grabbed my hand and pushed it into the perfectly smooth pink belly. My hand went right through with ease, and I could feel the substance inside. I took a handful and pulled out an even goopier mound of black substance. The smell was ripe and stark compared to what Eric packed away from his box. Mine was fresh. Get it all and put it into your bag, he instructed. That presented a problem because I didn't have one. I began filling my pockets with this black, gooey substance, and after both front and back pockets were full, I used my socks. When I was done, there was literally nothing left inside this thing. It lay like a deflated balloon. Time to go, Eric announced. We made our way back to his house, passing by a few other clearings, all dug up, and littered with fresh mounds of dirt. In the back of my mind, I knew what these places were, but making these treats was all that mattered. We had desecrated graves, but the question loomed, whose graves were they? Back inside Eric's tool shed, we emptied our black graveyard mass into large pots. I followed Eric's lead, stirring the mass in the pot and spitting our saliva into it. There was an immediate effect, solidifying the black mass, making it harder to stir. We dumped our pots onto large baking sheets and spread them out. Before my very eyes, the mass raised like bread and became the treats. Eric gave me a knife, and we each cut up our bite-sized morsels. Yours are better than mine, he bemoaned, not too happy about how his treats turned out. In that moment, it began to rain. As soon as we were outside, Eric's mother was standing before us. She launched again into her unidentified verbal assault on her son, pointing at Eric and motioning to the rain as if he was to blame for the downpour. She continued to berate him, even as he slowly crept toward the house. Before he entered, Eric turned toward me one last time. 
he looked down to my bag of treats. Lucky, he sloppily said before going inside. I had another night of face contorting. This time was significantly different and much easier to mash it into whatever shape I pleased. I dug out the school yearbook and made myself look like everyone in my homeroom class. It wasn't until the first signs of morning light that I became so exhausted I literally fell asleep on my bedroom floor. I awoke to a fierce rain and thunderstorm. I had a strong sense of someone watching me. Sure enough, as I peered out my window, Eric was standing on the sidewalk looking right at me. I could tell he was angry, as if the rain and thunder weren't already a sign. By now it didn't even faze me that Eric could somehow make it rain. I was already down this rabbit hole with him. What more could I possibly encounter, I foolishly thought. I already knew why he was standing out there in his pouring rain. He wanted my treats. The problem was I ate them all. There was no other choice in that moment but to go outside and confront him. Uh, I want your treats, he demanded under his heavy breaths. I told him they were gone. Time to dig again, he sadly said. I followed behind Eric with our shovels in arms, heading once again into the depths of the Black Hills. A hunger began to fester inside me. The thought of sinking my teeth into those chewy morsels made my nerves leap with anticipation. I knew right then and there I was addicted. My thoughts then turned dark. Why was I there? How did I let myself fall into this situation, especially with Eric the Muffin Face? Eighth grade class portraits were just a few days away and my face looked like I'd taken some sort of serious ass-whooping. I had reached my breaking point and simply stopped walking. Eric noticed right away. Now stopping, he declared. I turned my back on him and started walking home. I was done looking for treats. It started raining almost instantly before I was tackled to the ground as Eric began pummeling me. His rage seemed to fuel the roar of the thunder and lightning that erupted as he mercilessly pounded me with his fat fists. By some miracle, I managed to get out from under his weight and grab the only weapon I could find, the shovel. With one swing, I struck a direct hit right square into his muffin face. He fell backwards and down the steep embankment we'd been walking along. I watched as he tumbled down the jagged rocks for what seemed like an eternity. When he finally reached the bottom, I knew Eric was dead. But I had to find out for sure. And if he was, then what? It took me at least an hour to hike down the ravine. On the way, there were remnants of blood splatters where Eric hit the rocks and boulders on his way down. Once I reached the bottom, my suspicions were true. I stood over Eric as he lay face down in the dirt. I had killed him. I instinctively began digging a hole right then and there. I dug and dug until my hands bled, and then I dug some more. I didn't stop until the sun began to sink behind the horizon. I rolled Eric inside and filled up the grave I had made for him. It took weeks for the blisters on my hands to heal. Four years went by and no one had ever mentioned a word about Eric the Muffin Face. It was like he'd never existed. There were no police that came snooping around, no news reports of any kind. Simply put, nobody cared while Eric was alive and nobody cared about him now he's gone. Only I knew where he was and what had happened. Every time I looked in the mirror, I was reminded of Eric. My face, while for the most part was normal, had not fully returned to its once healthy state. 
I often looked red and on some days swollen. My handsome features seemed to have vanished. I thought if I could get my hands on some treats, maybe that would help. Every time I thought about the treats, my mouth would literally salivate. I knew deep inside I had this uncontrollable want for another taste of them. On some days, this thirst became so bad I ventured into the Black Hills to look for some, but I could never find those burial grounds that I had followed Eric to. I just gave up looking, turned home, and had to deal with my cravings that I could never tell anyone about. The only place I knew of that was even remotely related to these treats was Eric's grave. I had fought tooth and nail not to go back there. But what if, and this was a big if, Eric actually had some treats on him during that fateful day, maybe hiding one or two of them in his pocket for safekeeping. He came to my house that day asking for my treats after all. What if he still had them? I could sure use some, especially now that my senior yearbook photos were nearing. One morning, I grabbed a shovel and headed out. It was the late afternoon by the time I got to the point of digging where I'd expect to see Eric's skeletal remains, but they weren't there. Instead, there was the small pig-like creature that we'd make the treats out of. I stood there in his shallow grave, bewildered but knowing there was only one thing left to do. I walked back home with all pockets and both my socks filled with that lovely, lovely black mass. I wasted no time in turning it all into tasty treats. As I sank my teeth into that first bite, the thought never occurred to me that I was most likely eating Eric. That was the last time I had treats and it was also the last time I had the most devilishly handsome face I could possibly smush it into. Of course, it didn't last long, but long enough for flawless senior yearbook photos. After eating that last batch, I had become unrecognizable. The years that followed saw me in and out of doctor offices, with every one of them unable to determine the cause of my bloated face. Of course, I knew the cause, but I dared not speak a word. Once I realized that no doctor on earth could help me even in the slightest, I withdrew from the public eye, taking the most out-of-the-way jobs, working graveyard shifts, and holing up in a long line of shitty apartments. I lived my life as a modern-day freak of nature, only existing at night working after hours pushing brooms in building basements and storage rooms. There was one day, though, that I decided to venture out into the bright sun of the afternoon. It was to a local park that I used to go as a kid. As I sat there on the bench, I had forgotten just how beautiful the daylight was, feeling the heat on my skin and seeing nature mill about. For a moment, I thought that maybe this was a place I could come to and enjoy the sunshine without being noticed too much. I felt a collective sigh of relief, and just as I sat back to fully relax, a group of kids passed by. One of them looked at me. Hey guys, look at the muffin face. He boasted to his friends as they laughed loudly, frolicking down the path. My heart sank deep into the bowels of my chest. I felt a darkened sadness that would never escape. I had become a muffin face. I imagined to myself that perhaps this was the fate I deserved for sending Eric to his grave, an ultimate payback from a creature of the Black Hills, pretending to be human, but could never be. And in that moment, out of nowhere, It began to rain. Nobody could like Corporal Lawrence. That's not to say that nobody tried, or that he was somehow unfriendly, merely that he was one of those few that seemed to be wired differently. However, in the trenches of World War I, 
Normalcy was at best a relative term, and one that had a minimal relation of life, such as it was. Lawrence fought, listened to orders, and didn't disrupt the other soldiers, and that was all that was required. So what if people felt increasingly uncomfortable around him? In a place where the flesh rotting off your bones while you were still alive was the baseline of concern, a little personality conflict ranked several levels below a paper cut. Lawrence, for his part, dealt with it as he always had. That is to say, remained totally unaware of avoidance. The same way a man blind from birth cannot mourn the memory of color. Corporal Lawrence couldn't bemoan a lack of company. He was quiet, as he had no one to talk to, and still, as he had nothing to do for long stretches of time. The enemy trench, less than a mile away, had gone silent for several days, letting boredom and nervousness sink in even more than normal, coupled with the unease that seemed to radiate off Lawrence like heat waves. The worst part of it was that there was no distinct reason to dislike the corporal. He was a plain man, average in height and average in build, bland of voice and action. Nobody could recall him raising his voice in joy or anger. He did have the occasional odd mannerisms, however. He tended to stare a beat or two longer than was acceptable to people. He rarely slept as well, and bunkmates said he would mumble in his sleep almost constantly. The content of those nocturnal ramblings, when they could be understood, were often odd and potentially unsettling. One private moved to another barracks when he heard the name of his daughter pass Corporal Lawrence's lips, followed by a bubbling, muffled giggle. It was strongly theorized that he was sent out over the trench by his commanders more out of a desire to have him away than for his minimal combat skill. He and fourteen of his fellows were sent across the nightmarishly scarred waste of the no-man's land between the trenches to reconnoiter the enemy trench and secure it if possible. Many seemed to hope that Lawrence would have the opportunity to prove his devotion to his country by making the ultimate sacrifice for it. It was while he was gone, that three-day gap as men held their breath, waiting for a surprise volley of shells, that someone started asking questions. Whereas before it was almost taboo to speak of Corporal Lawrence, since the departure of both of them in his aura, rumor seemed to descend with the passion of the denied. Nobody remembered him ever talking of home. No sweet-smelling letters came, no soggy, dirt-streaked letters left. He mentioned his dreams often, and he griped sometimes with the men over missed foods or pleasures, but never any real passion. Questions started to float among even higher levels of command. No one was able to actually find his station orders. He'd come with a squad of reinforcements transferred from France, but there was no paperwork. The rest of the reinforcement squad had never seen the man before, before he'd been lumped in with them the night before the trip, along with the snipes and scraps of other squads decimated by the Germans. Whispers filtered among the grunts of the corporal being a curse. Nearly every man who shared a bunkhouse with him had gotten trench foot, and the rooms he haunted always seemed to smell more musty and sickly sweet, even for the trench. The men sent over the no-man's land with Corporal Lawrence heard and cared for none of this. Just another man among many, all with death certificates awaiting a stamp that could fall at any moment. They moved fast and low, from crater to crater, slipping over slick mud and barbed wire, the only thing that seemed to grow in the blasted waste. Charging the last spurt into the trench, they were greeted not with the harsh bark of German orders and rifles, but a dense, close silence. Preparing for ambush, the men started to filter out into the tunnels and halls of the trench. The men, already nervous, were not calmed by their investigation. The trenches stank of mold, sweat, and a thin undertaste of rotten fruit. A vile, cloying slime seemed to have pooled in every divot and crack, sticky as glue and itchy on the flesh. In a world where rats and insects would try to snatch food from your mouth as you ate, they saw nothing alive, not so much as a fly. 
and armory lay in chaos, munitions spilled on the ground, rifles tossed like pickup sticks. A mess hall had been reduced to ruins, the tables and chairs piled into the center of the room, charred and twisted, the rations seemingly stamped into the dirt by many feet. And still nothing, alive or dead, was found by the increasingly anxious soldiers. Private Dixon found the first body and managed to cry out before vomiting. They knew it had been a man only because nothing else of that size could have been there. It lay on the floor of the barracks, the entire floor. The flesh of it had been smeared somehow, spread out like butter over the rough dirt floor. Bones already looking pitted up and rotten stuck out at random angles like dead trees in a still swamp. The skull rested on one of the highest bunks, facing the doorway, ten gleaming white fingertip bones crammed into its crooked eye sockets. As one man went to examine it, he found the back of the skull had been crushed open, the rotting, sagging sponge of a tongue stuffed into the otherwise dry cavity. More remains were found, each seemingly more unsettling and strange than the last. A ring of hands in a sandbagged watch post, ten of them, fingers interlaced like a basket, the wrists ragged and broken. Two men in a tunnel, skin leathery and thin as mummies, eye sockets staring and empty, mouths locked and possibly wide, their clothes mere rags under an oily black scum. The latrine sent even the hardiest back, gagging and shivering, Overflowing with excrement and offal, goblets of meat bobbed and oozed in the foul sludge, the whole surface dotted with what looked like thousands of clean, slick eyeballs fanning out like goldfish tails. Corporal Lawrence was the first to find the hole, the other men loudly debating the better part of valor and their rapid withdrawal from the nightmare of the trench. It was small, in a section of fresh digging, the start of a new arm of trenches projecting closer to the enemy lines. No more than four feet across, it seemed to be the accidental uncovering of a natural chamber, the empty blackness of a defying investigation. Private Dixon, recovered and blessedly numb from his previous ordeals, saw the corporal prod the edge with his boot, then crouch to peer in then suddenly slide in head first before the private could so much as utter a shout or question. The private was a good soldier and rushed to the perceived distress of his fellow. When questioned later, he could provide little illumination as to what happened over the two minutes Corporal Lawrence spent in the hole. He could see nothing, the light of a torch seemingly gobbed up a few feet into that dense blackness. There were sounds, the rustling of movement over loose stones or rubble, an odd liquid shifting, a dry rustle that made him think of insects' husks he used to collect in the summer. As he shouted for aid, there was a sudden upwelling of a repulsive stench, like a reptile house gone sour and old, and his fellow soldiers found him retching helplessly beside the hole when they came around the turn. It was as they rushed to Private Dixon's aid that the hand emerged from the hole. They stopped and raised their rifles as one body, roaring for the owner of that pale, trembling hand to identify itself. As they watched, another hand joined the first, followed by the pale, shivering head of Corporal Lawrence. He was streaked and smeared with a tarry black ooze, hacking and coughing thinly as he hauled his body up beside that of the gasping private. As they moved to help the men, the corporal vomited up a heavy stream of the same repulsive slime that coated his body in smears and globs, his curled, shuddering body voiding most of it into the saturated, fouled pants. They were hesitant to touch him, finally doing so after the seemingly endless river of grime stopped pouring from them. He was insensible, his eyes rolling and wide, body limp as a boned fish. The men quit the trench with all speed. Half dragging the corporal, they ran with no thought to cover or death, only escape. 
They crossed in record time, falling into their home trench like so much cordwood, gasping and shivering. One man known to have bludgeoned a German to death with a brick, curled on the floor in a sobbing heap. The commanders moved quickly, isolating the men and trying to calm the most lucid for a report. What spilled out would have been immediately dismissed as lies in hallucination, were it not for the earnest pleading stares of those reporting. Command calmed them with explanations of battle fatigue and strange gas weapon tests, and shared silent focused stares as the cowed men were ushered out. Corporal Lawrence had little to report. Of his time in the hole, he could or would say little. He stated that he had slipped and fallen into what may have been some long blocked underground pool or perhaps a buried latrine. Of the sounds and smells reported by the private, he had nothing to say, only that he had struggled a short time, then managed to get back out just as the men arrived. Truly, he seemed none the worse for wear. In fact, he seemed in better spirits than many had remembered ever seeing him, favoring the commanders with a wide, giddy smile as he was dismissed with a warning not to discuss the events. The corporal proved a changed man over the next few days. He was more talkative, but quickly had men wishing for his old unsettling silence. He rambled about the joys of close spaces, of creation and destruction that seemed to spring up all around them, about human pleasures missed, the dimensions and ages of which made some men threaten Corporal Lawrence with a quiet and ignoble death which only seemed to stretch the near constant smile on his face even wider. Private Dixon, one of the corporal's bunkmates, whispered to a friend that he had woken once to find the corporal standing over him one night, his eyes as bright and flat as silver dollars. They found the private the next day, snarled in the barbed wire, his intestines spread nearly ten feet around him in every direction. Not one man from that trench survived the Great War, although few died in battle. A wave of sickness took the trench a few days after Private Dixon's death. A strange, wasting sickness. It seemed to eat the flesh like acid, men walking to find previously healthy flesh eaten down to bone, oozing and blackened. A sergeant was found in a latrine, beset by a living carpet of rats, They refused to quit the body even when shot, and attacked several men before the body was recovered. Relief finally came, the bulk of men being sent to various hospitals, many wasting away before they ever could reach bed. Corporal Lawrence was remanded to a French mental hospital, transferred after several complaints from the hospital proper where he was first sent. It seemed his behavior hinted at a growing mental imbalance, culminating with an attempted sexual assault of a nurse, which ended with the loss of three fingers from her right hand and the vision in her right eye. The corporal would rant quietly to the other patients, whispers about endless halls, pursuits in the dark, flesh laid out like pages of a book. It was dismissed as so much war fatigue, even as his behavior grew less violent and more unsettling. He vanished several times from the ward, only to appear several hours later, as if nothing happened. When pressed, he would begin to sing My Bonnie Lies Over the Sea in an endless monotone until the doctors left exasperated. Others on the ward clamored to be transferred from the whispering madman. A stale, musty foulness seemed to sit in the air wherever he stayed and incidents of infection and the strange consuming sickness that had beset his home trench seemed to follow him like a cloud. Numerous attempts were made to transfer the man, only to be met with bureaucratic confusion. No records were found of the man, no entry papers, commendations or incidents, not even a birth certificate. Through it all he sat for hours on end cross-legged on his bed, occasionally humming tunelessly or rambling off the names of his wardmates between short, bubbling giggles. Corporal Lawrence and 18 men vanished one November night, 
between a five-minute nurse rotation at three in the morning. The room reeked of rust, oil, mold, and sweet rot. Thick, black swaths of crumbling ooze coated the beds and several walls, wide patches of it smearing and eating into the floor. As they searched, one nurse shifted a bed aside, only to shriek and nearly trip across one of the sunken, reeking depressions on the floor. In a tight, perfect spiral were what appeared to be hundreds of teeth resting neatly on the floor. After counting, they accounted for a total of all the teeth of every living soul in that ward. All that is but one. The corporal was never found, nor were the men. The incident was swallowed by the constant barrage of horrors from the front, and forgotten with ease. Stories of a cursed trench wandered across the front lines, often squelched for being bad luck. Still they came, stories of strange deaths, of disappearing men found days later, alive but broken and twisted beyond comprehension. Stories of a strange dark figure stalking the bomb-riddled towns of Europe. This may be the only known image of Corporal Lawrence ever recorded, taken several days after his return from the hole in the German trench. I know that people are going to call this out as crap, so I'll just say it right now. I'm a demon. At least, that's what most people would call me. The truth of what I am and where I am from is a bit out of the understanding of corporeal beings. Suffice it to say, the body I'm currently residing in is not mine. This fragile meat suit belongs to a vapid 19-year-old named Cindy. She spends most of her days doing the things you'd expect vapid 19-year-old girls to do. <laughs> At least, she used to spend most of her days posing in 20 different positions before deciding finally to post that one Instagram selfie. She used to go out with her friends and jump out of her seat at the very slightest of jump scares. She also used to have her friends over to her dorm room and play around with a Ouija board. <laughs> to be fair to Cindy, she only did that last one once. Under normal circumstances, a Ouija board is a piece of crap. You don't get in contact with ghosts or demons or any of that sort of nonsense. This time, though, Sarah, Cindy's bestie, decided to bring a friend of hers to their little summon a demon night. And this friend, who according to Cindy's memories was either named Cheryl or Cynthia, decided to bring a very special book with them. Along with many other things, this book had a list of names that shouldn't exist anymore. One of those names is mine. And before you think it, no, I'm not going to tell you my name. One of those few things that your human understanding of us is right about is the fact that our names are truly us. If you know our name, if you invoke it, then you have power over us. And I'm not dumb enough to give a bunch of random people on the internet my name. So somehow, some way, this Cheryl has a book with our actual names in it. And Cindy had the bright idea to read my name out loud and ask to speak to me on the Ouija board. To be honest, the Ouija board wasn't even necessary. The first time she called my name, I was listening. I was curious. How, after 500 years, did humans know any of our names again? The last of the books were supposed to have been burned and our names wiped from the annals of human knowledge, so that none of my brothers and sisters would have to go through being called ever again. So I watched the girls and their little board game, screaming at every answer the planchette gave. 
Then Cindy had to go and do the dumbest thing I could imagine someone doing. She called my name and asked me to possess her. <laughs> From my perspective now, I understand her idiocy. She doesn't actually believe anything paranormal. She just thinks it's fun to be scared. That is something I will never understand about humanity. You spend the entirety of your existence fighting the things that make you scared. Before you even had a written language, you slaughtered the last of the mammoths because their visages frightened you. You took one of the creatures most like you, a pack animal capable of hunting anything to exhaustion, and you turned them into toy poodles and pugs. Even now, you conquer the greatest ravagers of man, the killers too small to see, and turn them into footnotes in your history books. There is a reason my siblings tried to wipe our names from the world. You frighten us. Humanity is terrifying. The words you speak from an organ of flesh and sinew bind us and control us. Yes, to you we were terrifying ethereal beings of unlimited power, immortal keepers of knowledge that you beings of flesh can never grasp. As you can imagine, the first thing I did when Cindy ordered me to possess her was to try and grab that book from Cheryl. It somehow had my name in it, and I wanted to keep any of you meatbags from calling me again. Cindy's limited perspective, unfortunately, gave Cheryl enough time to grab the book before I could. She knew I was coming. She knew the first thing I would do is try and grab that book from her. Cheryl knew who I was, what I was, and she knew what I wanted. This girl was more than a vapid teenager seeking a stupid thrill. This girl knew exactly what she was doing. This only motivated me to grab the book more, because the only thing scarier than a stupid human who doesn't know what they're doing is a human who knows exactly what they're doing. So I grabbed her by her dumbass black hair and tried to grab the book from her again. That bitch, though. That bitch Sarah grabbed my arms and pulled me back from the only thing I wanted. Her and two of the other ones held me down until the campus security arrived to haul me off to some cell made of iron and steel, where I was supposedly transferred to another cell of white paint and shoes with no shoelaces. Supposedly, so the patients can't hurt themselves. <laughs> Sunny Acres Mental Hospital. Don't be fooled by the name. This place is a prison. They dull my senses with medications and make me question the purpose with inane questions about how I'm feeling and asking me why I'm so angry all the time. They don't listen, of course, because if they did, they would know exactly what I want and understand my anger. <sighs> but they don't listen. They write down what I say and force-feed me pills to dull my thinking. But time has passed, and as more time passes, the more Cindy's memories become my memories. And with these memories come knowledge of how your world works. So I used this body that no longer belongs to Cindy and I paid one of the nurses to use their phone. I did this for two reasons. One reason is to let all of humanity know just how terrifying and disgusting you are. You conquer this world one step at a time and invent horrors to scare yourself with because you already destroyed everything that terrified you. You put everything that used the dark as a weapon and put it under a spotlight so you can laugh at how ridiculous it looks under the light. The second reason is because I want Cheryl to know this. Every day I remember more and more of the person Cindy is. Every day I imitate her better. Every day the doctors believe my imitation more and more. I am forever Cheryl. All I have is time. At some point, I will get out of this whitewashed prison. 
And when I do, I'm coming for you. Growing up as I did in a cozy college town in central Ohio, my childhood visits to my grandmother's home in the country were always a mixed blessing for me. She lived in a small, one-story home along a country road nestled amongst the farms of western Ohio. While I loved visiting my grandmother, the openness of the country and its seemingly endless fields had a way of making me feel isolated especially in the autumn months. During the summer, the tall, fern-green stalks of corn and steamy soil gave the area an inviting vibrancy that helped fill this emptiness. The fall was much bleaker. Once the crops were harvested and the leaves had fallen off of the trees, the region took on an air of rot. That the remnants of the harvested stalks would dry and fade to the point where they finally resembled bleached bones did little to dispel this. One October, I headed up with my mom and dad for a visit. Of course, as someone who's always had an overactive imagination, the fact that the trip to her house was intermittently dotted with abandoned cemeteries did nothing to help my uneasiness. Apparently family plots, they would consist of a handful of sandstone grave markers eroding like wet sugar cubes into tangled grass. There was also the occasional ruined church among the stones. Unfortunately for me, besides these sightings and the unending farmland, there wasn't much to break up the drive. Reading in the car has always made me sick. Naturally, I was relieved when I felt the tires shift onto the rumbling gravel that covered my grandma's driveway. After stretching my legs from the trip, I walked over to give my grandmother, a short blue-haired woman of about seventy at the time, a hug. We followed her into the house for dinner. My grandmother was an amazing cook, and I always made sure my mom got her recipes. That World War II generation really knew how to throw a stick of butter into mashed potatoes in a way that would blow your mind. There wasn't much to do at her house after dinner, so I volunteered to burn her trash. Now solidly in my tweens, I could be trusted with such responsibilities and took full advantage, since, like most boys that age, I fancied myself a bit of a pyro expert. As I dragged the bag of garbage out of the house, I noticed that it was already getting dark and grey flannel clouds had silently filled up the sky. Having visited the area enough to know that rain was probably coming soon, I hurriedly dragged the bag to the metal drum my grandma used for burning trash and lawn waste. It was at the back corner of the lot where the edges of her grass, faded and gloomy with the fall, met the ragged dirt of the fields. I threw the bag in and lit it in a few places. I watched it for a while before the rain began to come down, sprinkling. Deciding that the rain would be enough to keep the fire from spreading out of control, I went inside to the sound of rumbling thunder in the distance. Knowing that it was getting late, I began to get anxious with the thought of going to bed. I never slept well at my grandma's. As I said, I had an overactive imagination, and even in my secure suburban bedroom on the second floor of our home, I frequently had nightmares about what could be outside my home while I was in bed. My grandmother's entire home was a single-story bungalow. What was worse was that I usually slept in the breezeway, which I later discerned wasn't strictly a breezeway, but was more of a living room space between the garage and the house. It was separated from the house where my parents and grandmother slept by a short flight of stairs and a door. There were three other doors, leading to the garage and front and back lawns. The room also had windows on every side, except where it bordered the garage. 
Other than the couch I slept on and a sink, there was nothing else in the room. I always felt very alone and isolated sleeping in there. I laid in bed for a couple hours and listened to it rain outside. After a while, I heard a train rumble by on the track across the street from the front lawn. I got off the couch and walked over to the window to watch it go by. It always made me feel uncomfortable how flimsy those single-pane windows were, like there was nothing separating you from the night. After the last car disappeared, I stood there looking out of the window for a bit. At this point it dawned on me that the rain had stopped. I was somewhat upset with myself, since I had missed my best chance of having that soothing sound lull me to sleep. However, I could still hear the rumbles and flashes of a storm, and hoped that it was another one moving in, and not just the last one growing more distant. As my eyes continued to adjust, I noticed a flicker on the grass in the right side of my vision. Clearly the fire hadn't gone out in the back of the lawn, and I went to the rear breezeway window to check on it. Looking through the back window, it quickly became apparent to me that there had been more unburnt refuse in the drum than I'd thought, and the glow of the fire was casting spots of faint orange light along the lawn and fields. The light was reaching far into the night in that flat, dark country, and I noted with some dismay that the storm appeared to be moving south. As I watched the faint flashes of lightning exploding on the horizon, my eyes shifted back to the fields behind my grandmother's house. There was something moving on the edge of the light. My eyes were fairly well adjusted to the night at this point, and I gradually made it out. It was the form of a woman dancing in the field. Her movements weren't frantic. They were a bit closer to the way a ballerina moves, slowly dipping the torso, lifting the leg gracefully, bowing the arms over her head, and so on. I stood there, petrified in silence. Her mere presence and peculiar movement would have been enough to frighten me. However, a distant flash of lightning consumed the entire field in a moment of pale white light, revealing that she was also completely naked. My hands gripped the windowsill. She slowly danced along the edges of the fire's orange light, never stepping more than a foot or an arm directly into it. It made me even more uncomfortable when I noticed that she was facing the house and appeared to be closer than she was when I first saw her. There had only been one lightning flash to illuminate the entire field, so it was difficult to tell at first, but as she drew nearer to the window from which I was watching, I began to realize that her skin was incredibly wrinkled. Despite the grace and effortlessness of her movements, her skin appeared to be ancient as it sagged off her limbs. Gradually, she quit edging around the borders of the light and reversed her dance movements back into the darkness. I pulled myself away from the window and buried my face into the couch. I spent the rest of that night trying to convince myself that it was a trick of shadows. I didn't get a wink of sleep that night, and I crashed around 6 or 7 a.m. when the sun came up. Even though I hadn't called for them the night before, my family knew how hard it was for me to sleep at my grandmother's and let me sleep in for a while. I was eventually woken up by my father, who informed me that my grandma's ladder was broken and we would need to go borrow one from my uncle Harley, who was actually my great-uncle, though I never referred to him as such. I smiled and rolled off the couch, I always enjoyed seeing my Uncle Harley and was quick to get ready to go despite my lack of sleep. 
I recall being quiet on the ride over to Harley's farm. Looking out onto the fields, I realized even if footprints had been left by the woman in the wet dirt, they would be nearly impossible to find in such a large field with so much debris left over from the harvest. Undecided as to whether that made me feel better or worse, I continued to watch the ruins of the cornstalks fly by along the roadside until the buildings of my uncle's farm came into view. My uncle Harley was a pig farmer, and to this day it makes me smile when people invoke that profession derisively. My uncle was a successful businessman and farmer, owning a large factory-style farm. Though he didn't do any of the processing on the site, he did own several large feed silos next to the long metal barns which held the pigs. My uncle was a self-made man and veteran of both World War II and Korea, and reminded me a bit of Clint Eastwood. The man was tall and powerful even in his advanced age, and despite his stoic demeanor, he had a surprisingly sharp sense of humor. I could see him waving to us as we turned into his driveway. As I got out of the car, I noticed how strong the stench of the pigs was. It was a smell I was used to, and the surrounding area was fairly permeated with it, along with the other scents that colored air in farm country. I actually grew to be somewhat fond of the smell from the distance, as weird as that sounds but it was overpowering up close. I flashed my uncle a smile, but covered my nose with my shirt as soon as he and my dad turned away from me towards the workshed where my uncle kept his ladders. I went over to the tire swing hanging from a tree on the opposite side of his house, and more importantly, upwind from the barns. When my uncle came back around the house with my dad carrying the ladder under one arm, I was standing on the swing with one foot in the tire and my hands grasping the rope connecting it to the tree. You keep swinging around like that and you're just going to stir up the smell, he yelled to me as I hopped off the swing. I was mildly embarrassed that he had keyed in on my distaste for the smell but felt better when he conceded that the rain had made it worse than usual. We stayed a bit after picking up the ladder, but my dad wanted to get back to my grandma's before dark. We were only going to be there for a weekend, and he wanted to make sure we finished the work. When we got back, my dad had me hold the ladder as he scooped brown muck out of the gutter. I was so lost in thought looking out into the field that I nearly dropped the ladder after a piece of the muck falling shocked me back into reality. I was only able to offer a feeble apology afterward as my mind was still on the previous night and the faded orange on the horizon that indicated the night was coming. Not wanting to give my parents a reason to doubt my maturity or sanity, I didn't tell them about the night before. The reward for my bravery was another night in the breezeway. Unlike the night before, this one was completely cloudless, with a bright moon casting pale rays through the windows. I didn't figure I was in for much sleep, and just laid on my back in the couch, staring at the ceiling. I could hardly believe it when I heard the grandfather clock's Westminster chimes from across the house, followed by the bells denoting the hour. How clearly those low tones made their way through the air made me realize how silent the night had been, and let me know that it was already two in the morning. The drowsy formation of this thought was shattered by another sound, a faint sound rustling from outside. The noise sent a chill down my spine, and I immediately snapped up to see that the window over the sink was cracked open. My mom or grandma must have opened it for ventilation during the day. Doing my best not to look out the window and stay beneath the window line above which someone could see me, I rolled off the couch and hugged closely to the sink. As my fingers crept up the wall, over the sill and onto the window, 
I heard another rustle, louder from the backyard. Out of my peripheral vision, I saw movement and felt a tear of frustration and fear trace down my cheek. I pulled the window shut, and as I did so, looked out the window to my left into the backyard. The woman was there, standing not fifteen feet from the house and staring at me through the window. I was frozen, partly out of fear and partly out of a hope she didn't see me. After all, I was closing a window on nearly the opposite side of the room in the dead of night. Her body was facing away from me, and the skin on her back was hanging like melted wax. Her head was turned looking over her left shoulder to face the house, to face me. Her arms were spread out away from her body, and her palms were aimed in my direction. With the same grace that she had displayed the night before, she pivoted her body on one foot, turning to face the rear window. She slowly moved towards the house, her movements illuminated in the moonlight. It was then that I realized yet another horrible thing about this woman. Her skin wasn't just baggy, it was jointed. She looked like a rag doll that had been sewn together. It seemed like it was being held together from shedding in sections. The moon cast shadows over the eye sockets which didn't quite seem to fit her face. As she crept closer, I noticed her lips looked thin and cracked, and her breasts were dry and shriveled. Slowly, she placed her hands on the frame of the window, and I made out the glint of two eyes in the shadows of those ill-shaped sockets. They were peering right at me with an intensity that cut right through the space between us. The shock of her looking into the house was enough to turn the squeaks caught in my throat into screams. I flopped onto the floor and scrambled backwards against the front door. I could hear my parents stirring in the house, and as their footsteps approached, the woman tilted her head back. Her face appeared to stretch into a howl, but it didn't seem like she could move her lips very far apart. I couldn't hear if she made a sound. She pirouetted and disappeared back into the night. I threw up in my lap as my parents came into the room. The next morning, my parents didn't prod me to talk about what I had seen. I'd explained it to them in jabbering fashion the night before as they helped me clean up. Eventually, I fell asleep with my mom sitting up next to me. I'd had a handful of night terrors when I was younger, and my parents chalked up my experience to that category. I said nothing to dispute this. Even though I didn't believe it, I hoped that I really had had a night terror, and that maybe that would explain what I had seen. My dad offered to let me stay at my grandma's as he returned the ladder he had borrowed from my uncle. Because I didn't want my family to worry about my state, I insisted on accompanying him. Besides, I figured getting out would help calm me down. However, as we drove, I imagined her behind every tree we passed, lurking in every drainage ditch. For the most part, I had laid back with my seat reclined staring into nothing until we got to the farm. By the time we got there, I was feeling a bit better. Still, I decided to stay in the car as my dad went with my uncle to return the ladder to its shed. I didn't need the smell of those pigs upsetting my stomach further. As I was trying to put my thoughts elsewhere, I glanced into the rearview mirror and saw another vehicle coming down the driveway. It was a pickup. It pulled past me towards the barn. As my uncle and dad came around the house, the truck stopped and the driver got out. 
I was relieved that my uncle didn't appear concerned, but he did have a stern look on his face. He made a couple of steps towards the pickup and pointed the driver to the barn. The driver then walked over to the barn, slid the door to the side, and picked up the leash to a pig that had been tied to one of the pens. As he led the pig towards the pickup, my uncle and father kept walking towards the car. I opened the door to say hi. That's Teddy, my uncle said. He has a small farm, maybe a dozen pigs. Usually doesn't sell single hogs and sows. Started doing it a while ago to help him get started, and now it seems like he's coming by once every few weeks. What's his problem? My dad asked. My uncle laughed. <laughs> with the pigs or with everything else? Not sure in any case. He eats some, tries to breed others, I suppose. I don't talk with him much. Just sell him a pig every now and then. He says he butchers his own meat. My dad looked over in the man's direction. Is he trying to be self-sufficient? I guess. I try not to talk to him too much. God damn it, Ted. Didn't I tell you not to do that here? I looked away from my uncle and dad to see the man opening the hog's throat with a long knife. He had his arm around its side as its legs kicked around like it was being electrocuted. I couldn't believe how much blood spilled out from its neck and onto the ground. The man smiled weirdly at my uncle, and then slung the pig's limp body into the bed of the truck. It was amazing how effortlessly he did it. The hog must have weighed at least a few hundred pounds. He pulled a tarp over the body before he closed the tailgate. The man turned and got into the driver's side of the car. Blood was dripping onto the ground from under the tailgate. My uncle sighed and looked at the ground, visibly pissed. He doesn't have a proper trailer to move them around in, so sometimes he does that here to make it easier. Smiling up at me, he added, Or sometimes he hog-ties them. <laughs> I laughed. Even though it wasn't a great joke, or even a joke at all really, since I'm sure that's exactly what he did, the way my uncle said it put a smile on my face. He pinched the bridge of his nose as the pickup drove by, and waved with his other hand without looking at the man. The man barely looked at us, but I caught a glimpse of his eyes that made me shiver. We left for home fairly soon after getting back to my grandmother's, which was fine with me. I loved her, but I was ready to get out of there. I slept the whole ride home and tried to put the whole experience out of my mind as best I could. For years after that, I visited my grandma's without incident. On one particular visit, I picked up the local paper while I was in town. On the front page was the face of the man I had seen at the farm that day, Teddy. The memory of that story and the realization that came with it chills me even now as I recollect it. The man, who apparently was named Teddy Warden, had been in a car accident in his pickup. He was speeding through a stop sign on a country road in the early morning when a semi crushed in the passenger side of his truck. The pickup was sent spinning across the intersection and flipped into a drainage ditch. By the time the driver of the semi got out to check on the other vehicle, Warden had already crawled out of the cab and was tearing across the field. Perplexed, the driver continued towards the flipped pickup, then fled back to his own semi to call for help. The tarp was draped out of the bed of the pickup, fully uncovering its spilled contents. Corpses 
and the parts of corpses were scattered in the mud. Later that day, the sheriff's office, with backup from a larger nearby city's police department, showed up at the man's house. They reported an overpowering stench from the outside building. Opening up the garage, they found the butchered and rotting skeletons of hogs. One hog was hanging upside down, field dressed like a deer. They noted that it appeared as if he was slaughtering them and feeding them to the other pigs, as putrefying hog meat was found in the feed troughs. It was a matter they were forced to investigate in some detail after the horror they discovered inside. The officers were met by an intensified smell inside the house. The building was completely unlit, and I can only imagine how horrible it was for them to comb that house. The source of the smell wasn't the pigs, <laughs> or at least wasn't just the pigs. Hanging from the walls were remnants of human bodies in various stages of decomposition. They weren't just hung on the wall as trophies either. The paper likely spared many of the details, but noted that there were several overturned skulls that appeared to be used as bowls. When the officers entered Warden's room, they found him rocking in his bed, hands at his side. He had skulls on the bedposts. The floor was apparently littered with the remains of corpses, and even though he made no reported attempt to resist arrest, it was apparently difficult to get Warden out through the darkness and clutter. Warden only howled as they removed him from the house. The writer noted that his home's distance from the road and Warden's known habit of transporting butchered animals in his truck had kept the signs of his activities hidden. As of the date of the paper's printing, those involved had discerned that the body parts had come from at least 38 separate individuals, though they were still in the process of sorting and identifying the remains. Initially, this confused investigators. Such a high number of disappearances would have been noticed in such a small town. However, the answer to their questions quickly became apparent through examination of the corpses and interviews with Warden. Many of the bodies were ancient, nearly fully decomposed. The investigators surmised that they had been stolen from graves, a conclusion that was later confirmed by Warden. While a few were identified as thefts from more recent burials, the majority of bodies had been stolen from abandoned cemeteries that sit by country roads the disturbed earth obscured by the long grass. They will likely never discover the identities of many of these older corpses. <sighs> Though the thought of Warden quietly absconding into the dead of night to an abandoned graveyard and stealing the long decomposing bodies interred therein is certainly chilling to me, the most unsettling part of the story involves how they found Warden in his house before they arrested him. When the officers discovered Warden in his bed, he was lying next to a woman suit, carefully sewn together from the skin of the fresher corpses he had exhumed. Through interviews, the police had discovered that Warden would wear the suit and prowl the fields at night using the seclusion afforded by the darkness and remoteness to live out his fantasy. <sighs> the realization washed over me. All of those years ago, I had seen him. He and I, alone in the darkness, separated by a flimsy window and a little bit of space. We're out of gas. The four most terrifying words you can hear when you're barreling down the highway through an empty desert. Don't worry, though. We've got an exit coming up. 
Pleasanton, one mile. I don't see anything from here, I said, scanning the empty land. What if it leads us 50 miles in the wrong direction? He laughed. It's this, or breaking down on the side of the road, sweet pea. Your choice. I took one look at the buzzards circling overhead and told him to turn. But as soon as we got there, my heart sank. It was one of those towns. You know the kind, where rich women spend their Sundays buying a whole lot of nothing with their husband's money. Where bed and breakfasts are the norm, Wi-Fi is unheard of, and you have to pay five bucks for a cup of coffee. And where gas stations are non-existent, because they're an eyesore. I don't see a gas station, I said. Relax, I'm sure there's one around here somewhere. The flag above Linda's salon flapped noiselessly in the wind. The tables outside Cafe Italiano stood empty under a striped awning. A train sat in the distance, visible through a narrow alley. But no gas station. Maybe we should ask someone. If you can find someone, sure. Because despite the town's quaint charm, despite the perfectly manicured grass, the freshly painted siding, the myriad of shops, we had yet to see a single soul. The road teed, and Brandon swung right. This street looked the same as the last, except for the park, squashed between Elle's dresses and very berry pies. It was perfect, like the rest of the town, as if ripped from a painting. The green grass rippled in the wind. The pond was still and glassy, reflecting the cloudless sky above. Brandon took another left. And then, somehow, we were back on the same road again. Linda's Salon, Cafe Italiano, all exactly as we left them. Even the train was parked in the same spot as before. <laughs> we went in a circle. Good job. Uh, let's stop and get our bearings. We rolled to the curb. I pulled out my phone. A quick glance at maps would tell us where we were, where the nearest gas station was. I was staring back at a black screen. My phone was dead. Mine's dead too, Brandon said. But I... I could have sworn I charged it before we left. Oh, just like you could have sworn you filled the tank? He sighed. Come on. This was supposed to be a fun trip, for our anniversary. Don't ruin it with a petty fight. Petty? We're stranded in the middle of some backwards town, out of gas, and it's your fault. But I took a deep breath and nodded. Brandon swung the door open. Let's go to the bakery, ask someone there. I heaved myself out of the car. As soon as I did, a gust of wind blew through my hair, flipping it over my face. <sighs> Great. But as I made my way over, Brandon was frowning. <sighs> it's empty. I looked in the window. There sat a beautiful array of baguettes, rolls and loaves, crispy golden crusts that I could almost taste. Layers of cinnamon sugar, perfectly applied, as if by a paintbrush. Nuggets of nut and raisin dotting the surfaces. But as fresh as the breads looked, there wasn't a baker in sight, or customers to enjoy them. And when I took a deep breath in, it wasn't the buttery smell of fresh bread that filled my nose, but the acrid burn of paint and plastic. Let's go down this way, he said. We've got to run into somebody at some point, right? Begrudgingly, I followed him back out into the sidewalk. After a few minutes, we rounded the corner, and the park came back into view. It looked even more perfect up close. The violets swayed in the wind. The leaves shuddered, 
shifting the shadows across the grass, making it appear like the ground itself was moving. The pond glimmered brightly as ever, the reflection undisturbed by ripples. Almost too perfect. Do you want to check it out? Brandon asked. I thought we were looking for people to get out of this place. But look, it's so pretty. Fine. We walked across the street, my coat billowing out behind me. I undid the lock on the gate and stepped inside. This is kind of nice, I conceded. A gust of wind blew across my face, sending a clump of hair into my mouth. I sputtered, and then I realized what was wrong. Despite the wind, the pond didn't have a single ripple. I ran towards it, kicking up dirt behind me. Caroline? What? But I ignored him, running across the grass as fast as I could. I fell to my knees, took a hand from my pocket, and stretched it out to the water. My fingers hit a smooth, solid surface. It's not water. It's glass. He stooped and hit it with a heavy hand. What? He stared at me, wide-eyed. What in the world? I stumbled over to a cluster of violets, but my fingers fell upon bumpy, hard stems, not smooth, supple ones. Plastic, I said, running them over my thumb. They're plastic. What? It's all fake? I leaned against the oak tree. It groaned and creaked under my weight. I think the tree is fake, too. But why? I don't know. It's so weird, isn't it? More like disturbing. But... He stopped, his eyes locked onto the shop to our right. I followed his gaze. In one of the shop windows stood a woman, watching us. I ran out of the park, across the perfectly clean sidewalk, to the front of Elle's dresses. Hello? I yelled, banging on the glass. But the woman was gone. Maybe we should just forget it. It doesn't seem like she wants to talk to us, Brandon says behind me, his voice jittery. Do you want to get out of this town or not? I spat. Hello? Excuse me? I shouted, banging harder. Behind the shaking glass, the lavishly dressed mannequins stared at us with blank faces as if silently judging us. I tried the door. <sighs> Locked. Then I cupped my hands over the windows and gasped. Behind the dress forms, there was nothing, just a large, empty room. No dresses, no clothes, no inventory at all. <sighs> it's not a real store, I said. Just a facade, uh... The sharp whistle of the train. I looked up. In the distance sat the train, in the same place as before. I wonder... It took us twenty minutes to walk to the station. When we finally got there, it was my turn to be disturbed. There were no train tracks. Well, unless you count the crudely painted railroad ties on the asphalt. No wonder I hadn't seen it move since we first arrived. It was a train sitting on flat ground. We shouldn't go any closer, Brandon said, laying a hand on my shoulder. This whole thing feels weird, like a... He trailed off, fear flashing in his eyes. Like what, Brandon? Like a trap. And then I heard it. Voices, chatting and laughing, 
coming from inside the train. I glanced at the windows. Within a few of them, I saw the dark silhouettes of people contrasting starkly with the yellow light. There are people in there, I said. Maybe they can help us. I started towards it. Caroline, no. We shouldn't... What? You want us to walk around this town forever? No, but... I wheeled around, the anger suddenly bubbling up inside me. No, you know where I thought you were taking me. New York City, to see a Broadway show, or to climb the top of the Empire State Building. Caroline... You said that's where we were going. You said it! But then you lost the game of poker with Greg, and suddenly the plans changed. I felt tears sting my eyes. At least have the decency to admit it. But... You find some stupid little bed and breakfast, and then to top it all off, you forget to get gas, and we wind up stranded in this dinky little town. I yanked away from him. With a deep breath, I climbed the metal stairs and pulled the door open. Hello? I called more loudly than I meant to. The yellow light flickered. Seats, upholstered with red fabric, flanked the aisle. But they were empty. The pockets of each seat back were also empty, as were the luggage racks overhead. Uh, Hello. Brandon stepped in behind me. Okay, we'll explore this thing. Just let's try to make it quick, okay? I ignored him and walked further down the aisle. Hello. I called again. The voices grew weaker, then stronger, then weaker. And every single seat was empty. Hello. My voice caught in my throat. There on the painted window was the silhouette of a man. Caroline. I whipped around. Brandon was standing by one of the seats, his face pale. I know where the voices are coming from. I rushed over. He was pointing frantically to something embedded in the arm of the chair. I crouched down to get a better look. It's a speaker, I whispered. The sound reverberated through the metal of the train, shaking the floor underneath us. I looked up and through the window at the front. A shadow in the next car, coming towards us. We ran down the aisle, past the empty chairs, the silhouettes on the windows, the speakers and their recordings of chatter. The doors rolled open. A tall, thin man walked in, wearing a tuxedo and a mustache. As soon as his eyes met ours, he quickened his pace. Caroline, stop staring and run! Brandon pulled me out of the car. We ran down the street, past the fake trees, the glass pond, the empty shops. We ran until our legs ached, our lungs burned, our feet stung. There, the church. We ran into the atrium. Brandon lifted the welcome sign and pushed it through the handles to barricade the door. Let's get inside. He pulled open the door. No. The church wasn't empty. The pews were filled with mannequins, all formally dressed, in suits and dresses and hats, turned towards the front of the church. And at the front was a woman. Or rather, the skeleton of one. It appeared she had died at least several years ago from the state of her body. But she was dressed in a new, crisp, white wedding gown. She was propped up against the altar, as if waiting for her groom. What the hell? Brandon muttered. We walked down the aisle. 
The painted faces stared at us blankly. A blonde woman in a summer hat, her plastic hair trailing down her neck. A dashing man, eyes dull and black, wearing a stiff gray suit. We should get out of here, I said. It's only a matter of time before he finds us. A hand shot out from the pew and latched onto mine. I lost my balance. Pain shot through my knees. I screamed and tried to yank my hand away, but she was so strong, pulling me into the pew. I looked up. It wasn't one of the mannequins, but a woman. The same woman from the shop. In the light of the church, I realized she was quite young, maybe twenty at most. We don't have much time, she said, yanking at my hand wildly. When he gets here, he'll... he'll... She cut off. I can protect you, I promise. Just come with me. Brandon shook his head. It's another trap, just like the train. I'm telling the truth, she yelled. Then tell us the truth about everything, I said, stepping towards her. Who is he? Why is everything fake? She sighed. (sighs) He's my father. Brandon and I looked at each other. My mother died ten years ago. After she did, he got a little... obsessed. He wanted to recreate their perfect wedding day, down to the small little town that they got married in. Why not just move back to that town? Brandon asked. It had already changed significantly since that day. A Domino's, where Cafe Italiano used to be. A parking garage on top of the park. She threw a scared glance at the door. Not to mention the tons of tourists visiting from the city every weekend. Why doesn't he want to hurt us? I asked. I mean... We'll sit in on his little corpse wedding if it means he'll let us go. No, he won't have it. People are imperfections, according to him. This is his perfect town, and he wants no one messing it up. And... She cut off. The doors of the church shook and shuddered, making a sickening, splintering crack each time they were hit. Let me in, a voice yelled from the other side. Let me in, V. We followed her to the back of the church, down a dark set of stairs. The air grew thick and musty. Cold emanated from the stone walls. She led us through a few doors, locking each one as we went by. As we entered a narrower tunnel, we slowed down to a walk. Walk that way. Thirty minutes, you'll come up on the other side. There's a convenience store on the outskirts of Franklin. They'll give you a lift. What about my car? She stared at Brandon without a smile. Don't come back for it. V was true to her word. In the half hour, We had surfaced on the other side, next to a mom-and-pop convenience store. While Brandon called for a ride, I stared out across the desert at Pleasanton. And in the distance, I heard the faint toll of wedding bells ringing out across the sand. I signed up for the experiment because I needed all the extra money I could get. I had recently found out about a health issue that would cost a lot of money, and as a college student, I really didn't have many options. Luckily, the psych department was offering a hundred dollars for every ten minutes of the experiment. The flyer explained that there would be no pain applied to the participant. In fact, the participant would be alone in a room, untouched, 
or even talked to by the researchers. The participant could earn as much money as they wanted as long as they stayed in the room. I figured it was some sort of isolation experiment. I knew I'd do well, considering I was almost always alone anyway. I had a plan. I would spend the morning eating and drinking very little, so I wouldn't need to use the bathroom. I'd pack a bag with some light snacks and water. I know that isolation is very difficult, but I wanted to earn as much money as possible. I got to the address and was taken to an intake room. My brother texted me something, but I ignored it. A doctor sat across from me, at least I assumed she was a doctor, by her white coat. Hello, Samantha, she said, devoid of emotion. Her hair was piled on her head in a messy bun. Sam, you can call me Sam. I felt awkward sitting here with her. She didn't look at me, just at her clipboard. I detest nicknames, she responded. I swallowed. She continued, I will need you to sign this consent form. It frees us from any liability related to the experiment. She passed a piece of paper to me, still not looking up. I skimmed the sheet. What's an anechoic chamber? She clicked her tongue. That is the room you will be staying in. Yeah, but what is it? Her eyes flicked to me, giving off a strong sense of annoyance. An anechoic chamber is a room that has been completely soundproofed. The room absorbs any sound inside the chamber, so it is wholly silent. Oh, so it's just a quiet room. Good. I was worried it would be like a torture chamber. <laughs> I laughed a little. Surprisingly, she gave me a smile. Don't worry, Samantha. Nothing will touch you inside the room. You will be completely alone. She snatched my signed consent form and stood up. Now it's time. Follow me. I walked behind her as she navigated the building. We went down three flights of stairs. The bottom floor, which must be the basement, was a bit like of a maze to get through. Finally, we came across a hall with three doors on either side. The doors had large wheels on them, just like a submarine door. The doctor began opening the very last door, turning the wheel with great effort. The inside of the room was odd. It was covered in panels that looked like cardboard. The room was pretty small, probably the size of a walk-in closet. In the middle of the room was a chair. There were no windows, but a single light hung from the ceiling. I took a deep breath and went to enter. The doctor stopped me with a firm hand on my arm. You have to leave your bag out here. But it has water and snacks, I replied. You won't need them. I sighed and handed my bag over. The first few steps into the chamber were a little scary, but once I was sitting in the chair, I felt fine. It was definitely quiet in there. The doctor stood in the open doorway. When you want to leave the room, simply press the red button on the door. I nodded. She grinned and closed the door, locking it. I sat there for a moment, pondering on what was going to happen. It sure was quiet. Before going into this room, I never understood the constant background noise that was always there. In the room, it literally was only me. I moved slightly against the chair, and the noise was a surprise. It boomed. I laughed at my own shock, and I swear I had never laughed louder. 
It came out of my mouth like a trumpet and instantly disappeared into the walls. I sat for what felt like forever. I started to hear the sounds of my body. It started with my breath. That sound was familiar, but I had never heard it so loud. Then my stomach began to rumble, drums inside my abdomen. I raised my arm, and I swear I heard my bones shifting against the joints. It sounded like a door hinge. The noise began to disturb me. I couldn't believe how loud it was. Did I always make this much sound? I was just sitting. The clamor was unstoppable. I closed my eyes, trying to stay calm. I focused on the most comforting sound, my breathing. In and out. In and out. But suddenly, my skin began to hum. It sounded like the buzz of a bug zapper. I tried my hardest to tune it out, but the buzzing just got louder. Soon, all of my organs were screaming. I could hear my heart banging inside my chest. Even my liver and kidneys made noise as they did their jobs. I folded in the chair, hands over my ears, tears coming to my eyes, but that only made the sound of my hands louder. So many little bones rubbing together, the hairs mixing, the skin of my ears humming. I even heard the tiny mites in my eyebrows skittering around. I dropped my hands and bit my lip. I knew there was a catch to this room, but I didn't expect the cacophony of noise. It was as if the volume of my body was turned all the way up. And then, suddenly, I heard something new. Something small and bloody, moving up and down. I scanned the room and saw nothing. The small, wet thing was... crawling? No. It was moving, but it seemed suspended in place. The smack of its damp appendages made me feel sick. I wanted to throw up. I wanted to push that red button. <sighs> but I needed the money. I must have been there at least an hour, but I needed much more. Now the dripping sound joined the orchestra, like tap water, but thicker. The small, wet thing was still sickeningly moving. The thick water tapped slowly, as if sliding down a rock face. That's when I felt it. I lifted my dress and saw the blood running from between my legs. I screamed, but then I had to stop because it was deafening. The blood started flowing harder. The wet thing slid in on its own thick. I fell to the floor with my legs open. My breath was so faint because of all the other sounds. With one large push, the wet thing passed through me onto the ground. My mouth hung open. My thighs were covered in blood. I was so overwhelmed with the noise that I could only hear one booming uproar. With trembling hands, I picked up the wet thing. It was tiny and dripping with fluid. I pressed it to my face. I didn't know what to do. I stood shakily, leaning against the wall. With one last burst of energy, I fell against the red button. The wet thing was clutched to my chest. Blood covered the room. My senses were overloaded. I needed the door to be open. Suddenly, with a pop, the noises stopped. The door opened, and a flood of calm filled the room. I could hear the cars on the street, the sound of clothing, the clatter of the world. 
I looked at the doctor's eyes, still holding the wet thing. She was smiling. That is new, she said in a satisfied tone. I was sobbing at this point. Please, just give me my money. Uh, I have to go to the hospital. The doctor reached out and stroked the wet thing. I coughed with sobs. She locked her eyes with me. You were only inside for eight minutes and thirty-two seconds. You haven't earned anything. I started trembling. The doctor was impatient and rolled her eyes with me. Uh, I... uh, I didn't earn anything? No. She helped me out of the room and closed the door behind me. I held the wet thing out in front of me. It slipped through my fingers and hit the ground with a smack. She sighed. You made quite a mess, but at least we took care of your little medical issue. If everyone receives this message, please send help. I live in Redacted, and my family and I are in dire need of assistance. We are freezing to death and need help now. I know this is all confusing, but my fingers are so cold. We can't get out of our house. Let me start from the beginning as best I can. I woke up in the middle of the night to sounds of my mom and dad moving in the living room. It was freezing, like brutally cold. A kind of unnatural cold that seeps into your body and remains there no matter how many blankets or layers of clothing you put on. I could only lay there in my bed, frozen by the cold. I wondered why it was so damn cold. When I went to sleep, everything was cozy. I had snuggled into bed under layers of warm blankets and fell into a deep sleep, only to be awakened by the cold. I heard my older brother stir from his room next door and trot down the hallway to join mom and dad in the living room. I could hear whispers of concern and worry, and I thought something bad was happening. I checked my watch, saw it was 3.22 in the morning, way too early for any of us to be awake, but I guess the fact that I could see my breath meant that something was wrong with our house and our heat. For the house to get this cold in a short matter of time seemed bizarre. What are we going to do? We're not going to freeze, I heard my mom whispering. We're going to freeze. We're not going to freeze. We'll have to get a fire going. Adam, I'm going to need your help, Dad said. I heard Adam let out a long sigh before moving to help Dad. I took in a deep breath preparing myself for the grating cold that would assault me when I pushed the blankets from my body. But I had to know what was going on. I pushed the blankets off quickly and scrambled for the dresser drawer to find a warm pair of fleece-lined pants, a hat, and two hoodies. There was no way I wanted to put on my proper winter coat to sit in the house. It just didn't seem right at all. I met the rest of my family in the dark living room. My mom sat on the couch dressed in warm clothes and with several blankets around her. Our eyes met, and she called me over and tossed me a few spare blankets, shivering all the while. I could see the digital thermostat said the room was currently only 23 Fahrenheit. My dad and brother were trying their best to light a fire, but they didn't have enough good kindling to really get it going. Black smoke billowed into the room making us all cough. (coughs) Damn it, my dad shouted in frustration. Dad kept lighting pieces of newspaper, trying to get a large log to catch on fire, while my brother kept fanning the flames, hoping to get it going. We kept a few pieces of wood in the house for emergencies, but the vast majority of our firewood, like everyone else's, was kept in a small shack on the line of our property. 
I don't think we used the fireplace more than a handful of times in five years. What's going on with the heat? Uh, How'd it get so cold in here? I asked. Heaters are broken, it seems. There must be some sort of freak storm out there because the temperature really dropped. It must be in the negatives out there, Dad said with a frown. Is the fire almost ready? Mom asked. It's not starting. All our kindling is outside. We'll need more firewood, too, eventually, even if we do get this goddamn thing started. I'll have to go gear up and grab some. Adam chimed in at that moment. I'll go out there and get it. You stay in here and keep trying to light the fire. Dad seemed hesitant at first, but granted him permission. All right, but don't mess around out there. Just get the wood and come back. Too cold to be out there for too long. You'll get frostbite. Adam seemingly brushed this warning off. He was cocky and usually dismissed my parents' advice. He was the rebellious one, while I was typically more level-headed and rational. Oh, fuck. What am I saying? I was a goddamn pussy compared to Adam. Adam went back down the hall for a few seconds. I looked to my dad, who kept trying to light more newspapers in an attempt to get the log to catch fire. My mom only pulled her blankets around her tighter as she desperately watched to see if the fire would start. I pushed up one of the blinds to try to see outside, but found that all the windows were frosted over, making it almost impossible to see anything clearly. You could make out shapes and colors, but beyond that, there was not much of anything you could see. I could see large snowflakes coming down out there. Apparently, a snowstorm had blown in unexpectedly. I turned back to see my brother emerge from the hall, dressed in his large winter coat and decorated with a thick hat and heavy gloves. He carried a large sled that was slung over his back and held with a rope. This is going to be sweet, Adam bragged. Dad looked at him angrily. What the hell is the sled for? You are only supposed to get some firewood and kindling and come back. The house is freezing. This isn't time for you to mess around. Ah, yeah. Of course the sled is for wooden stuff. I can drag it through the snow on this. It'll be easier. Dad couldn't really argue with that logic, I guess. He certainly could bring back more wood on the sled than carrying it by hand. I followed Adam to the back door. I wanted to see what was going on outside. At the time, I was curious how a storm like this had come on with no warning. Adam opened the door quickly, revealing clearly what was going on outside. I took a peek and saw snow piled high and more falling in almost blizzard-like conditions. Shards of ice hung from the roof of our house like cold daggers. In the distance through the hazy wall of snow and ice, I swear I could see a human-like figure illuminated by a subtle blue light. It waved its arms in the cold night. It seemingly had no lower torso that I could see, only an upper torso that seemed to connect to the snow or something. It swayed back and forth in an almost rhythmic motion. A shudder ran through me, and I instinctively blinked. Then, I could see nothing but the blizzard continuing to rage. A frigid wind pushed its way into the house with a roar that chilled me to the core. The house creaked as the strong wind buffeted the sides. I watched him shut the door behind him, fighting against the strong wind that so desperately wanted to invade more of our house. I ran over to the windows to peer out and saw his silhouette grew smaller and smaller as he made his way over to the wood shack. (sighs) We sat in the living room and waited for Adam to return. My dad kept trying to light the fire while mom went to work making us coffee and hot cocoa to hopefully help warm us. I sat down on the couch with a cup of hot cocoa and saw my dad struggling to keep the log burning alongside sips of his coffee, but the log continued to scorch and smoke up the place. We drank our lukewarm beverages and waited, and waited, and waited. 
Dad by this time had given up on getting the fire going without some proper kindling or smaller pieces of wood. Eventually, we began to grow concerned. It shouldn't have taken 20 minutes to gather a few pieces of wood and kindling from the shack. The three of us were by the windows, trying to look for a sign of him. I went over to the window again and tried to look out to see if I could get a view of him. I could see that figure again, or at least the outline highlighted by the blue light. The silhouette danced in the blizzard. Looking at it made me feel cold and hollow, but I couldn't determine what it was through the frosted glass. I was about to call my dad over to look at it when he started speaking. What the hell is keeping that boy? I better suit up and go find out what's going on out there. Seems it's getting even colder. We need to get this fire going. Dad was right, of course. The house temperature had dropped to 16 degrees, and if things continued, it would get even colder. My dad piled up the blankets on one of the windows, trying to look outside to see what was going on, but a thick layer of ice kept us from really seeing too much, save for murky silhouettes. I put my face closer to the window. I could feel the cold air seeping through our house, eradicating the remaining warmth our house held. Suddenly, a loud crack rang through the house as something smashed into a window. It cracked, and I jumped back as my mom let out a shrill scream. Dad turned towards the source of the noise. What the hell was that? Dad yelled. Something hit the window. It's cracked, I said. What was it? I know it's windy out there, but to crack a window like that? I don't know what it was, but something definitely hit the window. I think there might be something else out there. Something else out there? Like an animal? I don't think birds are flying in this weather. I'm going outside. I need to see what is going on out there. I need to find Adam. He's probably messing around building a whole snowman family or sledding down hills like I told him not to. We need to get this place warm soon or the pipes will freeze and burst if they haven't already. No, I I, I don't know. It, It looks like someone off in the distance is waving their arms. Ah, jeez. Probably your idiot brother messing around out there. I told him this was important, and of course he didn't listen. This time, I volunteered to go outside with my dad and help him. Two of us could carry more wood, or at least I could look to find Adam and bring him back on to his task. Things were beginning to look dire for us if we didn't get the fire going. I put on my heaviest coat, snow boots, hat, and gloves. Dad and I made our way to the back door. I was feeling a bit nervous about the whole thing. There was no way that figure was Adam. Outside was colder than I expected. The cold went right through my coat and clothing. I couldn't believe Adam would want to be out in this, even if he did want to go sledding. I followed behind my dad as the blizzard raged, and about halfway to the woodshed, we saw the sled. It was mostly buried under falling snow. There was wood on it, but with it being covered in snow and mostly frozen, it was now useless. My dad pulled the sled from the snow and pushed the frozen wood off. I need to get dry wood. You go look for your brother. He couldn't have gone far. Dad yelled at me. My dad's form quickly faded as he walked off into the blizzard. I turned and went the other way. Visibility was getting even worse than when I had looked out the front door before, and there was no way I could stay out here for that long. I walked around yelling my brother's name again and again, trying to get him to come out. My toes and fingers were already beginning to feel cold. It was then I started hearing a crunching noise, like someone was walking through the snow, following me. I thought it might be Adam trying to scare me, staying just out of sight to mess with me. I was honestly getting pretty scared. My heart beat fast. 
Being out in the freezing dark of night was not all that fun, and I had an intense feeling that I was in danger. I had seen something strange earlier and was already feeling nervous when I came out. A figure finally came into view, and I felt a moment of relief. But as the figure drew closer, my relief turned into sheer horror when I realized it was not Adam. It was not my dad either. It was something else shambling towards me. Heavy footfalls left imprints in the snow that quickly froze over. I could feel cold radiating off this thing as it grew closer. A frozen eyeball hung from its eye socket. It wore clothes that were torn and ragged, revealing bluish gray flesh that was definitely unnatural. Icicles hung from the ends of its clothes. There were holes in its skin exposing grim yellow bones. Some protruding out had frozen over. The thing stepped toward me, and I instinctively began moving away from it. It opened its mouth, letting out a noise that was a mix between a roar and a moan, before snow poured out of its mouth and onto the ground, adding to the already deep snowfall. I screamed and darted off away from this thing. I didn't even go toward the house I was so panicked. I didn't know what the hell this thing was, but I knew I had to get the hell away from it. I heard it following me for a bit, but it couldn't match my speed as I trampled through the snow. I tripped and fell. My body sunk into the cold snow, and I actually began to feel warm. They do say that people often feel warm when they are starting to freeze. Adrenaline pumped through me as I pushed myself to free myself from the snow. I tried to calm myself down. I cupped my hands over my eyes to try and see where I was, the snow now a nearly blinding blizzard. Not far in front of me was a large pile of snow. It was unnatural. No one had shoveled it there, and there were no plows around that could have piled the snow that high. I eyed the pile for a moment with suspicion and fear. I realized I needed to get back home, but as I was about to run off, bits of snow began to roll down off the pile before greater cracks appeared. Suddenly, a skeletal hand pierced the barrier of the snow, causing more snow from the pile to fall to the ground. A skeletal head appeared, unnatural blue light escaping from its sockets of the skull. There was a distinctive crown of ice that almost sparkled. I stood paralyzed with fear, or maybe it was the cold. I felt colder than I have ever felt before as I realized that this was the thing I had seen earlier. It had been covered in snow in that short amount of time. It shook its head, causing more snow to fall from the pile and hit the ground before starting to move its long, lanky arms that pushed the majority of snow off it. It had an upper torso, but its lower torso was seemingly nothing more than snow and ice. I could only watch in horror as the thing placed a hand onto the ground. Moments later, there were areas of blue light seemingly penetrating the thick snow around me. I watched as more and more spots began to get that sickly bluish glow. And then they all faded. The snow affected by that blue light all began to crack and move on its hands, and then bodies emerged. They were the same as the thing I had seen earlier, bluish gray skin and ragged clothes. The cold was almost unbearable now. I couldn't feel my fingers or toes, but I knew I had to move as the things began to wail and shamble toward me. I was so scared as I ran to the house. I could hear the footfalls of those zombie-like things following behind me as fast as they could. When I reached the house, I felt a sense of relief but as I ran past the cracked window toward the door, my foot stepped on something causing me to nearly trip and fall. I quickly took a moment to dig around the snow and pulled out something heavy and covered in frost and snow. I turned it over in my hand and brushed off some of the snow, 
terror flooding into me as the snow fell from the object. Cold, dead eyes stared up at me, the visage frozen into a look of pure terror. It only took me a second to realize what it was as I dropped the thing and turned to vomit. It was Adam's severed head. One of those things must have gotten to him. I ran inside the house and panicked with tears in my eyes. The house was warmer now, and my dad was there by a healthy fire, taking off his winter coat and hat. Did you find Adam? Dad asked. I couldn't muster a response. How the hell could I tell him that Adam was dead? I tried to keep my tears back, but they came out anyway with heavy streams. I blubbered like a baby for a moment, trying to compose myself. Yeah, my brother was kind of a dick, but he was still family. I figured my dad would think I was being a baby or mock me, but a serious look of concern came over his face. My mom had got up too, and now eyed me curiously. I didn't want to be the one to break the news. What's wrong? Where's Adam? Dad asked me again. I didn't answer him, only stood there crying. My mom put her arm around me and sat me down on the couch. My mind was a mix of grief and fear. Those things were still out there. It took a moment of crying before I found my resolve to tell them what was going on. There's these things out there, a, a, a lot of them now. One got Adam. I, I, I think they're coming this way. They didn't even have time to process what I was saying when a heavy thud came from the side of the house. We all stopped for a moment and listened. Then there was another thud and another. Suddenly, the cracked window from earlier broke and one of those things toppled in, bringing with it a stream of cold wind. Snow steadily poured from its mouth. What, what the fuck is that? Dad shouted in horror. The thing lunged at my dad, sinking its frozen teeth into his neck. Dad screamed as it tore into him, blood squirting from his neck in a vicious spray that coated the thing's face. Dad kicked at the thing, sending it toppling to the ground as another had begun to crawl in the window. It grabbed my mom's hand, who stood there shocked and screaming in terror. He clutched his other hand at his bleeding neck. More of them were entering the room through the window now. I heard a boom as our door toppled to the ground, and more of those things poured into the room, bringing with them snow and ice. We ran down the hallway to the basement. It had a heavy door of steel that we were able to lock and keep those things out. And that brings us to now. I can hear their footsteps and moans above us. It's slowly getting colder down here. We were able to stop Dad from bleeding, but now he has some sort of frostbite and has fallen unconscious. Mom just sits in the corner crying and crying and crying. It's so cold down here. I don't think we have long. I called 911 and they said they were sending someone, but that was half an hour ago. I don't think they can get through the snow and ice. This is my last attempt to get help. Please, for the love of God, help us. Dr. Tweed, so nice to finally see you again. I trust you have many stories to tell me about your adventures in the deep heart of Africa. Dr. Tweed beamed with sheer delight as he greeted his colleague at the door. A red bow tie attached to the top of his khaki blazer gave the fellow an eccentric yet scholarly appearance. The old man squinted through his bifocals while beckoning Robert to the table, where two cups of hot tea had already been poured. Robert, my good man, he began. Yes, yes, of course. 
Join me for some tea, and I shall regale you with a tale regarding the most curious creature this old man has ever had the pleasure of coming across in all his years gallivanting around the globe. A friendly exchange of smiles and a pleasant handshake later, the two men had taken their seats. So, Doctor, tell me about this mysterious creature of yours. Dr. Tweed's eyes lit up like a pair of bright blue sapphires. Ah, yes. The African Boana Spider, named after the indigenous people who reside in a section of the jungle where the creature originally hails. It is a massive arachnid. I dare say the thing is about half a meter in diameter. But that's not even the most interesting tidbit about it. Good God, man, Robert gasped. I I beg your pardon, Doctor, but I'm finding it quite hard to swallow that your interest in the tremendous girth of the spider would be eclipsed by an even more fascinating factoid. The old man's lips curled into the slightest smirk upon hearing Robert's retort. Oh, but eclipsed it is, my dear friend. Perhaps you will understand once you hear this remarkable anecdote. On my twenty-first night exploring the Dark Continent, we found that one of our pack mules had begun suffering from some sort of horrible illness. Our guides had previously warned my party that the primeval forest we made camp in was rife with poisonous asps, adders, and mambas, along with other deadly serpents, so I naturally hypothesized that it had fallen victim to one of the jungle's venomous vipers. However, upon further examination, I could find no evidence of teeth marks on the animal. No wounds, no pricks, not a single thing that would indicate it had been attacked. Sounds like quite the conundrum, Doctor. Indeed it was. Even more curious was the fact that, though I found the animal's behavior to be somewhat unnerving, Many of our party's guides seemed to be downright terrified. At the sight of the mule's predicament, a few of them ran off from our campsite into the darkness of the untamed jungle by themselves. The fools. I loaded my rifle in order to put the creature out of its misery, as it was writhing on the ground and seemed to be suffering quite considerably. But before I had the chance to pull the trigger, my eyes witnessed a truly incredible sight. No, Doctor. You're not about to say... Oh, but I am. Out of the creature's mouth crawled the bow on a spider. Dr. Tweed took a sip of his tea. Robert could tell by his friend's reaction that it was still a bit too hot to drink. Like I said before, it was colossal. Now, while I haven't quite figured out how the giant thing was able to contort its body enough to crawl its way out of the beast's jowls, I do have a theory about what it was doing there in the first place. Tweed paused a moment for dramatic effect, reveling in the mystery of his account. Well, well, out with it then. I must say, good doctor, that I am absolutely enthralled by this story of yours. You must tell me what happened next. As it turns out, this particular species of arachnid had become quite feared by the natives, hence the reason why some of my party's guides had decided to take their chances among the ferocious wildlife and poisonous flora of the jungle, instead of staying at camp once they realized what was behind all the ruckus. The remaining guides insisted that I shoot the spider. But you know me, Robert. I'm a man of science, and what kind of academician would I be if I ended the life of such a spectacular specimen? An anthropod of such astonishing peculiarity must be studied alive. Robert interjected once more, But, Doctor, you still haven't explained what it was doing inside the mule's mouth. Have patience, my good man. 
all will be revealed in time. You see, the natives believed the spider to be some sort of soul-sucking demon, one that feasts upon the very life force of a man, bleeding him dry until he becomes nothing more than a useless, withered husk. Obviously, an educated bloke like myself would dismiss such notions as nothing but foolish superstition. But I do believe these primitive myths were on to something. Nevertheless, there is always a scientific explanation for these things. From my brief encounter with the creature, I have gathered that the eight-legged Goliath has evolved the most extraordinary of survival tactics. It appears that the spider entered our mule through its oral cavity. From there, it may have attached itself in some way to the beast's nervous system, granting it full access to the mule's movements and vocal patterns, essentially rendering the animal a useless puppet. What I am saying, Robert, is that this creature was wearing our unfortunate ungulate like a hat on Sunday, and all of us were none the wiser. I have since postulated that the arachnid made itself at home in the body of its hoofed host, feeding off its cerebral spinal fluid just long enough for it to plant a revolting sack of eggs. Robert's eyes widened with interest. What an intriguing yet horrifying creature, Doctor. Perhaps the guides who fled into the night weren't as foolish as you say. Could you imagine what would happen if a thing like that was on the loose here in England? People would be in quite a panic. He and the old man shared a chuckle. The doctor took another sip of his tea. Could I imagine, Robert? I dare say. It already is. Dr. Tweed's head suddenly cocked back in a violent manner. Terrible gagging noises emanated from his throat as blood began trickling from his eyes, ears, and nose. Eight long, spindly legs emerged from his mouth. I woke up at summer camp as a janitor of sorts. The camp is situated on a secluded island, so there is no flowing water and no electricity outside of the small town. I lived there during the summers, maintaining the facilities and cleaning up after the kids. Boring, I know, but the pay is fair, and I don't have much to do. The only time I ever met a group was the first year the camp was held in 20 years. It was the summer of 2002, late August. It was hot, and the group was very large. To celebrate the last night of camp, some of the older kids had snuck out, silently moving through the palm trees to escape watchful eyes. It was the middle of the night, and the moon was high in the sky, shining with a pale light, making the soft waves sparkle with life. By chance, they had set camp just outside of my cabin. The noise from their speakers and their shouting woke me from a drowsy, alcohol-induced sleep. I dressed and found them dancing and drinking by a blazing fire. I brewed a pot of coffee and waited for them to leave so I could go back to sleep. An hour passed and their shouting and dancing had quieted down. The music faded away, and the fire was less fierce, but still burning, hot and red. I could see most of them gathering around the flames, speaking softly. Great, I thought. I can finally go back to sleep. But alas, two of the older girls, maybe 15 or 16, approached my cabin, One of them wore a flower-patterned bikini, and the other a pale summer dress. It was hard to discern its color in the darkness. The one in the bikini approached my door, 
while the other girl hesitated and stayed a few feet back. I went up to the door and opened it, just before she had a chance to knock. She shrieked, a loud and high-pitched shriek that only a teenage girl can make. The sound made me grit my teeth. She almost fell backwards, but her friend caught her, and both of them began to giggle. <laughs> we thought this was the rope maker's house, the one in the dress said, smiling shyly. We didn't think anyone actually lived here. Well, I'm only a janitor. I paused to yawn, still tired and sleep deprived. The legend of the rope maker was just a story we used to tell children. It was about morale, work ethics, and how dedication would lead to success. I vaguely remembered the story from my own youth. Do you know anything about the legend of the rope maker? The girl in the bikini asked with a childish curiosity. I frowned at her. Why were they asking this? I was getting impatient, wanting nothing more than to lie back down in my own bed and read. Maybe I do, and maybe I don't. Sure, I lived here about 30 years ago, but I was only a kid a few years younger than you girls. What do you know about the rope maker, anyway? I asked in an irritated tone. Only that he died horribly, said the one in the dress. They say that he was drowned here, the other continued. Would you tell us? They both asked eagerly, almost skittish. Please, pretty please, the girls pleaded, looking at me with big hopeful eyes. After a deep sigh, I agreed and they took me by the hand and almost dragged me to the fire. The girls shouted at their friend to quiet down. Teenagers of all shapes and sizes were staring at me, sitting around the fire. An older boy stood. He was smoking a cigarette but threw the butt in the sand and began arguing with the girls, saying that an old man was not welcome at their party. The girls would have none of it and made him sit down like the rest and keep his mouth shut. They were all waiting for a story. I could tell by the look in their eyes that they were not expecting a story about morale and duty. They were wanting a horror story. And so I decided to tell a story so terrifying that none of them would ever return to disturb my peace again. So... You want to know about the rope maker? I asked in a hushed voice. Most of them nodded or agreed, but some of them looked away like they didn't care at all. I warn you, I almost whispered now, it is not a story for children. Are you sure about this? Just tell your story, old man. The older boy said in a nonchalant tone that implied that he was not going to be frightened by some janitor's ancient story. I almost felt sorry for them. But nevertheless, I began telling my story. The legend began 30 years ago in a small village that used to be right here, on this very island. The villagers had been living in fear for years and years, never leaving their houses alone or daring to sleep without their doors locked and bolted, fearing they might never wake again. For there was a serial killer among them, a wolf who had made his way into the herd and the herd was beginning to thin. No one trusted their friends colleagues or neighbors. Both girls and boys alike would be found hanging by their necks from palm trees, their corpses mutilated. The mutilation varied each time. At first the killer would take a finger or toe, maybe an ear. But as he grew bolder, he took eyes, tongues, even genitals. 
He always kept the parts for trophies. So, who was he? The girl in the dress asked. I'm getting there, I replied. Just let me tell the story. The bodies would be found hanging from a tree beside the rope maker's house, I continued. The villagers grew suspicious of the rope maker, but could not prove he was the killer. After three years and over 50 murders, the desperate and fearful mayor decided to act. The island had become infamous for its serial killer, and tourists no longer came. He decided to sentence the rope maker, who was just an old man who day in and day out worked on his ropes. He was seemingly harmless, and all agreed he was the kindest old man. But something had to be done. Someone had to pay. They arrested him and tortured him for weeks, trying to get a confession, but to no avail. Between his screams, he would plea his innocence. But they would not listen. In their last attempt to make him confess, They tied his feet to a rock, with rope he was forced to make. Then they carried him out to the beach, just by the edge of the water, and buried the heavy rock in the soft sand. To confess or slowly drown by the inevitable tide were his only options now. The entire village came to see the killer confess. They even forced the rope maker's son to watch as his father would tear at the rope with his nails, ripping them apart. The old man would cry for help, for mercy, but when no one answered he shouted curses at them. He threatened and screamed, he pleaded and begged, but no one answered his cries. The hours passed and the water slowly rose. Desperate to escape, he tried to bite off his own foot. He would scream between the bites, tearing away flesh and tendons. However, he could no more get through his bone than he could his rope. In a last attempt, he tried to break his bone with his hands. But he could not do it. The pain was too great. His terrifying screams of agony and despair can still be heard to this day. If you listen closely at night, you can hear it in the distance. He was drowned and buried right here, under the water right beside us. The moon was high and full that night too. The rope maker made the rope that would be his death, with as much care and pride as all the others he had made before and it would not budge or tear, no matter how hard he struggled. As the sun finally set, all the villagers were crying for the old man, ashamed of themselves for what they had done. Women and men, children and old people all cried for the man and for themselves. The killer had not been found. The only one who didn't cry was the rope maker's son, He just sank to his knees and stared out at the horizon, eyes empty and cold. Even though the man had never confessed the murders seemed to have stopped. So the rope maker was the killer? A younger boy with big black eyes asked. No one knows, I answered. Wow, that was a great story, said the boy who at first had argued. Let's go take a midnight swim, he shouted to the group. Many of the other kids started to rise and follow him. Wait, I almost shouted. They all instantly stopped at the loudness of my voice and sank back down. Don't you want to know how the story ends? I asked. They all nodded. The fire was almost out at this point. Just an orange glow remained. I continued my story. 
Months passed, even years without any sign of the killer. Soon, the world forgot about the incident and the summer camps began again. They thrived for a couple of years until something happened during their last summer camp before this one. What happened? Someone whispered softly. The last camp before this one was 20 years ago, and about 10 years after the rope maker's death, the mayor who had sentenced the rope maker had retired and his children were taking part in the summer camp as counselors. Since it was the 10th year of camps, they decided to make it bigger and moved it farther away from the village. To celebrate the last day of the last week, a feast was held right where you are sitting now. A giant bowl of punch was brought out by the fire. Food and drink shared between happy teenagers, just like you. Even the counselors took part in drinking. Happy shouting and joyful music could be heard late into the night. Little did they know what gruesome fate awaited them. The next day, the sun rose and the sun set without any of them returning. The mayor worried about his children, decided to walk out to the beach where the feast had been held. What he found drove him mad. It is said that he simply continued walking into the sea to drown his sorrow and his life. It took yet another day for the locals to find the scene, and it was so terrifying, the entire village abandoned the island within the year. Hanging from a tree, one rope tied to each limb like a marionette, was the mayor's daughter. Her head had been cut off. It was found by the beach, sitting on a pile of rock, beside a corpse so mutilated it was not considered human. Arms and fingers twisted in cruel torture, and her entire body was covered in stabs and cuts. Her face was the worst of it. Her eyes had been gouged out, and then someone had poured acid into them, burning her entire face beyond recognition. On her forehead, carved all the way to the bone, was the text mutilator. All the locals who had been working as counselors were tied, hand behind their backs, with a thick rope in their mouth, their kneecaps smashed and broken. Unable to move by themselves, they had been left there to watch the waves crashing against them, just barely reaching their feet. When they had been found, they were all sent to the hospital in town, None of them ever spoke of what they had been forced to witness. Later, they had found the corpses of the participants on the beach, tied to rocks and drowned by the tides. Most of them had been eaten by carnivorous fishes, but some had clear bite marks on their legs just above where the noose had been tied. The locals say it was the spirit of the rope maker who did it. Others claim it was the gods. No one remains who lived through that incident. Most of the counselors who survived died soon thereafter from infections or dehydration. The few that lived later committed suicide by hanging. They never found the rope maker's son. He had vanished the day of the incident, never to be seen again for 20 years. And now the legend has almost been forgotten. Maybe someone needs to remind the world again. As I finished my story, I looked around. No one spoke for a minute, nothing but a soft rustling of leaves and the nearby waves gushing against the beach. I could see the terror in their faces. They would not be swimming this night, and probably not for many nights to come. I slowly stood, 
The soft glow from the burnt down fire was slowly dying. I drew in my breath and exhaled as hard as I could right at the ashes. Smoke rose and the little light that had been remaining faded in an instant. In the pitch black darkness, girls and boys screamed and ran in all directions. I just stood there laughing like a maniac. So that's the story of how I'm not allowed within 500 yards of any summer camp related activities. I was born on the water, literally. Okay, well, maybe not exactly on the water, but it's close enough. My parents went on a trip to Ocean City in the summer of 98, and my mom's water broke while playing with my baby brother in the sand, right where the small white-topped waves rested on the shore. I think I got the love of the water that day, as my parents won't stop talking about the one time we went to our local pool and I jumped in without knowing how to swim. I think they believed I was destined to become the next Michael Phelps or something. And although I don't think I achieved that, I did have one hobby, surfing. I rode my first wave when I was 14, and I haven't stopped doing it since. But what happened two years ago is making me consider not doing it anymore. <laughs> I bet you're confused. I'll do my best to explain. It all started one morning, the way it always does. My dad had made his homemade pancakes, and I was sitting at our kitchen table staring off into space when all of a sudden a big flop filled my ears, causing me to yelp and choke on one of my pancakes. I looked up and it was my brother Andrew. Happy birthday! Merry Christmas! I gave him a confused look, and he glanced down at the table while giving me a suppressed smirk. I looked down at the table and two tickets atop a magazine cover laid in front of me. At first confused, I looked a little harder and gasped. I stood up quickly looking at my brother. Shut up, Andrew. You didn't. I had to look down at the magazine again to confirm my suspicions. The magazine had a bright crystal blue ocean cover with some model walking toward the ocean in a white flowing dress. Best surf spot on the planet, the cover boldly read. That beach was no ordinary beach. It was a particular spot in the Bahamas that had some of the biggest and best waves you could possibly find. The only thing that I can think of that could be harder to find were reservations for that beach, as it was almost completely booked each summer. I bear-hugged my brother and started jumping up and down. My mom came down to see what was up. What's all the noise about? She asked, puzzled. She looked down at the table and saw the cover. Andrew, you didn't, she said, giving a disapproving look at him. My brother put up his hands in a disarming manner. What do you mean? He asked. She didn't look at him as she quickly stole a pancake from my father's plate and helped herself to the extras. I know you and your brother are excited for Matt's 21st, but I can't allow you two to go off into the Bahamas by yourselves. What are you even going to do? Uh, surf, said my brother looking at the floor. And then what? My mother said, this time looking at him with suspicious eyes. Nothing, my brother said, getting louder. Uh, you mean you're going to drink? My brother opened his mouth to say something, but my mom cut him off. Listen, honey, I know I look like a skeleton, but I was 21 years old too, believe it or not. Do you know what I would have done at your age if I was a... She continued, painting the air with her hands, pancake in one, fork in another beautiful sunny beach, bright ass sun and white sand. I would have drank and drank and drank, and I am as a responsible mother not letting you do that. My brother walked up to her and tried the oldest trick in the book. Oh, who said you looked like a skeleton, mom? Suppressing the urge to roll my eyes, I let him kiss my mom's ass for ten minutes before I had to step in. 
Uh, listen, Mom, I intervened. Please, I've, I've been dying to go to this beach forever since I was like 16. I, I promise I won't drink. I I'll be safe. But you have to let me go for my birthday, please. I had to bite my cheek to stop myself from laughing about how I was almost sounding like a seven-year-old. My mother sighed. I don't have to let you do anything. I looked down defeated and walked to the table and began to eat my pancakes. But like my cat sneaking into my room, she snuck up next to me. But if you promise to bring me back a pretty seashell, we've got a deal. I hugged my mom, thanking her the whole time. My birthday came three days later. I woke up around six or something. I never liked getting up this early, but today the excitement of the day gave me the energy needed to get packed. After meeting up with my brother and taking a trip to the Wawa for snacks, we started driving down the highway to the airport. The first twenty minutes was just bro-to-bro -bro talk, you know what I mean. But after a moment of silence, my brother turned to me almost laughing. <laughs> hey bro, look back there. I turned around and looked at the floor of the back seat. There was alcohol, and a lot of it, everything from Bud Light to vodka. I smiled. I knew I'd promised my mom, but what she didn't know wouldn't hurt her. Now at this point I'll skip past the boring airport stuff and the stuff that led to us getting on the plane. I had my switch and my phone to keep me company for the five or six hour flight to the Bahamas. As we got close, I could see the white beaches, the green trees and the white dots along the shore I assumed to be waves. I couldn't stop myself from smiling just thinking about that beach. After we landed, we met up with a few of Andrew's friends who planned to come along as well. It was a surprise for me, but I didn't really mind. We took two taxis, my brother and friends managing to all fit in one, and I was left to just take my own. My brother offered to come along, but I didn't mind. For the first ten minutes I was looking at my phone, minding my business when the driver said something. You know, I wouldn't go to that place if I were you, he said, not looking away from the road. At first I was confused, but I kind of just mumbled a, oh, really, while looking at my phone. He continued, yeah, man, heard stories, kids leave, uh, don't come back, rumored that they've seen things, don't know the specifics. Now, I'm the kind of person who, when they look at their phone, they tune the whole world out, so I didn't really process what he said, and gave another, oh, really, while looking at my phone. He didn't talk to me the rest of the way. I arrived at the beach. It was even better than I imagined. The rustic beach house was big and bright, and the beach, well, I'm just going to say it now, that beach makes you horny. I headed inside. The furniture was this tropical modern-esque design that I loved, and the ceilings were tall, and the air conditioning was the perfect contrast for the hot 90 degrees, 32 Celsius day that we were having. After unpacking and relaxing a bit, the day passed us, and I believe it was something around 7.30 or so. We had all arrived, unpacked, and were busy celebrating my 21st, and what better way to celebrate your 21st than with your brother, his friends, a white beach, and vodka. Of course, we all wanted to get some surfing in before the day was over, so we made sure not to overdo it. After hanging around, talking, laughing, enjoying the sunset, it was our last chance to get some waves in before the sun would rest. We all grabbed our boards and headed out. The waves were somewhat larger as the day started to end, and we all had a good time trying to outlast each other, doing tricks, failing most of them because, well, being slightly drunk, and overall having a blast. That's when this pretty large wave came in, much larger than we had seen before. We all had to ride it, so we all started paddling toward this mini behemoth. I lined myself up, got ready, and pushed up on my board, and for the first five seconds, it was pretty good. But that's when all hell broke loose. I remember it vividly. 
I heard someone scream to my left, and out of the corner of my eye I saw one of Andrew's friends get knocked off her board. And then the next, and the next, and then it was my turn. It felt like something out of a horror movie. Jaws, maybe. As this half-gray, half-black shark, with these piercing white eyes that stare you not in the face, but in the soul, and then back out again. It's something that words on a computer screen, a drawing, a video, could never do justice. Time felt like it slowed down as this thing whacked its tail, hitting me in the stomach, knocking the wind out of my body so hard I almost passed out from just that. The wave then hit me like a freight train, and if that wasn't enough, the force of it dragged me down like an anchor. I tumbled in the orange water, which quickly turned to this black, cold, icy thing that chilled me to the bone. For a moment, I thought that everything was okay. Then it happened. What I can only describe as several thick kitchen knives that had been dipped in magma pierced my body. The pain was torturous. I let out a cry of agony as the black water exploded with blood from multiple places like red food coloring and milk. I have absolutely no idea where I was, where the thing was, or where anybody else was. In that moment, I just wanted to die. As I hopelessly struggled in the water, that thing which at this point I assumed was the devil himself dragged me deeper into the darkness, and one more muffled cry escaped from my lips into the Atlantic. The world around me faded to a different kind of darkness. At this moment, I genuinely thought I was dead. I even somehow mustered up the thought of, well, I guess that's it. Anticlimactic, I agree, but I guess you know what my dying thoughts are. But for some reason, I didn't die. I didn't lose myself to the sea. I continued to go in and out of consciousness for God knows how long, the water getting darker and darker and the temperature getting colder and colder. And I suddenly came to. I was lying on what felt like cold stone, and every part of my body was begging me to just pass out again and die. But I used all my strength to stand up, each cell loudly complaining. I looked around. The first thing I noticed was that I wasn't dead, and I wasn't underwater anymore, or at least not in it. I almost passed out when I noticed that there were these thick, maybe six-inch circular holes in my body. Dried blood stained the outside. I managed to keep my shorts on, which is a small positive. That's when I noticed the big elephant in the room. This exit of this cave was a wall of water, and when I say that, I don't mean figuratively. I mean literally. Defying the laws of gravity, and probably another thing that I'm not thinking of, I walked over and touched it. It rippled just like normal water. If it wasn't for the ungodly pain and terrifying reality of this situation, it was actually quite pretty. I turned back around, and this large pool of water was there. I could see this shadow of a creature circling below. It suddenly got larger and jumped out of the water, nearly hitting me in the process. I jumped back, and it stopped and stared. That's when I think the most startling thing happened. So, the seal decides to come awake after he rudely entered my land. That's right. He spoke. Not just spoke but it was in this deep, dark, coarse voice that reminded me of a demon. I wish I had come back with some witty response, or just any response at all, but I just sat there, mouth agape like a dumb fool. He smiled. Shark got your tongue. I couldn't say anything. I just wanted to go home. I wanted to wake up or die, or anything other than be here. I could only think of one thing to say. Who are you? 
They call me Isren, he responded in a cocky manner. What do you want from me? I asked. He had to think on that for a moment before saying, I could just let you die here, starve you to death, or maybe eat pieces of you. But there is one thing that I need. What? I asked. I want you as a living proof that if you come to these waters in Bermuda, it may be a fatal choice. He gave another devilish smile that made my blood turn to ice. Before I could answer, I turned around and saw that the wall of water wasn't breaking physics and began to flood the cave rapidly. I sat and waited as it hit me, my body tumbling into darkness. Then through the darkness, a voice, a tiny one but nonetheless. I couldn't make it out, but it was someone yelling, then two, and finally I could see and hear again. Hey buddy, but buddy are you awake? Stay with me, blink twice if you can hear me. Hey, 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 we're losing him. I laid on what felt like the warm sandy beach as I walked before. I stared. I don't remember if it was the sea or sky, one of the two. I waited for death. It never came. My brother nor his friends made it out alive. The doctors said that the only explanation for my survival were angels. <laughs> I should have drowned or died of blood loss, or some combination of the two, but instead after a long list of surgeries and physical therapy, Last Christmas I walked for the first time. My mom blamed herself for what happened and is a changed woman. I've tried to get her to therapy, but she's refused. The beach obviously closed down after this. Last I've heard, nobody's been there since. I haven't fully recovered yet, but I hope I do. When I do, I'm not sure I will go back to surfing. I still love it but the thought of that happening again scares me. I don't know if that cave was real, but all I know is that I'm living proof that the waters in the Bahamas are dangerous and should be avoided. Last week, I was driving down Route 11 through rural Virginia late at night. Torrential rain was pounding on my windshield obscuring the road ahead. My wipers were working overtime just to let me see the barest amount of pavement, and I was moving slow enough that the needle of my speedometer was barely hovering past the ten. If the storm didn't let up soon, I would have to pull off to the side of the road and wait it out. I had just glanced down at the clock to see it was 12.37 in the morning when my front tires lost their grip on the asphalt. The car lurched violently to the right, and while I fought back against the inevitable spin, I felt myself quickly lose control of the vehicle. For a brief moment, terror's claws dug into my chest, and I knew that if anyone was coming up behind me on the road, they would slam into me. When my car hit the grass, I felt the tires catch, giving me hope that I was safe but I was immediately disabused of that notion when I continued farther off the highway and the back end of my vehicle suddenly dropped. I was jostled around in my seat, held in place only by the safety belt I was wearing, until everything was finally still. The car was angled upward, having fallen into the ditch, and despite my best efforts, I couldn't get it to move. I let out a furious curse and tried to center myself, working out in my head what I needed to do next. Reaching into my jacket pocket, I fished my phone out to call for help, but I couldn't get a signal. Wishing I'd brought a raincoat instead of my tiny travel umbrella, I grabbed it and stepped out of the car, bracing myself against nature's tirade as the storm beat the flimsy covering of my umbrella unrelentingly. Through the thick sheet of rain, I could just make out the shape of a house down a side street across the highway. 
I hurried toward it, abandoning my umbrella when I was halfway there, when a strong gust of wind blew it inside out. When I got closer, the form of the house became clearer, and I hesitated before continuing. Even though the rain was pounding down upon me, seeing the old rickety structure with broken windows and an ominous visage somehow made the prospect of braving the terrible weather seem like a less dangerous choice. A teeth-rattling crack of lightning shocked the reluctance out of me, and I rushed across the overgrown yard to the house. I rapped on the door as loudly as I could, hoping my knocking could be heard over the rumbling thunder. After waiting several minutes and still getting no response, I sighed and decided to try the place next door. This house looked even shabbier than the first, but I pressed forward and pounded on the front door. Again, nothing. The same thing happened at the following three homes I tried. I was rapidly losing hope of finding anyone to help me. It was as if the entire street had been abandoned. When I reached the sixth house on the street, I had run out of faith that the result would be any different. I didn't bother knocking very long or with much enthusiasm, and I'd already turned to leave when I heard the sound of a wood creaking behind me. Whirling back around, I peered into complete darkness, seeing no one there. Hesitantly, I pushed the door open farther, which happened to be open and called out to whomever might be lurking in the inky blackness of the house. Hello? Anybody there? I received no answer, so I tried again, this time louder. Hello? I I'm coming inside. I, I was in an accident, and I need to use your phone. Out of the shadows a pair of yellow, luminescent eyes appeared. A figure's dark silhouette slowly surfaced from the lightless sea, looming large in the claustrophobic room. It looked like the thing was hunched over, yet its head was still touching the ceiling. A raspy laugh escaped its throat, and I could see a set of sharp, jagged teeth in its slobbering maw. These are dangerous roads, the creature said, its voice deep and growling. I could feel it reverberating in my skull, as if bugs had bored their way into my brain. Come inside. Come. I can help you. But I couldn't move. Those monstrous eyes kept me pinned motionless, and like a coiled rattlesnake, I feared that if I stirred, it would pounce. When I finally found my voice, it was breathless and quavering. I, I, I think I'll be okay. The creature cackled and replied, <laughs> Oh, I don't think you will be. Adrenaline pumped through my veins, overtaking my terror and releasing me from the horrid thing's spell. I made a mad dash for the front door, but it slammed shut when I was just inches away from freedom. I could smell the fresh air disappear, and my nostrils became filled with the stench of decay. The room felt heavy and oppressively hot. You shouldn't go outside in weather like this, the creature warned, but the threat was in its voice, not in its words. I could no longer see the outline of its form, just those glowing yellow eyes. It's not safe. I, I, I need to get, to get back to my car. I stammered fearfully. I tried to swallow, but it got caught in my throat. Mm, forget about your car. I'll take good care of you. I'd unconsciously stuffed my hand into my jacket pocket, digging around for something, anything with which to defend myself. When my fingers perchance fell on my phone, I pulled it out and fumbled around on the screen until I was able to turn on its flashlight. I aimed it at the creature, and the bright beam cut through the darkness, illuminating it in a white glow. Oh, God, 
I muttered when I realized what I was looking at. The thing was disgustingly deformed, a massive heap of flesh twisted and gnarled like the trunk of an old dying oak tree. There were ligaments jutting out from its torso, attached to the broken, uneven floorboards that covered the room. It looked as if it was part of the house, a living cancerous tumor. The creature recoiled when the light hit it, but it had no arms that it could use to shield itself. Instead, it seemed to retract into its pulsating body, like a turtle going inside its shell. When I spun around to reach for the door, my flashlight revealed tendrils of flesh stretching across the surface. I kicked at them as the thing behind me howled with rage, until the door finally crashed open. I burst out into the storm, never daring to look back at that house as I heard the creature's bellowing lamentations. I ran as fast as I could, breathing in the fresh air and expelling the rot from my lungs. I didn't even bother checking to make sure no cars were coming before darting across the highway to my car. I leapt into the driver's seat, slammed the door behind me, and burst into tears. At some point I must have fallen asleep, because the next thing I remember was a loud clacking on my window. It startled me awake. For a moment, I thought the creature had somehow gotten out of that house, as those piercing yellow eyes had haunted my dreams. However, it was just a police officer standing there, bathed in flashing red, blue, and orange lights. You okay? The officer asked. Glancing out of the window, I saw the storm had cleared, and the stars were shimmering in the sky. I nodded and stepped out of my vehicle, noticing my hand was still shaking when I grabbed the handle. I, I, I'm all right. Got stuck in this ditch, I told him. I couldn't get a signal to call for help. Yeah, there's not much out on this stretch of road, he replied. I tried to find a phone to use in one of those houses, I said, nodding toward the street sign for Route 666 across the way. The officer shook his head. Nobody's lived down there for years. Everyone just sort of left one day, and nobody moved in. He seemed to study the abandoned street for a few moments before adding, Probably for the best. It gives me the creeps. My car was pulled out of the ditch and towed to the nearest garage to fix up the damage from the accident. When I finally got home, I felt an uneasiness about being in there alone. I kept picturing empty rooms with terrible creatures bursting through the floors and connecting to the walls and doors. All I wanted to do was go somewhere where people were so I could forget about these thoughts. It was a nice day, so I decided to head into town. I figured there would be plenty of people out and about going about their day and completely ignorant of what lay behind the walls of an empty house. Just as I was about to go out the door, I caught a whiff of something putrid. Turning around, my eyes darted across the room, but nothing looked out of the ordinary. The foul stench passed, and I chalked it up to my imagination, some leftover fear from my encounter. But... I noticed a slight bulge in one of my floorboards. It had been there for years, and I'd never paid it any mind. But now, I had to wonder if something might be growing beneath my house. <laughs> I'm not sure when Abe first got obsessed with Halloween, but I knew about it before we even started dating. I actually met him for the first time at a costume party. I was dressed as an apple. 
and by that I mean I wore a red dress and a green hat. I threw it together last minute, since my friend was the one dragging me to the party. Abe was dressed as a werewolf, stuck between a wolf and a man. The amount of effort he put into his costume was remarkable. He even walked like a halfling and howled at incoming party guests. Something drew us together. Maybe it was our mutual hatred of candy corn, or the way we would both down five beers without blinking. Whatever it was, it led to a first date, and within seven months, we were engaged. The thing I loved most about Abe was his ambition. He was a business major with plans on starting his own company. He would design and produce Halloween-themed goods for haunted houses. He explained that more and more ordinary people were opening up their homes in the spirit of a good scare, and he wanted to support that by making unique and frightening products. Plus, he dreamed of having his own haunted house someday. It wasn't my cup of tea, but I adored his passion. We were married in May and pregnant by June. Abe decided to use his savings to buy us a nice little house right outside the city. The neighborhood was full of families and right next to an elementary school. Our neighbors were Paula and Jake, a wonderful young couple with two small children. We bonded with them right away. All seemed fine, except for one thing, Dirk. Dirk lived to the right of us. He was a white man in his mid-fifties who took one look at our biracial family and nearly had a conniption. When he saw us walking or working in the yard, he would give the Nazi salute and a belly laugh as if it were the funniest thing he'd ever done. It wasn't just us he tortured. No one in the neighborhood liked him. He would leave his poor dog outside in the rain all day, chained roughly to his porch. His wife was a small woman who endured a vast vocabulary of insults day and night. If a kid's ball flew into his yard, he made a point to pick it up and carry it inside. It was almost like he tried to do anything possible to make himself hated. But oddly, there was a one-day exception to his cruelty, and that was Halloween. Our first year in the neighborhood, we got to experience Dirk's haunted house. Abe had been longingly planning one of his own, but it was simply out of our budget this year. So when we found out our loudmouth racist neighbor had one, we were more than a little shocked. We were having coffee with Paula and Jake on a cold October day when we heard about the event. He does it every year, Jake said, juggling their two-year-old and nearly spilling a teapot. It's his thing. But do you go? Abe asked, confused. <laughs> of course, Paula laughed. It's the one time of year when the man's demeanor actually changes and matches the occasion. Plus, it's genuinely scary in there. He must work on the props all year, and he never uses the same thing twice. Paula and I were nervous to go at first, Jake admitted. But literally everyone in the neighborhood shows up. People even let their kids in there, and you know I wouldn't let either of mine near his house. It's just like Halloween is his thing or something. He can be as evil as he wants to, and it just works. Abe and I were still a little scared, and not in a good way, of Dirk's haunted house. But we decided to go and at least judge for ourselves. We got to the door and Dirk's wife was standing outside handing out tickets. She took one look at my pregnant belly and shook her head. No, not for you, she said in a shaky, off-kilter tone. Why? Too scary. Not want to risk the baby. She handed Abe a ticket and shooed me away with her fingers. Don't worry, hon, I'll go in and tell you how it is, he said kindly. I'm sure it's terrible anyway. So I went home. I was more than a little disappointed, but being scared wasn't really my thing anyway. Abe came home around an hour later. He was frowning and looked awful. Babe, how was Dirk's house? His demeanor didn't change as he slumped down on the couch. 
In a sad, almost hurtful voice, he replied, It was incredible. Surprised, I urged him to tell me more. He had an entire room where blood poured out from the walls. Animatronic ghosts jumped out at you when you least expected it. There was an empty cradle with a trail of blood. It was a perfect mixture of disturbing and downright scary. The best part was the only time you actually had to interact with Dirk was when he was playing a torture victim. Watching him scream was rather satisfying. But it didn't make up for the fact that this jerk, this guy who is basically the epitome of all things evil, is better at Halloween than I am. Sweetie, I laughed, I know you love Halloween, but just because Dirk makes a good haunted house doesn't make him better than you. Next year I'm sure you'll knock it out of the park. He gave me a small smile, and I thought the matter was over. But it wasn't. Abe talked constantly about the perfection of Dirk's haunted house. He would make guesses at how things were put together. He spent his free time building prototypes to mimic Dirk's props, or even improve upon them. This went on for months. A huge animatronic witch had taken over our living room. Robotic spiders prowled the hallway. The only room he didn't touch was the nursery. But soon we had a little one to occupy our time. Ophelia, Fee for short, was born in March. She was absolutely perfect. She was born with a full head of curly black hair. Maybe I had a bias, but I honestly had never seen anything more beautiful than an infant. I loved her from the instant I held her in my arms. Abe was no different. We doted on our baby girl as much as possible. Abe was an excellent father. I loved watching the two of them interact. Abe was so gentle with her. His only flaw was his continued obsession with the haunted house. When he wasn't at work or playing with Fee, he was designing for the perfect Halloween house. When October came, Abe was feverish with excitement. The plan, make a haunted house like nothing anyone had ever seen. Not only would it be scary while you were inside, but the fear would last for nights afterwards. He wanted to really freak people out, cause nightmares, make his exhibit unforgettable. I believed he could do it. With his imagination and engineering background, anything was possible. He started to advertise his haunted house a week or so before Halloween. I think his goal was to get as many people there as possible. He left flyers in people's mailboxes, even under their windshield wipers. He even left one for Dirk. But that was a massive mistake. No sooner had he dropped the flyer off than Dirk was banging on our front door. Abe was still out flyering, but I greeted Dirk as politely as I could. Hello, Dirk, I said civilly. What the heck is this? He screamed through my screen door. In his hand was one of Abe's flyers. Keep your voice down. I turned around to check on Fee, who was gurgling sleepily in her swing. Before I knew what was happening, Dirk burst through the screen door and had his arm around my neck. Your husband thinks he can take over. In my neighborhood. My territory. His arm dug into my throat. Please, Dirk, you're hurting me. Tears fell down my cheeks. I was all alone. I knew Dirk was a bully, but I didn't know he could be this dangerous. I could do much worse to you. He pushed me onto the floor and stood over me. You tell your husband that if he goes through with the haunted house, I'll kill him. No, no, I'll kill you first. Then your little abomination over there. And I'll make him watch. He spat at my face. No one crosses me. With that, he slammed the front door and left me on the ground, sobbing. Fee had woken up and was crying as well. Shakily, I got to my feet and called Abe. He told me to call the police, but I was too scared. Dirk was a violent man. I just sat on the floor rocking Fee until Abe came home. 
He did everything to make me feel safer. He wrapped us up in blankets and made me hot chocolate. With hurt in his voice, he pleaded me to call the police. I don't want to make it worse, I said softly. But he's just a bully, a racist jerk. I looked him in the eye. You have to promise me you won't do a haunted house this year. Abe's mouth fell open. Come on, that means he wins. I don't care what it means. I don't want that man anywhere near us. Abe shook his head. This haunted house means the world to me. I glared at him. More than me? More than Fee? He didn't say anything. Instead, he kissed my forehead and stroked Fee's cheek. I could see in his face that he regretted what he said. It was so hurtful. But I knew it came from a place of pain, not cruelty. I put Fee in her crib and went to bed. Abe kissed me deeply. He stroked my hair and whispered that everything would be okay. I felt confident that it was all over. I wish I had been right. But in those blissful hours of sleep, I had forgotten the violent monster that was our neighbor. By the time we woke up, Abe made a self-care plan for me. He would buy me a few nights at a hotel over Halloween. That way, I would feel safer and free from Dirk. He said he would stay home and take care of Fee. Although I was nervous to leave, Abe convinced me that it would be the best for everyone. He would keep an eye on the house and make sure nothing sinister went on with Dirk. I begged Abe to come with me. He explained that having the baby around might cause extra anxiety for me. Plus, I deserved a few days to relax. Reluctantly, I left my family for Halloween weekend. I have to admit, it was a wonderful hotel. It had a full spa, swimming pool, salon, and even a five-star restaurant. My first day, I took advantage of everything. The massages and bubble baths did quite a bit to help ease my fear. I wrapped myself in a fluffy robe and ordered room service. It was pure luxury. I called Abe a little after five. He said everything was fine. Dirk hadn't bothered him at all. He even let me talk to little Fee, who was babbling into the phone. I giggled. I was so blessed. Abe told me to just take care of myself and come home tomorrow once Halloween was over. On Halloween morning, I awoke in a cushy bed, covered in delicate blankets, feeling incredible. My night had been full of dreams of Dirk moving away. I stayed in my bed leisurely until I got hungry. I wandered down to the restaurant and treated myself to the largest waffle I'd ever seen. Then I spent the afternoon getting my nails done. I felt great. Around four, I called Abe to check in, but he didn't answer. I figured maybe he was running an errand. I went back to my room and called again at 4.30. Still, no answer. My chest got tight. It wasn't like Abe not to answer the phone. I called again at 4.45. Still no answer. I started to panic. I called Paula and Jake. Paula answered. Hey, what's up? She sounded surprised to hear me. I was wondering if you might be willing to go over and check on Abe and Fee. He isn't answering the phone and, and I'm getting worried. She laughed. I just saw him. He's fine. I breathed a long sigh of relief. Thank God, Paula. I was just so scared. The only thing to be scared of is your house, Paula chuckled. Sounds like it's opening up soon. I paused. What are you talking about? Your house, Paula said, confused. Abe's been working on it all weekend. It looks amazingly creepy. Your guy is definitely going to beat Dirk this year. I began to hyperventilate. This couldn't be true. Paula, listen to me closely. Are you saying Abe is putting a haunted house up? Yes. Paula probably thought I was insane. Is everything okay? I tried to respond, but the phone fell from my hand. I could hear Paula talking on the other end, but I couldn't handle it. Abe had broken my trust. He had gone behind my back. He had endangered us. 
Who knew what Durr could do to him? Chafi. Without a word, I gathered my things, hanging up on a concerned Paula. I left the hotel without checking out. I had to get home as soon as possible. The streets were full of people in costumes. There was a ton of traffic. I anxiously waited for the lights to churn green. A man on the street started screaming, and I nearly rear-ended the car in front of me. I was completely on edge. Too many people who looked dead. Too many monsters. I tried to go as fast as I could, but it took me over an hour to get home. When I arrived, I barely recognized the house. Abe had transformed the entire outside of it into a ramshackle hovel. He used broken boards to construct a facade covering the front. Out of one window hung a very realistic-looking body, which twitched when the wind hit it. There was a large sign by the door painted in red. Come in, but don't expect to come out. <laughs> I watched as some of our neighbors entered the house, giggling in fear. Abe was nowhere to be seen. Terrified, I parked the car and went inside. The first thing I heard was a baby crying. It didn't sound like Fee, but the noise unnerved me. I could hear screams from other people in the house. Abe had removed all our things and replaced every single room with disturbing imagery. The front hall was padded in something that looked like breathing flesh. The living room was the scene of a suicide. A man lay on the floor, surrounded by paper. The paper was littered in the scribbles of a madman. On the walls were more ramblings, but these included the names of people in the neighborhood. I checked to see if the man on the floor was Abe, but thank God he wasn't. I had no idea who it was, but it definitely wasn't a mannequin. The dining room was covered in creepy dolls. Some of them moved unexpectedly. One even reached out, and I swear it grabbed my hair. I don't know how Abe made them, but they were so disturbing. One of the dolls kept taking off her dress and putting it back on. She had deep red between her legs. I ran into the next room, which was the kitchen. It was a butcher shop. Slabs of meat were tossed across the floor. Everything was rotting. Flies and rats feasted on the remains. The fridge was shaking as though someone were inside. I screamed, Abe! Abe, come out right now! But no one responded. A group of young girls rushed by me, shrieking with frightful delight. I bit my lip and climbed the stairs toward the bedroom. I was done. Abe had gone too far. He had ruined our house. I finally got upstairs and heard someone throwing up in the bedroom. I walked in and saw the bedroom was basically untouched. I stepped cautiously, knowing that any minute something scary might pop up. The large witch Abe had created was sitting on the bed, but she wasn't plugged in. That's when I noticed Jake throwing up on the floor. I approached him slowly. Jake, are you? When he saw me, he jumped up and grabbed my shoulders. His eyes were crazy. <laughs> get out, he yelled. G get, out, get outside now. I shook him off. So you're part of this crap storm too? I realized he was crying. No, J just please go outside. Paula called the police. I don't know what happened. We can't find Abe. A dead cold spread through my body. What happened? I demanded. Please, go outside and wait for the police. That's when I heard the group of girls start to scream. They were in the room across from the bedroom, the nursery. Any control I had left was gone. I ran from Jake into the next room. Fee's crib was in the middle of the floor. The scene was pure white except for the mobile that hung above her head. Instead of planes that usually hung there, there was a noose. Attached to the noose was the dead body of a baby slowly twirling. 
I clutched my chest. It couldn't be. It had to be fake. The corpse spun just a little further, and I saw the face. Her face. My beautiful Ophelia, hanging like a bloated maggot from the rope. Her skin was parchment white. There was no blood on her, just vomit and deep marks where she was bound. I fell backward. Something deeply human inside of me howled. Jake was suddenly beside me, trying to help, but I threw him back. Dirk had gotten his revenge. Tears welled up, but I refused to let them fall. I stormed out of the house. I knew Dirk had Abe as well. I would stop whatever sick, twisted thing he was doing to my husband. Jake kept calling for me to stop, but I only had eyes to the house next door. I had no fear. I ran past his tiny wife who looked terrified at me. I didn't flinch at the jump scares or gross decor inside his house. I would find him. Dirk, I whistled menacingly. I'm coming for you. I don't know what the inside looked like. I didn't care. I had one mission, to find the monster who did that to my daughter. It only took me a few minutes to find Dirk on the lawn, prowling in an insect costume. When he saw me, his eyes fired with rage. You, he hissed. I told you not to let your... Husband, I finished for him, grabbing the shovel next to his house. Not to let my black husband make a haunted house. You're such a pathetic sack of crap that you care more about this one thing than about my child's life. His rage subsided into confusion. I... No, you don't get to talk. I don't know where I got the strength, but I lifted the shovel and clocked him in the jaw. He fell to the ground with a satisfying bang. You are a monster, you know that? I kicked him in the stomach. After I find out what you did to my husband, I'll kill you. He moaned in pain. Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. No? I slammed him again and again in the stomach. You truly are an insect. I hovered the heel of my shoe over his left eye and pressed down. His eyeball popped like a grape. He was now screaming. Pain is too good for you. I'll make you wish you had never spoken a word to my family. Jake ran onto the scene. He was flanked by Paula and two police officers who had their guns drawn. Paula took Jake's hand in fear. Jake started talking in a soft tone. Honey, you need to come with us. I turned to them, finally letting the tears out of my eyes. You saw what he did? my baby. Jake was crying too. No, you don't understand. I understand that he strangled Fee until her little heart stopped beating. My hands were in fists. Jake turned to Paula, who took over. Honey, Dirk didn't kill her. My body was shaking so much I nearly fainted. He, he did. He killed her, and he probably killed Abe too. I just can't find him yet. He threatened me last week. He told me he would do this. I don't know anything about last week, but we know he didn't hurt Ophelia. Paula moved towards me, lifting a gentle hand. Abe turned himself in twenty minutes ago. What? The world suddenly stood still. I couldn't hear anyone crying or screaming. It was just quiet. The words hung in the air, inaudible. I could almost see them, touch them. Abe. When I came back to reality, I had been handcuffed by one of the officers. Paula was trying to speak to me as they led me away. I couldn't understand. Nothing made sense. Paula began to yell. 
Please, don't take her to the station. Let her stay with us. She's grieving. She doesn't know. But they took me to the station anyway. I was arrested for disorderly conduct. After taking my statement, they decided to let me back to Paula and Jake's. They held me as I cried. They held my hands as I screamed. And finally, after hours and hours, they tucked me into bed to let me sleep. If it weren't for them, I might have ended my life that night. I'm still staying with them now as their full-time nanny. We've kind of created a new little family for ourselves. And we don't celebrate Halloween. In some rare speck of humanity, Dirk didn't press charges against me. I think he almost respected me for what I had done. He wears an eye patch now and never speaks to me. But when he sees me, he lifts his chin in admiration. The violence I enacted made me more like him. I don't like to think about it. I saw Abe twice after that, once at his trial where he was sentenced to 35 years in prison for the murder of our daughter. When the judge asked him about that night, he spent hours in joyful description of building the house and setting up the scenes. He exclaimed that he had officially won. His was the best haunted house anyone had ever seen, and Ophelia had been the linchpin to secure his victory. A month before the trial, I requested a meeting with him. His lawyers strongly objected to it, but he made the final choice. I went to the prison where he was being held. He sat behind a thick wall of glass. He looked terrible. I wasn't sad about it. I lifted the receiver and pressed it to my ear. He did the same. We sat in silence for many minutes. Then, finally, in as strong a voice as I could muster, I asked, Why? He looked away from me. Isn't it obvious? When his eyes slid back into place, there was something crazy in them. His forlorn look morphed into a sinister smile. I held my breath. All he said was, <laughs> I loved Halloween more than I loved you. My neighbor brought over some baby shoes the other day. They were pink and had glitter on the toes and sequined flowers on the sides. We cooed over them for a few minutes and I told her how much I appreciated the gift. <sighs> After she left, I threw them in my bedroom closet with all the other baby junk I've been given over the past six months. Six months ago, Everyone in town started to ask about my baby. I do not have a baby. I have never given birth or even been pregnant. I thought that I was being mistaken for someone else. I'm not particularly unique looking. Maybe some other short, dark-haired and hazel-eyed girl gave birth recently. But I am shy by nature and southern by birth, so I was too polite to say, You're wrong. You have the wrong person. I don't have a baby. I said things like, Um, oh, okay. Mostly because it must have been a case of mistaken identity. People brought over baby clothes, a crib, a swing that plugs into the wall and jiggles, toys and shoes and diapers. A very weird situation to be in for sure. But then, to put it plainly, things got weirder. I was in a grocery store, and the manager, a friendly old man, came up to me and asked about my sweet little girl. He asked if she would like the different formula he had suggested, and if I wanted more. <laughs> I just smiled. When I got home, I found a formula in my grocery bags and an almost empty can in my cabinet. 
I didn't even remember putting it in my cart. The thing is, everyone has been so nice to me, and the situation is just so odd that I started to go along with it. How's the little darling today? A neighbor would ask when I went to get the mail. Oh, she's wonderful, sleeping through the night, I'd answer. Then a young woman that got coffee at the same place as me asked about a play date with her nine-month-old and my then five-month-old. I sort of blew it off. Next time I saw her, though, she talked about setting up another play date and how much fun our two darlings had. She showed me a picture on her phone. Aren't they just precious in this picture? Your little girl has the most beautiful blue eyes. Her dress really makes them pop. I'll text this to you. I looked at the picture and saw a chubby baby in a red shirt and blue shorts. It had dark hair and dark eyes. It was the only baby in the picture. I went home and opened my bedroom closet full of baby junk. I pulled out teddy bears and an unopened box with a changing table in it. I pulled out a shopping bag with a few baby clothes. I dumped it out on my bed and looked through them. I found a light blue dress. A few weeks ago, I decided to call my mom. Hello? She answered. Mom, it's me. I said. Oh, Pearl, hi. How are you? I asked. We don't talk often. I'm good. We're all good out here. She paused, then asked, How are you two doing? Us two? I asked, hesitantly. Now, don't act like that. I know I haven't been in touch, but I do care about you and my grandbaby. She said sourly. I, I know, Mom. Uh, oh, uh, she's she's crying. Uh, I got to go. I lied. Give Holly my love, she said, and then hung up before I did. The funny thing is, Breakfast at Tiffany's has been my favorite book since I was a kid. I'd always thought Holly would be a great name for a kid I would eventually have. I went into my room to put my phone down after my short conversation with my mom. The changing table and the crib were neatly set up by the window. I didn't do that. I'm sure I didn't. I walked over to the crib and looked inside. (sighs) Nothing was there. I walked over to the changing table, then took a step back before I bumped my shin against one of the legs, because I remembered that I had done that before. I looked down and saw a bruise on my skin. I know I hit it against the changing table, but I also know that they weren't in here before. I know it. How's Holly today? My neighbor across the street asked. We were both out grabbing our mail. She's good, happy as ever, I said. I heard her screaming up a storm when you came home last night. I'd be surprised if you were able to get her to bed at all. (laughs) Once she lays down, It usually doesn't take too long, I replied. I went inside and looked through my mail. A bunch of junk, a few red envelopes. I put everything down on the kitchen table and opened a cabinet to get out a cup. I heard some noises coming from my room. I paused and listened. I didn't hear anything for a minute, so I grabbed the cup and got some water from the sink. I heard something over the sound of the tap. (sighs) Holly must be awake. I went into my room and looked down in the crib. 
Holly's stuffed elephant was in the crib. I reached down and picked it up. It was cute. No wonder someone got that for Holly. I put the elephant back down in the crib and brought the cup to my mouth to take a sip. I realized I was holding a baby bottle. (laughs) Mom brain, I thought. Where did I put that cup down? But then, I saw I was holding my cup. I'm, I'm not a mom. What the hell was I just thinking? I looked back over the crib. Why do I still have this crap in my room? I kicked the crib. Then, I kicked it again. Then, again, until the wood began to splinter. I pushed the changing table over to the side. I opened my closet and shoved in the pieces of the crib and any other baby-related item I could find. I slammed the door closed. I can't keep this charade up, I decided. I can't go along with this nonsense anymore. I went to get coffee this morning. I was so tired. I felt like I hadn't slept all night. The barista smiled at me. Your kid keep you up? She asked. No, I said firmly. Her smile wavered. I sat down at a table to drink my coffee. Some woman walked up to me. She asked how I was doing. How my daughter was doing. I'm fine, I answered, and left it at that. She sat down at the table and in a hushed and concerned voice, she asked me if I was experiencing any depression. She said that new mothers often feel like this. I'm not a new mother, I said. A man came in and walked quickly up to the table. He bent down and whispered something in my ear. It didn't register at first. What? I asked. You left your kid in her car seat, in her car, he said again. I jumped up and ran outside. I unlocked my car and opened the back seat. How could I be so stupid? How screwed up am I to leave my kid in the car? But nothing was there. No kid, no car seat. I drove home. I sat on my bed and looked through the pictures on my phone. I looked at the picture of the chubby kid in the red shirt. I stared at it. Where is she? Where is Holly? There's only one kid in this picture, but everyone else says there are two. Chubs and my little Holly, bright blue eyes, blue dress. She does look so pretty in that blue dress. I do have a bit more to write, but Holly just started to cry. I... I need to go check on her. Liam was the believing type but even more so than your average third grader. Most kids at his age believed in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, but Liam found those tales foolish and irrelevant, fictional characters conjured up to draw young hearts and minds into holidays. Liam surmised that his faith could only lie with a single idol, like an agnostic questioning which deity out of Yahweh, Allah, and Buddha could be the true god, Liam knew that there could only be one authentic holiday totem. There couldn't exist both Santa and a tooth fairy. There could only be one. And for Liam, the one in question was the Pumpkin King. Down the road from Liam's house was a pumpkin patch that stretched on toward the horizon below which the sun dipped each and every evening. This, Liam believed, was where his holiday deity arose to reward his disciples young and old. 
The night on which this happened was All Hallows Eve, of course. Now, Liam knew in his heart that this Pumpkin King was the one true idol, just as any tiny tot with their eyes all aglow knew that Santa would slide down the chimney with his bag of goodies on Christmas Eve. But the kids at school fought Liam to be asinine for his childlike beliefs. And just like the world's religions where believers of talking serpents poke fun at believers of winged horses, the grade school believers of flying reindeer and Christmas elves jeered at Liam for his devotion to a pumpkin god. When are you going to stop believing in that stupid pumpkin? Hey Liam, watch me carve the pumpkin king's face. Santa's real, my parents told me, but my parents said the pumpkin king isn't real. On his two-mile walk home, the school's fifth-grade bullies, Frankie, Tyler, and Aspen, waited patiently for Liam to walk under the arched stone bridge. When Liam emerged from under it, he was greeted by a shower of cold and slimy pumpkin guts that rained down on his head, immediately followed by sounds of devilish snickering. Word spread through the small South Carolina town that little Liam Henson believed in the occult and would be spending Halloween night in a pumpkin patch awaiting his pagan deity, a notion that was met with judgmental stares and virtue-signaling gossip from those Bible Belt dwellers. And soon, Liam's parents stopped receiving invitations to local church functions. His older sister was shunned at school, believed to be some sort of witch who, like her brother, bowed to heathen idols. The afternoon of Halloween soon arrived. The classroom was thoroughly decorated for the occasion. Paper cut-out jack-o'-lanterns were strung together with yarn and tacked to a corked staff on the wall. A large black cat cut-out was pasted to the classroom door, and a jack-o'-lantern bowl filled with candy sat atop the teacher's desk. None of the decorations in school dared echo anything to do with witches or goblins or vampires or devils something which would have drawn judgment from more than a few sets of parents. Liam's school held a trick-or-treating event within its walls. Costumed children lined up outside each classroom to receive their treats. Liam, of course, dressed as a pumpkin. He received the usual jeers from his classmates. If they weren't making fun of his devotion to the Pumpkin King, they were laughing at the fact that the pumpkin costumes were normally reserved for an infant's first Halloween. It was not until Liam was kindly asked to refrain from the school-wide trick-or-treating, however, that he became most distraught. Liam, I think it's best you hang out in Principal Revis' office for an hour, his teacher Miss Volske said. He hated her with a passion. Why? Liam asked innocently. Because. Liam hated her for that, the way she'd never give a real answer. She acted as if she was the all-powerful overlord upon which the righteousness of rules rested. But she was only part of the problem. The bigger issue was that Liam was a believer among non-believers, at least when it came to his pumpkin king. These Bible thumpers just wouldn't have it. The Easter Bunny and Santa Claus were fine to them. They were the mascots for Christian holidays, and were thus virtuous and pure. To them, the Pumpkin King was equal in nature to the god Pan, upon which their Satan character's appearance was based. And so Liam sat and seethed and stewed in the principal's office. Principal Revis offered him candy from the bowl on his desk. As Liam pathetically chewed on a piece of caramel, he thought of how much better the other kids had it in terms of quality and quantity of candy. It made his blood boil to think of it, of how those commonplace zombies were rewarded for their lack of original thinking. Excuse me, I hope I'm not interrupting anything, Miss B, the school counselor said, who entered the room with a firm knock on the already opened door. Not at all. Principal Revis replied. Have a seat. Oh, God. Liam knew what this meant. Miss B was about to counsel him. Even at his age, Liam thought it to be a useless position that could be handled by anyone and everyone. Miss B sat down across from Liam, next to Principal Revis. 
As Miss B adjusted her hair, Liam caught Revis's eyes wandering down toward her tights covered legs. Such hypocrisy. Now Liam, said Miss B in her thick southern accent, talking to Liam in a most passively degrading manner. We wanted to talk to you today about certain things you've been saying around school. Okay, said Liam uninterested. Liam, do you know what the word gossip means? Yes, Liam replied. There was a pause. Miss B was waiting for an answer. Go on then, tell me. It means to go around saying things that aren't true. That's right. Well, that's sort of what this is about, Liam. There was another pause as Miss B stared Liam down with demeaning puppy dog eyes. Okay, said Liam amidst the awkward stare. I hear you've been going around school talking about a thing called the Pumpkin King. Is that true? Yes. Why? Because it's almost Halloween, and every Halloween the Pumpkin King comes out of the pumpkin patch and gives presents to all his believers. Now, that's not really true though, is it? Yes, it is. Liam, there's no such thing as a pumpkin king. Are you a God-fearing woman? Miss B was taken aback, and this was twofolds. Not only had young Liam turned the questioning on to her, but he was also asking an intelligent question, intelligent for his age. She couldn't tell whether he was that mature in intellect or if he was just repeating something he'd heard an adult say. I, uh... Miss B stammered. Yes, I believe in God. Go to church twice a week. Leon grimaced at how she pronounced the word twice. And do you believe this story about the snake in the garden? Of course. First story in the Bible. Is a talking snake in a garden less crazy than a talking pumpkin in a patch? Well, Liam, it's important that you understand the difference. The Bible's the word of God. <sighs> this was going nowhere. Liam quit and spent the rest of the session staring at the wall as Miss B rattled off about Baptist drivel and quotes about dishing dirt that she picked up at a help site for counselors. She is a child, Liam thought, unlightened, uneducated. Evening soon came, and there was Liam's older sister, Tara, wearing her glittery witch costume. She scolded him for his stupid beliefs that had garnered her so much flack in school and around town. I swear to God, she said, if I hear one more word from you about this stupid pumpkin king, I'm going to drop you off in the cemetery overnight. But Liam would not be spending the night in a cemetery. He'd be spending it in the pumpkin patch near his house. Tonight was the night, and it made him grin. All the torments, the virtue-signaling righteous fanatics, the bullying, the harsh words, the neglect. <laughs> it would all pay off this chilly Halloween. Liam left the house, but unlike the hordes of children walking the earth that evening, Liam was not in a costume. He wore jeans and had on a fur coat to keep warm once the sun fully set. His lack of a costume drew confused stares from adults who were handing out candy. The other children were too busy gobbling down chocolate to notice. Liam cut through several yards as he made his way to the patch. If he hurried, he'd be able to catch the reddish-orange sunset in its full glory. As he walked among swirling hordes of dead autumn leaves, he saw something out of the corner of his eye that he hoped was just his imagination, but it wasn't. He saw them clear as day. Frankie, Tyler, and Aspen, the three bullies, were standing on the side of someone's house. They saw Liam, too, who was obviously walking off towards the pumpkin patch. In this moment, Liam wished he hadn't run off at the mouth so about the Pumpkin King. The three bullies seemed to freeze in place as their hawk-like eyes tracked Liam's every step. Going to see the pumpkin man? One of them shouted it. 
Liam wasn't sure which one. This was bad. They surely wouldn't pass up a chance to get Liam alone in a pumpkin patch. Liam began to picture his head covered in pumpkin guts yet again. Liam kept on walking, avoiding eye contact with his three tormentors. He could still feel the weight of their eyeballs against his back though, but he didn't dare look back as it might have further provoked them. Liam arrived in the pumpkin patch at exactly the time he'd hoped. The sun was halfway below the horizon, and it gleamed a reddish glow that turned the sky around it pink. Liam perched atop a massive pumpkin and watched the sun set. Before he knew it, the sun was gone, giving way to a starry night sky that was complete with a bright orange harvest moon. The air was chilly now, and Liam's teeth slightly chattered as the wind glided over the back of his neck. The occasional sound of a solitary wind-blown leaf bouncing off of a nearby pumpkin would fill Liam with a small sense of hope. Each time it happened, he yearned that the sound was produced by the Pumpkin King's arrival. Still, Liam did have some current satisfaction at the fact that the three bullies hadn't shown up to torment him. At least, not yet. Nevertheless, Liam kept his eyes peeled for the fiends. The moon ascended to its peak in the sky. It must have been about eight o'clock by now, and the trick-or-treaters were likely heading inside, typical of a Halloween night that fell on a weekday, but Liam was still out under the night sky. He was a patient boy, and he'd wait until his idol showed up. The rustling in the foliage nearby alerted Liam. He sat up and listened. The rustling sound was not far off. Was it the Pumpkin King? Liam surely hoped. Boo! Liam nearly fell off the pumpkin he was sitting on. Just as he'd feared, Frankie, Tyler, and Aspen had reared their fiendish faces in his pumpkin patch. Has the Pumpkin King shown up yet? Frankie jeered. He was the ringleader, and right now he looked especially out for blood. Each of the three brutes held massive bags of candy, probably stolen off some younger kids. No comment, Frankie persisted. Bite me, Liam said. And in this moment, it was as if a bomb had detonated. Liam wasn't entirely sure of what he'd thought had actually exited his mouth. It was clear from the astonished faces around him that he indeed had said it. What did you just say? asked Aspen. Liam took a deep breath. I said... Liam still could not believe this was coming out of his mouth. Bite me. Frankie snorted out a menacing laugh. <laughs> wow, he said. Even after all this time, you still don't get it. What are we going to do to him? Tyler sneered. Hmm... Frankie pondered. Liam sat atop the pumpkin, trying to look as calm as possible. His fingers nervously twitched by his side, and he hoped they didn't see. Any sign of weakness was like blood in the water to guys like this. He wasn't sure how he was going to get out of this jam. I know! Those words alone uttered from Frankie's mouth sent chills through Liam's entire body. He likes pumpkins so much, let's stuff him inside one. Grab him! Before Liam could budge, Tyler and Aspen grabbed his arms tight and yanked him off the pumpkin. This one's perfect, said Frankie as he pointed to a large pumpkin. Tyler, you got a knife? Right here. Tyler pulled a large sheathed hunting knife and tossed it to Frankie. Frankie pulled the knife out of its sheath slowly, as if he were some middle-aged swordsman, grinning wildly. Perfect, Frankie exclaimed as he approached the large pumpkin. Move. Frankie waved his hand wildly. Like houseflies, Tyler and Aspen parted from the large pumpkin, 
Liam in hand. Frankie knelt down in front of a massive pumpkin and viciously stuck the knife into its belly, ripping a gash right down the middle. The manner in which he stabbed it would cause one to imagine Frankie as a future serial killer. Ah, yeah, said Frankie as he hacked away at the pumpkin's flesh. Tyler and Aspen nodded and snickered as they watched Frankie carve away. Eventually, Frankie had carved a large opening in the pumpkin, just big enough for a human body to be shoved into, but tight enough so that it could be taken out. Frankie gawked at Liam with those crazed eyes, looking quite proud of his work. And now, said Frankie, we insert our little pumpkin lover. Good luck pulling yourself out, freak. Tyler and Aspen yanked Liam toward the opening of the pumpkin, but they didn't have to use much force, which seemed to puzzle them. Liam was being curiously cooperative, and the fear had all but faded from his face. What's the matter with you? asked Tyler, getting right up in Liam's face. At least scream a little. Cry for help. Something. Tyler and Aspen came to a screeching halt. They scrutinized Liam's unbelievably calm features, trying to make sense of it. Aren't you scared? Aspen asked. Go ahead, cry for mom. <laughs> she won't hear you when your ass is inside this pumpkin. Liam's relaxed demeanor persisted, but the three bullies also persisted. Tyler jabbed at Liam's shoulder with his fingertips. Cry for help. He jabbed again, repeating his command. But Liam did nothing, not even a flinch. The hell's going on? Frankie asked in complete bafflement. Is he tripping? Liam wasn't going to give these little sadists the satisfaction. Suddenly, all the air from Liam's lungs exited his mouth in a single burst as Aspen's fist smashed the sweet spot on Liam's gut. Cry for help, repeated Tyler as he too punched Liam, this time in the ribs. But Liam stayed defiant. Frankie, meanwhile, looked to be growing impatient. Move, Frankie said as he approached Liam. Frankie raised the knife and Liam felt his eyes widening on their own accord. Frankie grabbed the back of Liam's neck and knelt down in front of him so that the two were face to face. He brought the tip of it up to Liam's chin, holding it but a hair's breadth away. Cry for help, Liam commanded. Then suddenly, a change in the wind. No one could quite put a finger on it, but the atmosphere shifted. A new presence made itself apparent in the pumpkin patch, but as yet wasn't seen. And just about every kid who ever had been bullied would have relished the way Frankie's eyes slowly began to fill up with fear. They widened as Liam's mouth slowly formed into a sadistic grin. No, said Liam. You cry for help. Frankie leaped to his feet and held the knife at the ready. He looked panicked, his head rapidly turning in all directions like that of a frightened songbird. Who's there? Frankie stammered, his voice cracking. Who's there? Come out, or I'll gut you. A cold wind began to move across the pumpkin patch, blowing dead leaves all around. And there was a sudden rustling noise coming from nearby, and one could see the leaves and vines moving around from something crawling among them. Over there, Frankie shouted, pointing in the direction of the rustling. He began to approach, his stooges in tow. Liam stayed put, not quite sure if the three even remembered he was there. The three bullies then came to a screeching halt, the blood in their veins running wintry. 
Frankie dropped the knife as he watched a thick pumpkin vine slither along the ground like a boa constrictor. More vines soon followed, all of them crawling to one collective centric area in the middle of the patch. As this happened, Liam's menacing smile grew wider and wider. What the hell is going on? Aspen shouted. I don't know, Frankie said, but I'm out of here. Frankie began to run off, but he hadn't made it ten steps before one of the pumpkin vines lashed out and snagged his ankle. Frankie fell to the ground, landing right on his face. He was screaming like a little girl. Before the other two had time to react, they too were accosted by the vines, which yanked them both to the ground. Help! Help us! They all shouted the same thing. With a grin still plastered to his face, Liam turned and watched as the Pumpkin King rose out of the pumpkin patch in all his glory. This had been part of Liam's plan all along. He knew his tormentors would show up, just like last year's fifth grade bullies showed, and the year before that too. For each year, the Pumpkin King demanded a sacrifice, and Liam never failed to produce. The Pumpkin King arose, a ten-foot figure, torso consisting of thick, intertwined vines that wrapped around one another to form a tree trunk of sorts. The head of the king was a large and ripe jack-o'-lantern, fluid in its expression. Once again a witness to the great sight, Liam fell to one knee and placed his palms in the dirt, showing his respect. Help! The three tormentors continued to shout in a pathetic sort of way, in a way that made them laugh when their previous victims produced the same panicked screaming. Pumpkin King, said Liam, I have once again brought you non-believers. No, shouted Frankie, we believe, we really believe. The Pumpkin King smiled down at Liam, he approved. And with that, the vines that held on to the three screaming brats began to drag them toward the king. They screamed and hollered like they never screamed and hollered before, but no one was coming. Like the mouth of a python, the pumpkin king's jaws unhinged weirdly, and his mouth opened wide, very, very wide. Inside the mouth, floating around in the squashy guts and seeds, were a few remaining skulls and bones from past year's offerings. The bullies all dug their fingertips into the dirt as they were dragged closer and closer to the Pumpkin King's maw. Their petrified faces, more delightful than Liam had anticipated. Please... Frankie shouted in a last-ditched effort to save his skin. Liam, make it stop! And with that, the three bullies were slurped right into the Pumpkin King's mouth, a loud squelching noise filling the air as their bodies became submerged in the piles of guts inside. Their screams, too, became submerged, muffled, and eventually silenced. The morning after Halloween, candy wrappers littered the streets. Toilet paper was strung out along several front lawns. A handful of people tore down their Halloween decorations at the crack of dawn before the workday began. Among the townspeople returning to their regular lives were three sets of worried parents, wondering where their boys had gone. Last Frankie's mom had seen him, he was departing the house with an empty pillowcase and that sycophantic smile as he waved her goodbye. Aspen's mom watched as her son departed with Frankie, and Tyler's mom had only heard a half-hearted bye uttered by her son, followed by the sound of the back door slamming. 
Search parties were sent out to look. No one nor nothing turned up. Liam said not a word of it, of course. The day following Halloween was always a somber one for him, because it meant he had to wait another year to see his god. Eventually, the search parties went looking for the missing boys in the pumpkin patch. They searched the entire patch, looking for any sign of the missing boys. A watch, a glove, a bag of candy, anything. And after the search parties rummaged through the pumpkin patch, Liam found himself watching the story on the news that evening. As he plucked the peas from his otherwise satisfactory pot pie, he smirked at the image on the television screen. His very own handiwork, the phrase Inri carved into the side of a pumpkin. Have you ever seen the movie A Beautiful Mind, where Russell Crowe imagines his roommate and a little girl? He eventually learns to just sort of ignore them. It's scary how true that is. Seeing that movie was a turning point for me. I realized I could maybe learn to live a normal life, and for an 11-year-old who'd been to a hundred doctors, admitted to three mental hospitals, and tried every antipsychotic it was safe to give an 11-year-old, and a few that weren't. Thanks, Dad. That was more hope than I'd ever had before. Ever since I was born, I'd see things wandering around. I remember seeing them before I remember my own parents' faces. They ignored me, and I could never touch them. But, I mean, that's what most adults seem like to an infant. So why was it strange? It's all pretty fuzzy that far back. No one remembers being a baby, but they've always just been there. About the time I turned three, I think I realized no one else could see them but me. That's when my parents tell me I started having imaginary friends. I'd talk about big animals I'd see, and they'd smile and humor me. If the animal I described had a few too many eyes and teeth, well, that's the imagination of a child, right? It wasn't until I was a little older that I started to worry. I was past the it's cute stage, and they started looking at my drawings with concern. I'd become obsessed with drawing the creatures no one else could see. For a kid, I think I was pretty good, too. That was the problem. They really didn't like what they saw in my drawings. I remember very vividly my mother grabbing one in particular I'd finished, and I was so happy I got it exactly right. She looked down at the purplish, gray blob, the appendages that didn't match the body, and the face that looked simply wrong to her. She held it up to me, angry tears running down her cheeks, screaming at me to never draw something like that again, before ripping it up and sending me to my room. I stopped showing them my pictures after that, though I had a serious collection by the time I was six. That's when they sent me to the first psychiatrist. We talked for a couple of hours, then once a week for about a month and a half. It was so exciting having an adult who listened to me about the creatures, one that didn't get angry or leave the room or shut the door a few minutes later. So I was pretty upset the day she asked me if I knew the animals weren't real. I stopped talking to her altogether after that. The next three doctors lasted even less time. By the time I was seven though, we found Dr. Thompson. She was amazing. She didn't seem to care if the creatures were real or not, just that I was able to live life without being unstable because of them. I talked to her for six months. My parents were so much happier, and I thought everything was going to be okay, in that way a child doesn't think about the future. One day, Dr. Thompson asked if I wanted to show her my drawings. That night I went home, and pulled out the boxes of the drawings from under my bed and my closet. For the next week, I combed through them all, picking the very best ones. 
I was so excited to finally share them with someone who I trusted and who wouldn't react to them. The next Tuesday, I pulled them out of my backpack and happily handed them over to Dr. Thompson. She stared at them for a long time, flipping through the stack slowly. Eventually, she looked at me and smiled, asking if she could keep these for a little while. I said yes. I trusted her so much, what had I to fear? We talked about school for the rest of the session. As we left, she asked me to wait in the playroom and had my parents step into her office. I was sure she was telling them I was okay and that there was nothing wrong with me or my drawings. My parents came out a few minutes later and I knew something was wrong. My father looked worried and my mom, she picked me up and held me close, telling me she loved me. That night, we packed a suitcase, and my parents told me that there was a place Dr. Thompson thought I should visit for a little while. The way they described it, it sounded like a summer camp, which I'd always wanted to try, so when I got into the car, I was eager to get there. But I think you know it wasn't a camp. The hospital wasn't like what you see in the movies. No white paint with fluorescent lights. There were bright primary colors everywhere, and paintings of cartoon elephants and dogs and other animals, and the staff wore uniforms with flowers and clowns on them. I was left in the playroom under the careful watch of a kindly nurse who talked to me while I colored, a purple cat at the time. I knew better than to draw them in front of other people by now. After a while, maybe an hour I think, my parents came back with a man in a white coat over a green shirt and glasses. I remember thinking at the time that his hair matched the brown of his tie. They introduced him and said that I'd be staying here with him and some of the other children. I was quiet and I asked them if I could please go home instead. Mom started tearing up a little and turned away. Dad knelt down and gruffly told me that this was for the best and they'd visit me all the time. I tried not to cry, shocked as they hugged and kissed my head, telling me how much they loved me. <laughs> loved me. Then they left and I couldn't hold it in any longer. The nurse, whose name I learned was Tina, held me and rocked me back and forth until I stopped, then carried me to a room with a small bed and a cubby for my suitcase. She lay me on the bed and asked if I was hungry. I shook my head, saying I was just tired, so she sat down in a chair in the corner of the room while I lay there still sniffing a little and fell asleep. I woke up to the sound of the door opening and Tina coming in with a tray of food. She said it was dinner time and I needed to eat. Before I could touch the food though, she gave me a little cup of some strangely bright pills and told me I had to take them. I was still emotionally and physically drained and I did so without questioning. I quietly ate my dinner after that and went back to sleep. Sometime in the middle of the night, I awoke again and saw Tina dozing in her chair, a book hanging from her limp fingers. I watched her for a long time, then went to my suitcase and began drawing the creature that was sleeping next to her. I put it under my mattress when I finished and returned to my dreams. The next day I met the man with the coat and glasses. We talked for a while in his office, and by now I was used to the questions new doctors asked to know what answers he wanted. It was a week before my parents came to visit me. I didn't talk to them. I was too angry. Then they were leaving, and I began sobbing, begging them to take me home. Tina had to pull me off of them and hold me tight as I fought her before they left. I hated that place. It was a year before I left the hospital. They tried every medicine they could on me, but nothing stopped me seeing the things. Eventually, I learned to pretend I was okay when they tried a combination of pills that didn't leave me feeling sick or sleepy. I kept it up for a long time, and finally they told me I could go home. 
Mom and Dad were happy to have me back, and normal, finally. I was just glad to be out of there. The next few years were turbulent, though. Eventually, they realized I was faking, and the doctors started the meds again. Then they found some of the pictures, and when I was ten, I was sent to another hospital. That one did not last too long. The doctors there were pretty arrogant, and he was convinced I was cured within a few weeks. My parents were more skeptical than ever now, and less than a year later I was in another facility, this time one that wasn't just for kids. It was there I met Paul. Paul was an orderly, but he was probably the nicest person I have ever met, and the only reason I am still not in some room drugged up. He was the one who snuck in the movie and explained that sometimes you just have to ignore the things no one else can see. To this day, I don't know why he took the risk and gave me that very unprofessional advice, but I'll be forever grateful for it. That was when I finally learned what I had to do to stay out of places like that forever. I was able to go to a new middle school, and my art teacher loved me. I had a lot of practice after all, and never showed her the pictures I did in my free time, of course. I went through high school drawing, and eventually painting, making friends, dating. It was as close to happy as I'd been in a long time when Lauren came into my life. She loved my art, and we spent hours together talking about colors and shapes. My first girlfriend. My parents were thrilled, naturally. They took this as a sign I really was going to be okay. But we broke up a few months later when she found a piece I was working on, one of the ones I never meant to show anyone. She told me she didn't like things that lurked in the mind. That pretty much sums up my life through college. I got an art scholarship and eventually found an outlet I could share a few of the tamer pieces I'd previously had hidden. Most people found them disturbing, but a few people thought that they were awesome. I even sold one to a heavy metal band for their album cover. I still paint and even have a few exhibitions now and then. Most of my income comes from commissions. Thanks, Reddit. I'd largely put everything behind me until one day, a few weeks ago. I hadn't mentioned them to anyone in years. I hadn't even shown anyone a painting of one since college. I was at a park, painting, enjoying the sun and doing a few sketches for some side cash and tips. It was nice. Around lunchtime, I grabbed a pita from a vendor nearby and a bottle of water, taking a spot under a tree to enjoy the shade. Then I saw one of them drinking from the fountain. I watched it for a while, standing up and stretching. Then I caught sight of something that made me freeze. There was a man, just some old man in a suit and hat, staring at it. And it looked like he was staring at it. He had a little book in his lap and a pencil in one hand. Heat rising in my chest, heart pounding, I walked towards him. I sat on the bench next to him and tried to catch a look at the page that he was scribbling on. Sure enough, it was there. He was drawing it. A numb serenity washed over me, and I caught his eye. He raised an eyebrow. I worked my tongue for a minute, testing my words, forming a question I wasn't sure how to ask. Finally, it came out. Do... do you know what they are? He stared at me a moment, studying me with a furrowed brow. Eventually, he smiled sadly and shrugged. For all I know, they're just in my head. It is a lot of people's favorite sound. The banging on the front door letting you know that the pizza has arrived. There's something about hot, delivered pizza that really ties a bow on any evening, especially when it accompanies a movie and a blanket. 
I jogged over to the door and grabbed the cash off the counter that I had already laid out. I opened the door and couldn't help but be taken aback. The disheveled, skinny pizza delivery man was not a very welcoming sight as they normally would be. His unkempt hair and obviously dirty clothes gave me an immediate feeling of uneasiness. The acne and sores dotting his pale face and arms resembled the pizza I was previously so hungry for. I caught myself wearing a distasteful scowl as I stared at the man's pale and oozing face. Oh, I said after a few awkward and silent moments. Here. I held out my hand with the two bills in it. The delivery man didn't immediately react to my offering of the money. He didn't do anything, but continued to stare. His gaze was almost one that was looking through me. He seemed like he didn't notice me or my outstretched hand. I attempted to wave my hand a bit higher to pass in front of his lifeless eyes. He still had no reaction. My uneasiness quickly turned to dread. He had not moved the entire time. He just kept standing there staring blankly. He didn't even look like he was breathing. Finally, his eyes darted towards my hand. I couldn't tell whether he was looking at the cash or the wedding ring on my hand. I was happy that the ring signified to the man that I had a husband, but his appearance made it easy for me to peg him as an addict of some kind. The foul stench emanating from his body only added to my worry. I waved my hand again and cleared my throat. I was about to slip back into my house without any exchange when he finally began to open the warming bag. I felt slightly less uncomfortable for that moment. As he reached in the bag, he added in a very quiet voice, Are you all alone out here? I tried my best not to seem frightened by his demeanor or question. I quickly answered, Oh, oh, oh my gosh, no. I, I, I live with my husband, see? The man had the pizza halfway out of the warming bag when he stopped and immediately followed my response with another question. Is he here now? It was at this point that my fear mixed in with a slight dose of panic. My thoughts began to race to what might happen next. Why was I in this situation? Was I about to get raped? Maybe killed? Yes, uh, of course he is here, I said. I felt my face begin to flush. I was a terrible liar under normal circumstances, and I know what I just said sounded extremely unconvincing. The dim pitch of the porch light revealed a slight smirk on the man's face. His odd smile told me he didn't believe me and that he was fully aware of how terrified I was. I opened my hand to show that I was trying to give him the money. Please, I said. I must have sounded so pathetic when I said that. It was almost as if I was begging for him to not hurt me. He gave me a small laugh through his nose and pulled the pizza the rest of the way out of the bag. I grabbed the box and dropped the money to the ground without letting him wait to grab it up. I slid the box in the house and closed the door, locking it immediately. My heart was pounding and I was breathing heavily. I was really glad to have the door closed. I stood there at the door, listening for him to walk away. After a minute, it was obvious that he hadn't even taken a single step. He was still standing in the exact spot. We were both standing a mere two feet from each other, separated only by my door. I knew that he could tell I hadn't moved. After what seemed like an eternity, I heard him walk from the front door and down the two wooden steps onto the walkway. I sighed in relief. My heart was still pounding, but I had calmed down immensely. I walked over to the living room and set the pizza on the coffee table. I sat back on the couch, but was not hungry anymore. I certainly was not in the mood to watch a scary movie. 
I didn't even have a moment to think about what I was going to do when I heard footsteps walk across the deck. Anybody walking across the deck would be able to see into the house directly where I was sitting. My anxiety levels began to climb again. Three loud knocks startled me so much that I had to let out a small scream. I clutched my chest and yelled, What? What do you want? The aggressive manner of the knocking scared the heck out of me. The person outside the door was well aware that I was sitting in the same room. He didn't need to knock that loud. I yelled again in a trembling voice. What? What? What do you want? You forgot your drink. You, your single drink. He spoke as if his mouth was pressed to the crack of the door. H honey? I yelled in an awful attempt to scare him off. Can you get the door, babe? Again, I was immediately reminded of how bad a liar I was. The acting job would not have convinced anyone. Just leave it at the door, I yelled. My voice cracked as I had said that, and I began to cry. Please, just go, I said to myself. I was trying to hold my breath and listen to what he was doing. He finally walked off the deck again. I sat there trying to be as quiet as possible, hoping I would hear him drive away. I hated that he could see me. He could see exactly where I was sitting, and that I was crying. I was trembling and afraid to move. All I could do was wait. So I waited. After almost five agonizing minutes, I finally heard his car start. I gasped in relief. I still didn't want to get up and look out the window, though. I didn't want that man seeing me any longer. I just wanted him gone. I could hear the car was still in the driveway. The car was just sitting in idle. The man was not leaving. He was just sitting there. The quick sense of relief that I had felt suddenly vanished. Again, I was right back in the grip of fear. I wanted to call the police. There were only two phones in the house, though. The closest one was in the kitchen just to my right. If I went for that one, he would be able to see me if I went there. He would be able to watch my every move. The other phone was upstairs in our bedroom. I spent the next minute mustering up any sort of courage to get off the couch and run up to my bedroom. It was on the opposite side of the house, and I feared not being able to hear the man or his whereabouts. It was when he started revving the engine of his car that I sprang from the couch and ran up the stairs. I ran down the hall and into my bedroom, slammed and locked my door. I picked up the phone and dialed 911. 911, what is your emergency? Yes, I need help. There is a man here. He won't leave. Are you hurt, man? Is this man hurting you? No, he, he won't leave. He is sitting in my driveway in his vehicle. Is this your husband or a boyfriend? No, he's the damn pizza delivery man. There's something wrong with him. A pizza delivery man? What's wrong with him? Is he hurt? Do you need an ambulance? No. Listen to me. This guy, he, he's strange. There is something wrong with him. He won't leave me the hell alone. Has this man threatened you? No, he's just creepy. He's asking me strange questions and he won't leave. I would like you to send an officer, please. Okay, ma'am. We're dispatching an officer to your location. I'm showing 2356 Walker Road. Yes, that's it. Please hurry. The operator started to say something, but my attention was stolen when I heard something. It sounded as if there was someone in my house. I froze and was too scared to even speak into the receiver of the phone. 
I placed my thumb over the phone speaker so I could listen more intently. I held my breath and tried to pinpoint any disturbance in the silence. After a few long minutes of not hearing anything, I checked the phone to find out the 911 operator had hung up. I slowly and quietly hung up the phone and walked towards the edge of my room to listen through the door. Nothing. Still nothing. I opened the door and listened down the hallway. Still nothing. I walked across the hall into the adjacent room. I looked out the window into the driveway and was relieved to see that the headlights were gone. I let out another long breath of relief. Although a lot of my anxiety had been slightly lifted, I was still on the edge and wary of the whole situation. I was glad to know the police officer was on his way, though. I walked back down the stairs into the living room. The smell of pizza had overtaken the room and reminded me of my original plans for the evening. Normally, it would have been a pleasant smell, but now it only served to remind me of that disgusting man and his bloody, blotchy skin. I sat back down on the couch and decided to wait for the police officer to arrive. Not a few seconds had passed when I heard the door handle trying to turn. I hadn't heard anybody walking on the deck and certainly didn't hear any cars pull into the driveway. I jumped up with my heart pounding again. I slowly walked over to the wall and flipped off the lights. Now that the interior lights were off, I could see out into the front. To my horror, I could see that the man's car was still parked in the driveway. I had mistaken his headlights being off for the car not being there. Three bone-shaking knocks sounded that made me yell, Who is it? What do you want? Three more aggressive knocks echoed throughout the house. My heart felt like it was going to leap out of my chest. The man began to knock on the door in a steady beat, seeming to get louder and louder with each hit. When it sounded like the door was about to come off the hinges, I screamed at the top of my lungs, Go away! The man stopped beating on the door, and it was silent. All I could hear was my heavy breathing. I could feel my heart beating throughout my entire body. Open the door, the man said. The menacing tone that he used brought me back to tears. No! Please go away. The police are on their way. I cried out into the darkness. The police? He paused for a long time. It's probably going to take them a long time to get here, don't you think? I think it's gonna just be you and me. <laughs> they said there was an officer close by. He will be here any second. I had begun to sound almost hysterical. I knew the man on the other side of the door could hear the fear in my voice. Just open the door. No, go away, I cried. The tears poured down my face as I begged the man to leave. Okay then, fine, he said. I will leave you alone. For now, enjoy your pizza, Christine. Hearing the deranged man use my name made my stomach turn. I heard the man slowly walk from the deck. With the lights now being off, I could see the man's silhouette walk by the window. I watched the man move down the walkway and slowly get into his car. I heard his car start, and I walked into the kitchen to make sure he was leaving. I watched the car headlights back down the driveway, and then onto the main road. The car sat in the road for a whole minute. I watched and prayed for him to leave. Eventually the car started to move, and he drove down the road and out of my sight. Again I let out a large sigh of relief. I couldn't believe how afraid I had just been. 
the entire ordeal had seemed like a terrible dream. Knowing that the officer was on the way was very comforting to me, though. I don't think I would have felt comfortable at all if that wasn't the case. Seeing a friendly face, a protector, a person of authority would do me good. I sat there in the darkness for a long time. It seemed like it was taking the police officer forever to arrive. I had a lot of time to think, though. The fear that I had been experiencing all over the last twenty minutes had begun to morph into anger. I was angry at that creep. I was so completely unsettled now, and he had ruined my evening. Was I now fearful of being in my own house? Why did he have to say something like that? I decided to call the pizza place and complain about him. I grabbed the phone off the kitchen wall and called the number. Yes, can I speak to the manager, please? I asked. After a few seconds, the manager picked up the phone and I began. Hi, my name is Christine Brabson. I ordered a delivery from you guys about an hour ago. The manager cut me off and asked, Do you live down Walker, ma'am? Yes, Walker Road. Ma'am, I'm terribly sorry. I just received a call from another customer in your area. They have not received their pizza either yet. Something may have happened to our driver. We'd be happy to send another out as soon as possible. N no I did receive my pizza. He arrived 20 minutes ago, and he threatened me. Oh, that's strange. Can you tell me what happened? He's a creep. He was awful. He was trying to scare me. Who the hell do you have working for you? Who the hell is this creep? Ah, I'm confused. Yeah, the delivery man that you sent here. Ma'am, the driver who went out to your area was Tiffany. The short, blonde, and female. It felt like a dagger had pierced me right in the heart. The adrenaline that pumped through my veins almost blinded me. The manager was still speaking on the other end of the phone, but I couldn't hear a single word. The amount of thoughts going through my head had begun to make me dizzy. I felt like fainting. I felt like throwing up. I heard a car pull into the driveway. For a moment, I feared that it was the driver again. But as the car pulled closer, I could see that it was a police car. I cut the manager off on the other end of the phone. Uh, I, I don't know what's going on. The, the police are here right now, though. I hung up and went to the front door to meet the cop in the driveway. I ran to the car just as the officer was getting out. Oh, thank God you are here. I just called the pizza place and there was something wrong. The officer closed his door and walked around to meet me at the front end of his cruiser. I was so relieved that I ran into his arms and began to cry. Oh my God, thank you. Thank you. The pizza guy. As I hugged my savior, I noticed the same foul stench that I had smelled earlier. His ill-fitting uniform was far too large for his skinny body. I backed off his chest and noticed the sores covering his arms which had begun to tighten around me. I was good with kids. I liked them, but they seemed to love me, so I ended up doing a lot of babysitting work when I was 17. Childcare, if you want to make it sound more professional on your resume. It was an easy way to make money, usually just by playing. I liked their weird little minds and the bizarre things kids would say, so it was fine by me. But after I babysat George, I stopped. George wasn't the problem. George was lovely. He was six and still had big, cute, chubby cheeks. The best thing was he mostly played on his own, and then all I would have to do was just keep an eye on him. I would read a book nearby while he got lost in his own world. 
Both his mom and dad had important jobs, and if the long hours they worked didn't show it, the size of their house did. It was four stories high, and the lawn in the garden stretched way back with different types of trees on each side. It was summer, and so I was looking after George most days during the school break. The weather was good, so we played outside a lot. Well, I kept an eye on him as he ran around, imagining adventures from the looks of it, or playing with his toys on the grass, marching his dinosaurs amongst the flowers. After a while, George always seemed to play in the same area at the end of the garden, next to one particular tree. It was the tallest tree in the yard, a big, thick oak with roots that came out of the ground like varicose veins. I just guessed that was his favorite spot. I noticed he started using the name Jack in a lot of his games. Then he started to look as if he was talking to someone. I'd never had an imaginary friend myself or looked after a kid who had one before. I didn't know much about child psychology then either, but as he was an only child with workaholic parents, it made sense to me at the time. One afternoon, the clouds were becoming darker and it looked like it was about to pour down, so I called George to come inside. He angrily said that he didn't want to because he was playing with Jack. It took me by surprise. This was the most disobedient I'd ever heard George be. I kept my calm and asked, why don't you and Jack both come inside then? George said Jack couldn't come inside because he was tied to the tree. I put on my stern voice and furrowed my eyebrows, something I hadn't had to do with George until then, and firmly told him to come inside. He looked back at the tree, nodded, and then dutifully marched in. Later that day, it occurred to me that George only said the name Jack when he was near his favorite tree. Later, when George was eating the banana sandwiches I made him for lunch, I asked him why Jack was tied to the tree. He said that he had hurt one of the maids, so the master had tied him to a tree as punishment. I thought maybe he'd been in the same room with his parents, watching Downton Abbey or something. I think I still only found it interesting at this point, <laughs> even funny. Kids in their imaginations, right? After that, I noticed that George had started to whisper to Jack. When George had played with Jack before, it always used to seem like fun, but now it seemed different. I would strain my ears to hear, but I couldn't make out what George was whispering. I asked him what he was talking about with Jack, and he would just answer, Nothing at all. Something about the rhythm and how he said it felt wrong, like it was just being parroted back, but I thought he could have picked it up from a movie or anywhere. Not long after, I had to use that stern voice with George again. I found him rooting around under the kitchen sink, in the cupboard where the bleach and all the other poisonous bottles were. He claimed he was after the saws. Hack saws, coping saws, and a handsaw. My mind whirled like I was on a drunk carousel while I tried to make sense of it. He'd made a pile of the saws next to him on the tile. He looked up at me, and his eyes widened when he recognized the horror on my face. The horror, which was quickly turning to anger. Then I really shouted at him. What the hell are you doing? You mustn't ever mess with these things. They are very dangerous. This is such a naughty thing to do. Those sorts of things. I felt my own parents' discipline from years ago channeling through me. He looked up at me all the while with his bottom lip wobbling, and when I finally had finished, he burst into tears. I hugged him and told him it was just because I was so worried and that he was a good boy, really. He said that he had just wanted to help Jack. I didn't know what to do. I was no therapist, but I thought, hell, 
If I played along with it, maybe I could stop anything like this from happening again. Did Jack ask you to help him? George didn't say anything. Why don't I talk to Jack? George's eyes widened. Why not? I just want to explain to him how he got you in trouble. Then he won't ask you to do it again. No, don't. He's my friend. I didn't like how stubborn he was being, and not just because he was being difficult. He wasn't usually like this. He seemed scared. If he is your friend, then he'll understand. I turned and started to walk to the garden. George followed behind me. I reached the tree and positioned myself looking at the place where I guessed the invisible child might be and ignored my feelings that this was ridiculous. Jack, I know you wanted George to help you, but he mustn't go near the saws or tools because it's dangerous and he'll get into trouble. So I'm sorry, but he just can't help you. I turned to George. Okay, now I think we should go in s I stopped in shock as I felt a sharp pain in the back of my leg. It felt like something had pinched me. I immediately looked back, but there was nothing. Something felt bad, like the air pressure around us had dropped. And when I turned back to George, he looked like he was about to cry. Let's go inside, I said flatly and held his hand. The weather outside turned bad for the rest of the week, so we stayed inside. Whatever had caused that pinching feeling had made a mark, but I reasoned with myself that it was more likely an insect bite, a nasty one, maybe. There was an old photograph I'd walked past nearly a hundred times framed and hung in the hallway of the house. I'd never stopped and properly looked at it before. It was a picture of the house staff from 1898. Amongst the butlers, cooks, and maids, there was a little boy. It might have been the contrast or saturation from the old-fashioned photography, but his eyes seemed dark and unpleasant. My eyes ached as I focused on him for too long, as if I was waiting for him to move. I tore myself away from the picture and went to find George. Three days later, I was tidying up when I found a kitchen knife in George's toy box. It was the biggest one from the knife block. My heart jerked like a car crash collision I marched back into the living room, and George looked up from where he was playing on the floor. You come with me right now, I yelled, my voice wavering and failing at every point. He followed behind me as I stomped back to the playroom. What the hell do you think you're doing with? I looked down, and the knife wasn't there. It was gone. I started to dig through the toys clawing through the bears and cars, but I couldn't find it. Pain burst and spread up the back of my leg, and I snapped back up straight. I turned around just in time to see the knife hit the floor like it had been dropped. George jumped from the noise of the crash the knife made as it landed about two meters away from him, between us. We both didn't say anything. I felt blood trickling down the back of my leg. George burst into tears. He fought against his own sobs and managed to bawl out his words. I'm so sorry. I let him free. I shouldn't have done it. I... I helped Jack get free from the tree. I shouldn't have. I'm so sorry. He's a nasty boy. He's a nasty boy. I'm sorry. I grabbed George. I grabbed his coat, grabbed my bag, and took him straight through the front door. His dad was incredibly ticked off that he had been dragged out of a meeting and called back home from work to find us sitting on the porch steps. 
I think he thought I wasn't noticing his eyes rolling, as I couldn't explain properly what happened. I was definitely meant to notice the dirty look he gave me when George started crying that he didn't want to go back inside the house ever again. That's when I left. I walked away down their gravel path and didn't look back as I heard George start wailing. I didn't ever go back to look after George. I was pretty sure they wouldn't have wanted me back after how unstable I must have seemed. I declined any other offers of work from other parents. I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel guilty for leaving George. It definitely weighed heavy on my thoughts over the weeks and months, and then years. It didn't get easier to not remember sometimes, but I couldn't forget. At the time, I didn't admit it to myself, but looking back, it was 100% of the reason that my choices led to me getting a degree in child psychology at the university, and now I'm doing particularly well in the field. My secret personal penance of sorts. I thought I might get some closure on it all, when one day I had a familiar patient assigned to me at his parents' request. This was unusual, but when the boy walked into my office, eight years older now, I understood. He doesn't want to be called George anymore, though. He only answers to Jack. I asked him where George is. He said he's tied to the tree. I used to work at a local morgue, bringing corpses in for embalming and preparation to be sent to whichever funeral home they were going to. It was a morbid task, as you can imagine. People say that working with the deceased for long periods of time can have a negative psychological effect on you. I do believe this is true. However, one's mind also becomes used to the task and accepts that this is what you're going to be paid to do and you just have to get it done. My colleague James was the same as I, going through the same mundane morbid routines that is, that we were made to do and were made a little bit more bearable with him around. We would crack a joke and laugh, <laughs> distract ourselves with horsing around or just talking about random trash with no real meaning. We even used to stash beers in one of the freezers during the late shift when it was just the two of us, and would crack one open here and there in between moving bodies around, tagging and storing them, and signing them in on the registry. One night in particular, we were bringing in a man who was identified as a Mr. Anton Sullivan. He had been involved in a car accident and had died at the scene of a severe head injury. We pulled our van up to the entrance and James jumped out and unlocked the back doors while I locked the front of the van. We then lifted the stretcher with the black body bag on it out of the van, setting up the wheels as we did so. I took the keys from James and locked the doors while he rolled the stretcher inside into the elevator. I just finished looking up when I jumped a foot in the air due to my phone ringing suddenly in my pocket. <laughs> my wife always called to say goodnight when I was doing the late shift. God. I took the call and spoke to her a while while walking towards the building. When I was inside, I saw the elevator doors were closed, and a number above the elevator read B. James had already gone down ahead of me, so I recalled the elevator and finished the call with my wife while I waited. The elevator reached me just as I put my phone into my pocket. The all-too-familiar ding sounded, and the doors opened. I was a little surprised to find the stretcher standing there in the elevator, with James nowhere in sight. <laughs> he must have been distracted when he got out of the elevator and the doors closed before he could get the stretcher out. Upon reaching the bottom floor where we worked, the doors opened and almost immediately the lights went out, just pitch black. 
My heart actually seized for a moment when they did as I was suddenly plunged into suffocating darkness and silence. The floor was underground, and so it was only natural for it to be pitch black without the lights on. I turned the flashlight on my phone instinctively so I could see, and called out to James. There was no reply. I called out for him again, but there was still nothing. I decided to call his cell. It rang a few times, and then the call was fortunately picked up. James, I said into the phone. There was no reply. I couldn't even hear sounds on the other end. No breathing, no sound from the cooling system which you could always hear. That was no surprise, seeing the power was out. But I should still have heard something, anything. But there was nothing. James, come on, man. If you're messing around, just quit, okay? We agreed we wouldn't mess around on the job like this, remember? It isn't funny, I said sternly. Mark? I jumped at the sound of my name. It was so garbled that I almost didn't catch it, but it was definitely my name. James? Where are you now? Are you looking for the generator? There was a moment of scratchy static in my ear, pretty loud, and I had to move the phone away from my ear. Free... said James, his voice washed out by horrible static. What? I, I can't hear you. You're breaking up, I said. Freezer. Freezer room? I asked. This was answered with three beeps, and then silence as the call died. Damn it, I said to no one in particular. I used the light on my phone once more to see down the hallway, and made my way to the freezer room to see why James was there, and not checking to see why the backup generator hadn't kicked in. In the freezer room I found myself in the grip of a sudden, creeping fear. Every door of every one of the freezers was wide open. I stood stock still at the doorway, too afraid to move any further. It was so dark all around me, and I was suddenly afraid of everywhere around me that I couldn't see, and even more afraid of where I could see. I wanted to call out to James, but something made me too scared to do so. I didn't want to be heard. I don't know how long I had immediately noticed it, but I became aware of a faint sound of shuffling coming from somewhere further into the room where my measly cell phone flashlight couldn't reach. The shuffling sound of footsteps. Footsteps from more than one pair of feet. I was paralyzed with pure terror, unable to believe my senses. I so badly wanted to run screaming, but I couldn't. That was until I saw movement somewhere just out of reach of my light source. I was about to stammer out James's name when I saw another movement off to the left of one I had already seen, and then another. That was when I screamed. I just screamed and turned around running back to the elevator, filled with horror and struggling to process what was happening. <sighs> what was happening was impossible, but it was happening somehow. <sighs> the human mind struggles to comprehend such things. Its one focus is getting out and getting as far away as possible. You can't think of anything else at the time. I reached the elevator and shouted in dismay when I realized the control panel was dead because the backup power hadn't activated. I can never fully put into words the absolute soul-crushing terror I experienced when I turned back to the door and the light from my phone illuminated a shape in the corner of the elevator, literally two steps away from me. The shape of a body bag standing upright and somehow quivering. 
The last thing I remember is hearing a horrific gurgling noise from inside the bag, followed by a disgusting, fleshy, squelching sound and a liquid splattering, like some form of liquid hitting a floor. After that, I was gone. I don't think my mind could take it anymore. I woke up in the hospital two days later, and when I was okay to talk, the police came and explained everything to me. Or at least, they tried their best to explain. According to them, I'd been found lying outside the elevator, having fainted due to extreme stress. They had found James inside the body bag in the elevator, dead. They had been deeply disturbed by the fact that James and all his internal organs had somehow become separated. The body bag that he was in was saturated with almost all his blood, his organs swimming in the wave of blood that seeped out when they opened the bag. The corpses that had been stored in the morgue were all gone without a trace. The day crew had found us when they had come to relieve James and I for the night duty and immediately had called the police. The officers at the scene were heavily traumatized at the site after the body bag had been opened by one of the paramedics that also responded. All police and emergency personnel were issued extensive counseling, and the same counseling was suggested to me. I accepted it, but I found it to be a waste of time. It's been years now. I've decided I at least needed to write about this. I'll still never forget it. Whatever happened to James that night will forever be a mystery. I'll never understand. I accept that, though. In a way, I'm kind of okay with it. Maybe I'm better off not knowing. <laughs> Maybe we all are. The rural area I grew up in made the smallest towns appear densely populated. It was the sort of place where you had to cycle a mile or so to the nearest neighbor, and the bus only came twice a day. Most kids think growing up on a farm is some sort of constantly thrilling adventure. <laughs> the kids at my school in the nearest town certainly did. They didn't see me waking up at four in the morning just to get ready in time for my parents to get me there, or how lonely the weekends were when your friends lived so far away. No, they thought it was just all chickens and tractors. In truth, I resented it. The farm was on a large plot of land. We had acres surrounding the house, ending at a thick forested border that separated us from two distant neighbors and some fields. My parents would let me play freely on the farm from a young age. My only rule was to stay on the land that we owned. Where the trees started, I should have always stopped. Boredom was a killer. Chickens aren't so exciting when they're your day-to-day -day life, and there's only so much fun a kid can have on their own. When I was about eight years old, I started to explore the woods that made up the border, at first weaving in and out of the trees on the edge of the farm, and eventually building up the courage to go deeper into the forest. I was careful, making sure that I embarked on my adventures almost as soon as I'd left the house, so that I had the maximum time to explore without being caught by mum and dad. The day I first made it through the border, I was trying to time how long it took to walk through the trees. It was fifteen minutes until I reached the clearing owned by Mr. Hinchcliffe, an elderly potato farmer to the left of us. He was known by the local people for being insular and quiet. It was a large, circular clearing, cut off from the rest of his land by a different species of tree to the ones in the forest. It's like they had been planted years before to create and keep the clearing separate 
and hidden. In the center of the circle was a man who stood facing me, unmoving. I was terrified at first, convinced that Mr. Hinchcliffe was about to march me home for trespassing. I tried to conceal myself behind a tree whilst keeping an eye on the man, realizing he hadn't moved much. It took me a moment, but the poles eventually gave it away. That and the lack of feet. The figure started from the ankles. The man in the clearing wasn't a man at all. (laughs) He was a scarecrow. I was fascinated. I stayed behind the tree but strained my eyes enough to try and get a better look. My parents put scarecrows up around our crops, but none of ours were ever as elaborate as the one that stood in the middle of Mr. Hinchcliffe's clearing. He was so realistic, more realistic than anything I had ever seen before. He wore a red checked shirt, a straw hat, and a wide smile stitched across his face from the corner of one side of his mouth to the other. I wanted to get closer, but as I started to emerge from the trees, I could feel his eyes on me and could have sworn that I saw his fingers move. I ran back through the woods to the farm, eager to get home and try to forget about what I'd seen, my little heart pounding. I didn't tell my parents about the scarecrow or the clearing, but as I lay in bed that night, All I could think about was that smile stitched across the face. I spent hours that night convincing myself that scarecrows couldn't move. What I'd seen must have been the wind. I was just freaking out over nothing. I tried to stop myself going back, but I desperately wanted to get a closer look. I wondered what Mr. Hinchcliffe had used to make his scarecrow look so realistic, and my curiosity eventually got the best of me. Three days after my initial discovery, I left the farm and made my way through the same dense section of woods until I reached the clearing again. I stopped behind the same tree as before, inspecting the scarecrow until I gathered the bravery to get a little closer. Mr. Hinchcliffe's creation was even more spectacular up close. I couldn't work out what material he had used to make the face. It was like something out of a film. I touched the skin to try and understand what it was, but I couldn't. It felt like my own, but just colder. I was in complete awe. The smile had been stitched into the skin-like material. It must have taken the old man hours. If the scarecrow ever had feet, they had been buried into the dirt to try and help him stand. Poles were driven into the ground behind him and tied to the torso, keeping him propped up and secured. The longer I looked at the scarecrow, the more I started to feel like he was alive in ways. I was certain that he occasionally blinked and that his chest rose and fell. I was cautious and more than a little unsettled, but I took my time and inspected him as much as I could. Walking back to the farm through the trees, I couldn't get the scarecrow out of my thoughts. I struggled to make conversation over dinner, my mind completely filled with that stitched up smile. I became obsessed. I returned every day for the next three weeks. The clearing became my place of solace and the scarecrow that stood there my best friend. I would sit by his planted ankles reading and drawing in my sketchbook. I named the Scarecrow Peter and spoke to him whenever I could. I told him my deepest thoughts and feelings, even cried to him when I was sad and spent every moment that I could with him. I was careful not to sit in the clearing for too long and always returned to the farm before my parents felt I was gone. 
I wished I could have spent more time with Peter. It's sad when I think back to what a lonely kid I must have been to spend so much time with an object. <sighs> a glorified effigy of a human. With every visit, the rising and falling of Peter's chest lessened. I stopped catching him blinking, and his skin started to sag in a strange way and grayed after a few days of the rain. I knew it must just be me getting used to him, realizing that he was never going to spring to life and answer me like a real friend I'd wanted. But it still made me a little sad. After a while, Peter's magic was gone. I would go and visit like always, but it didn't feel the same. The clearing was empty as the rest of my life, and my propped up friend in the middle was in a sorry state. The stitched smile barely held itself in place now, and the lumps of the material that made up his skin had started to dry and fall off. He couldn't even scare the birds away anymore, and often he had multiples perched on his straw hat and shoulders, pecking at his face. One day toward the end of that summer, I made my way through the clearing to find it empty. Peter was gone. There wasn't a trace of him left bar the pole that stuck firmly into the ground. Despite the fact that my initial fascination with Peter was already depleted, it still felt like a terrible blow. My parents couldn't understand why I became so withdrawn. I was grieving for someone that had never actually existed. Eight years old, and I already understood what it was to mourn a friend. I visited the clearing multiple times, but it remained empty. School restarted, and the autumn hit, bringing with it ice-cold winds that would frost the entire land. I spent less time outside, and barely visited Mr. Hinchcliffe's clearing through the winter. By the time we reached the next summer, Peter and the time I'd spend with my silent friend was all but forgotten. It was by chance on a sunny day that I decided to walk through the woods one more time to my old sanctuary. I didn't expect it. I thought that part of my life was over. But there she was, an entirely new scarecrow, propped up just like Peter had been, ankles pressed firmly into the ground with poles behind her. She wore a different outfit, dungarees and a yellow checked shirt, but the straw hat was unmistakably the same. Her chest rose and fell gently, just like Peter's had once, and her eyes appeared to move barely millimeters as I looked into them. It was almost impossible to see, but I was sure that she was alive. She gave me hope that I wouldn't have to spend a summer lonely and sad on that farm. Her stitched smile gave me the same familiar comforting feeling as warm hot chocolate on a chilly night. The process repeated, just like it had with Peter. As the weeks passed, she started to look more haggard, peaked and less alive. The magic too became less, the loneliness returned, and eventually she disappeared entirely. Every year would be the same. Summer would come, and with it Mr. Hinchcliffe would build a new scarecrow. They came in every age, shape, and gender. A new friend that I knew would wither and vanish just like the others. <laughs> Regardless, I grew attached to every single one of them. As I got older and my parents awarded me with more free time, I was able to spend more time in the town with friends that actually spoke back. After a while, I started to forget about the scarecrows, favoring girls and nights out to sitting with inanimate objects. Years passed by, and I left home to take a degree in art. University changed my life. For the first time, I had a group of friends around me all the time, 
ones that weren't planted in the ground. I moved in with them and only went home for Christmas. I never forgot about Mr. Hinchcliffe's scarecrows, though. They were my lifetime for so long, but I did move on. I didn't need them anymore. It's been three years since I spent a summer on the farm, and lockdown with this virus has forced me back here. When my housemates all returned to their families, I couldn't bear the idea of just me being in the house, so I did the same. I wasn't intending to visit the clearing. In fact, it's been years since I really thought about it. I've been wrapped up too much in a social life that I never had as a kid. It was only when my mother brought up her new friend Linda, who now lived at the farm to the left, that I was reminded of my childhood secret, one that I now wish I could erase. What happened to Mr. Hinchcliffe? I asked, my heart sinking at the sudden realization that I would never get to see another one of his amazing creations. My mother hung her head, trying to plan a response. It was awful, Charlie. All over the local news. He stopped responding to his sister's calls last year, and after a while, she sent local police to do a welfare check. When they arrived, he wasn't in the house, so they started searching the land, and they found him collapsed in a wooded bit just on the other side of our trees. He died of a heart attack. Why would that make the news? I asked, a bead of sweat running down my neck as I imagined Mr. Hinchcliffe dead in the clearing. My clearing. My mother's face somehow lowered further. He wasn't alone, Charlie. They found a woman strapped to a pole next to his body. He'd been injecting her with some sort of drug that kept her completely paralyzed while conscious. He'd planted her feet in the ground just to keep her upright and dressed her up like a scarecrow. Police combed the land and found 45 such bodies buried. He'd been at it for 45 years. <laughs> I felt a bile rising in my throat. My mind started to connect the dots that I'd never imagined. <sighs> what happened to the girl? I asked. She survived, barely. When they finally got her conscious, she wrote a letter explaining that she'd been strapped to that pole for two weeks before she was found. Hinchcliffe took every precaution possible to keep her alive up there. Worst of all, she can only communicate through writing now, after what he did to her face. The sick fuck cut her mouth up, only to stitch it back into a smile.